ओ भाई ये ये कौन है भाई ये बच्चों आई एम योर कुनाल सर एक्चुअली द स्क्रीन इज नॉट वर्किंग देन लेक्चर स्टार्ट एट 5 पीएम इन नलाय गैंग नंबर के गौरव इंग्लिश पीडब्ल्यू इंग्लिश स्टार्ट्स Hi guys, how are you, everyone? Welcome back to this amazing, superb, and amazing platform that is Physics Wala. So, how are you all? Ah, uh, it's great to be back on this platform, especially on this channel that is P W English. And a warm welcome and a hearty welcome to all my superstars from all the batches, from all the platforms. Those who have been studying with me all throughout the year, you might be a little surprised that why am I speaking? Complete in English language. Let me tell you one a very uh, uh, you know cute incident from last year's marathon. Actually, I was taking the complete social science marathon in pure English for on this very same platform and this very same channel last year. And there was a very cute person, very cute student who just came and asked, "Sir, आप हिंदी भूल गए क्या? वाला आप English में क्यों पढ़ा रहे हो?" So let me clear this doubt. है ना एक बार मैं सारे बच्चों का doubt यहाँ पे clear कर देता हूँ. Sir, this is enough to score ninety five plus. Yeah, if you can, uh, if you are, if you are going to be like, uh, you know, if you are going to be uh, like a uh, very consistent throughout the marathon, then this is going to help you. Okay. So I'll use simple language, simple basic English language, so that you can just you know uh, understand in a very basic and easy manner. So, बच्चे पहले मैं आपको हिंदी में थोड़ा सा बोल देता हूँ, so that all the student can understand, and then we will start the class in English. Okay. Okay. So, board booster 2.0. Hi guys, how are you? Okay, but see, guaranteed uh, pass, which series is that will be in English. वो हिंदी और इंग्लिश मिक्स में रहेगी. So this is not guaranteed pass series. वो अलग आ रहा है आपके लिए वीडियो, ठीक है? And ये वीडियो, ये मैराथन उन सारे बच्चों के लिए है जो हिंदी नहीं समझ पाते, है ना? और uh, we at PW believe that कि language should never be a barrier. Barrier, ठीक है? Language बेटा कभी भी barrier नहीं होना चाहिए. And that is the reason कि हमारा एक ऐसा भी चैनल है जहां हम लोग प्योर इंग्लिश में पढ़ाते हैं भाई 100 प्रतिशत शुद्ध अंग्रेजी में हम लोग आपको पढ़ाते हैं ठीक है तो ताकि सारे बच्चे यहां पे पढ़ पाए सारे बच्चों के डाउट्स यहां पे क्लियर हो पाए जो बच्चा हिंदी समझता है जो बच्चा इंग्लिश समझता है सो एवरी वन कैन स्टडी है ना राइट टू एजुकेशन जैसे हमारे अलग सर कहते हैं तो दैट शुड बी विद एवरी ठीक है आई होप मेरी बात समझ में आ गई होगी सो ये सोशल साइंस का कंप्लीट मैराथन है जी हाँ यानी फोर सब्जेक्ट्स, ऑल द फोर सब्जेक्ट्स आई एम गोइंग टू टीच यू चारों सब्जेक्ट्स में आपको पढ़ाऊंगा यहां पे, एकदम क्विक तरीके से माइंड मैप के तरीके से क्वेश्चंस भी करेंगे पोल्स भी करेंगे सो लॉट्स एंड लॉट्स ऑफ थिंग्स वी आर गोइंग टू डू एंड जितने भी हिंदी प्लस इंग्लिश यानी इंग्लिश वाले बच्चे हैं यू कैन आपके लिए भी मैराथन बहुत जल्दी आ रही है आपके अपने पैरे फाउंडेशन चैनल पर फिलहाल इन दिस प्लेटफॉर्म लाइक इन दिस पर्टिकुलर चैनल आई विल बी टीचिंग यू इन प्योर इंग्लिश इज दैट क्लियर गाइज गिव मी थम्स अप इन दैट इज दैट क्लियर बात समझ में आ गई इज दैट क्लियर बिकॉज अब इसके बाद से अपन एकदम अंग्रेजी में बोलेंगे भाई ठीक है तो ऑल माई लवली डी के समोसा भंडार स्टूडेंट माई को फाउंडर्स आई होप यू गॉट दिस इज ए क्लियर गाइस इज ए क्लियर बच्चों इज ए क्लियर चलिए या इज ए क्लियर या इज ए क्लियर गेम गेम ये थम्स अप हाउ मच टाइम विल आई टेक बेटा आई ट्राई टू कंप्लीट दिस एंटायर मैरथन इन द शॉर्टेस्ट पॉसिबल टाइम बट स्टिल देर आर फोर सब्जेक्ट टू टीच so it will take a little bit of time but we'll try to go as quick as possible okay yeah so we'll not uh, use hindi theek hai why i'm known as kmc there's a long story behind that okay 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 i hope it's clear it's clear it's clear yeah guaranteed pass video series will also start from by do to by today and or by tomorrow at the most theek hai that video is also in like progress so you'll get that video as well but this is a complete marathon in english right so i hope is it clear bachcho is it clear the language the mode of the study is going to be yeah no hindi is there yeah this is for cbsc see few pointers i will write down few pointers i'll write down number 1 this is for cbsc for cbsc or the students following ncert right this is for cbsc or students following ncert Right, CBSC or the students following NCERT, like lecture will be in complete English. Lecture will be in complete English. Will be in complete English. Okay, is it clear? Lecture will be in complete English. That means for all my lovely students, 
who find it hard to understand Hindi or for them it's complete in complete English language. I hope this is clear. I hope this is clear. You'll get the notes of this marathon. You can click the link. You can find the description of the video, right? So there are multiple links and there will be link for this marathon as well. So you can just uh, click on that marathon and it will do. Okay? Yeah, DK Samosa Bhandar will uh, be OP. Approx, kitna time lagega? Bache, approx time I cannot guarantee you right now because again, I'll start teaching. It will take some time. Okay. So, bache, Hindi marathon will be there. Don't worry. Hindi or English marathon will be on PW Foundation channel. So, you don't have to vote for anything. You will have to vote when the right time comes. Okay. So, for you also, marathon will be there, but that will be on Foundation channel. So, that is coming very shortly. Well, let's begin with <laughs> Dogesh and my very superb, my very amazing friend, you know. So, let's understand the syllabus. We all know that we are going to strictly stick to the syllabus, the rationalized syllabus that CBSE is following this year. Okay. So, what we will be doing is, number one, in history, we will be covering chapter, the nationalism in Europe, nationalism in India. We will be talking about the making of global world. Only that part that is coming in the, uh, this thing, board examinations and we'll be talking about the chapter print culture in the modern world. So, I have framed some very short notes for you in the form of mind map so that it's easier for you to recall and understand after this lecture when you can download the notes, the link will be given in the description. Okay. And apart from that, in geography, we'll be doing uh, from chapter number one, that is from resources and development till chapter number six, manufacturing industries that is coming in your syllabus. And uh, we will be doing uh, the chapters in political science till outcomes of democracy. We'll also be covering the chapters in uh, this thing. Economics till globalization and then in economy. Because consumer rights is being, uh, it's coming for the project work, okay? And at last, but not the least, we will be doing a complete map work. Yeah, you heard that right. We will be doing a complete map work as given in your syllabus. I hope that's clear. I hope that's clear. Okay, so on this note, let's begin, let's begin, let's begin, but so with the first, first topic that is history. Okay, now just let me, just tell me, how many of you, stood, how many of the students face difficulty in the chapter, the rise of nationalism in Europe? Give me a thumbs up in the chat, those who feel that, sir, this chapter, rise of nationalism in Europe is very scary. It's just like a horror movie, you know, set in the European counterparts. And you know, we just get a lot of confused in this. Okay, very, very simple. But see, uh, I told you very in the beginning, marathon this is on the channel that is PW English. And unsare bacho ke liye jo ki Hindi nahi samaj paate. Hai na? To aapki jo Hindi wali marathons hoti hai, Hindi or English mix wali, wo foundation channel pe hoti hai. To bache wo jaldi aa rahi hai. Aap unko bhi join kar sakte hai. So, this is for all the students in Hindi samajne nahi aati and they are more comfortable in English language, okay? So, I hope bachche is baat ko aap samaj paare hoge ki channel hi pure English hai. Hai na? Har ik bachcha important and that is why this marathon also. Right? Chal. Okay. Done? Chal. Uh, sure, bachche, we'll be covering your, uh, like we'll be covering lots and lots of things. Hai na? So, I would request you to focus on this particular topic that we are going to study, that we are going to teach. Thik hai? So, let's begin with the rise of nationalism in Europe. Now, let's understand what is Europe after all. It's very important to understand what is basically Europe. So, many times what happens is, people, they mistake Europe for a country. See, Europe is not a country, right? Europe is a continent. So, we all studied in our smaller classes in class 3rd, 4th and 5th that what is a continent? Continent is a big landmass. So, in this European continent, there were many regions or many countries you can say, right? So, number one, what we need to understand is that Europe, what is Europe? Number one, we need to understand is that Europe is a continent, right? Number one, that is Europe is a continent, right? And in this continent, we had certain regions, we had certain countries, right? So, there were many countries, many countries, many regions, many countries, regions, states, any way you can call, right? Now, so, Basically, the problem with Europe was that most of these regions or most of these states were under the control of kings. You must have heard about a lot of stories of kings and queens in your childhood. You know, we all used to hear that story that there was a king and there was a queen. They both got married and they both died, right? So, we used to hear lots and lots of stories in the childhood with respect to kings and queens. 
so the problem in europe was that most of the most of the regions were under the control of king or a queen right mostly kings right so queen was definitely the counterpart so the problem with these kings were that they were very powerful and they were autocratic in nature now what do you mean by autocracy autocracy means when all the power is in the hands of one person and that particular person has all the right to rule in whichever way he or she wants so that is the meaning of autocracy now the biggest problem in this autocratic type of structure was the sufferings of the common people because the common people like me and you even in those times used to pay a lot and lot of taxes but we did not have any rights we did not enjoy any social benefits any social privileges right and we were dominated by so called kings right so basically what happened there was a time period in the european continent when people started getting educated when people got educated when people started getting literate their minds opened right in simple terms if i may uh, if i may discuss in very simple terms they started thinking in a very new way right so they started questioning the power of these kings now there was one more problematic thing in europe and that was the power and authority of the church now you must be wondering sir what is a church see let me make it very simple for you like if you talk about the religion hinduism right so many of us we follow hinduism like including me so we go to temples right we have temples where we have uh, the statues of gods and goddesses where we go to pray right we go to pray to seek the blessings of the god so in the same way there is a religion called christianity and the christian people they worship jesus christ right so they have their own set of beliefs so they basically go to the church right so church is the holy place for christians now what happened in this church in order to manage the affairs of the church we have certain officials right we have certain officials so they are called as bishops or priests or the supreme head of the christianity called as pope now during the medieval ages during the medieval times these people when they started getting money they got corrupted now money is one thing that can make you rich and it can also make you corrupted so when you start enjoying the luxuries of life you become ignorant and this is what happened in the case of these catholic priest right in the case of these catholic bishops so they became ignorant they became very powerful and they became very rich as a result they used to trouble the common people and they used to extract the money from the common people even for the most basic rituals right suppose if a child is born if you have to keep the child's name you have to pay the money if someone dies you'll have to pay the money so there were multiple ways in which these guys are used to extract the money now what happened in europe was when people started becoming aware of their rights when people started to understand that what is happening with them is not correct is not right it is not justified then they started revolting what they started to do they started revolting then ideas of nationalism it started blooming in their minds what happened was people when they started becoming aware people were connected by a common bond that they all were oppressed they all were somewhere or the other tortured by these so called authorities and this is what gradually started uniting them people started becoming aware of their rights they started becoming aware that they have to fight against such kind of people who are not giving them rights they started realize that they are working very hard but still they are not getting the fruits of their labor they are not getting the rights which they should have got so this is what generated a feeling a emotion among the people that we called as nationalism what do you call this as we call this as nationalism right right bachcho okay so this is what we are going to study about the uh, in nationalism in europe that how this feeling got generated how the people started feeling close to each other and how this entire thing rolled out right okay so very simple uh, संदीप कुमार बेटा हिंदी वाला मैराथन नहीं है सो दैट इज वाई हिंदी में मैं नहीं बोल रहा हूं सो so, ये मैंने मैराथन के स्टार्टिंग में बताया था कि बच्चे ये प्योर इंग्लिश का चैनल है जहां पे हम ऐसे बच्चों को भी पढ़ाते हैं जिनको हिंदी समझ में नहीं आता हिंदी वाला जो क्लासेस होता है आपका हिंदी इंग्लिश मिक्स बेटा वो फाउंडेशन चैनल पे होता है उड़ान वाई पे होता है तो आप वहां पर भी क्लासेस देख सकते हैं सो so, आप बच्चों के लिए बच्चे शॉर्ट मैराथन वहां पर स्टार्ट हो जाएगी अभी एक दो मतलब बहुत शॉर्टली आपका ठीक है तो आप उस क्लास को भी अटेंड कर सकते हैं सो दिस इज फॉर स्पेशली ऑल दोज पीपल ऑल दो बच्चा पार्टी जिनको हिंदी नहीं आता ठीक है सो हर एक बच्चा इंपॉर्टेंट है दैट इज वाई दिस मैराथन ओके नाउ कैथोलिक्स एंड प्रोटेस्टेंट सी व्हेन वी टॉक अबाउट अ सर्टेन रिलीजन राइट 
we have certain groups in that religion. For example, you must have heard about Brahmin, Kshatriyas, Vaish. In Hinduism, we have heard about this. Same way, the Christianity, the Christian religion, it has many groups in it. Right? The strongest one, the oldest one was Catholics. The guys who protested against these Catholics, their rituals, they came to be called as Protestants. So, we'll be dealing with the uh, uh, this group in the chapter print culture. Okay, now let's begin further. Okay, so you must have seen this particular painting. Can you identify the painter? Can you identify the painter of the painting? But so, can you identify the painter of the painting in the comment sections? Let's start with this painting first. Okay, it's a very good question. It's a picture-based question that is asked very frequently in your board examinations. So, can you recall the, uh, the painter of this painting who has painted the following things? Right. Okay, very nice. Frederick Soro, Frederick Soro, Frederick Soro. Very nice. Frederick Soro. Tanej is saying, sir, naam lelo. Haan, bita, very nice. Okay. One guy is telling me, sir, Chinese. Bita, very simple. Abhi main dubara aapko kya bola hai abhi? Ki bache, this marathon again is in pure English. Thik hai? Jo Hindi wala marathon hai, matlab humara, aap kya sakte ho, jo humara Hindi wala marathon hai. Hindi marathon matlab, in which I will be speaking in English language, Hindi English mix wala. That comes on foundation channel, hai na? To wahaan pe aap wo Hindi wala marathon join kar sakte ho. Bita, channel ka naam hi PW English hai. Matlab, un saare bacho ke liye marathon hai, jo Hindi nahi samaj sakte. ठीक है तो सबका साथ सबका विकास दैट इज इंपॉर्टेंट ना बच्चा पार्टी सो दैट इज द रीजन कि आई एम स्पीकिंग इन इंग्लिश एंड द स्टूडेंट्स आर आल्सो स्टडीइंग इन इंग्लिश ठीक है आई होप दिस डाउट गेट्स क्लियर्ड है ना नहीं तो कमेंट सेक्शन में बोलोगे सर हिंदी भूल गए सर मातृभाषा में नहीं पढ़ा रहे हो सर है ना तो अब मैं पहले ही बता देता हूं दिस चैनल इज प्योर इंग्लिश एंड वी आर डूइंग अ मैराथन फॉर ऑल द प्योर इंग्लिश वाला बच्चा ठीक है सो दैट वो बच्चा भी अभी पढ़ पाए तो दैट स्टूडेंट कैन आल्सो अंडरस्टैंड है ना आई होप दिस मेक्स मी क्लियर चल ओके सो बच्चों ने आंसर किया है द पीपल हैव आंसर दैट सर द पेंटिंग इज फ्रेडरिक सोरो दैट्स एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट द पेंटर इज फ्रेडरिक सोरो ओके एंड द नेम ऑफ दिस पेंटिंग इज व्हाट इज द नेम ऑफ दिस पेंटिंग द नेम ऑफ दिस पेंटिंग इज द ड्रीम ऑफ वर्ल्ड वाइड डेमोक्रेटिक एंड सोशल रिपब्लिक्स द पैक्ट बिटवीन द नेशंस राइट सो इट्स अ पेंट प्रिपेयर्ड बाय फ्रेडरिक सोरो 1848 नाउ दे इज समथिंग स्पेशल अबाउट दिस पेंटिंग now this painting is always depicted as a utopian vision right it's a utopian vision now what do you mean by this utopia what do you mean by this utopia utopia is a kind of vision it's a kind of thought that is very imaginary in nature it's just like me and the great khali having a cup of coffee together or me fighting with the great khali because that is unimaginable i will never be able to defeat him in a fight the great khali is the great khali he will just you know blow me away in the air it's very simple so if i just uh, tell you and say that if just i call you i just call a, a simple person i just call you and say hey bye how are you so you know today i had a match with a great khali i defeated him i gave him choke slam that is not possible i won't be able to even reach near by his neck even you know so i won't be able to reach near by his neck even that is very difficult for me how will i give choke slam to great khali that is unim that's imaginary right that's very much imaginary that is something that is not likely to happen in reality in the same way we talk about utopia in the same way we talk about utopia to utopian vision is somewhat like this so frederick soro in his painting imagined of a world where everyone has become a nation and these are democratic nations these are republic nations and what they are doing is they are marching together marching means they are walking in a procession and you can see a very beautiful aunty right here Ah, she is a very beautiful auntie, not from my neighborhood. Uh, let me make it very clear. Otherwise, people will be asking in the comment section, sir, does she live nearby your house? No, that's not the case. But she is a beautiful auntie. You can see her. Now, this auntie is called the auntie of liberty. I need the <laughs> liberty now. This auntie is basically liberty, right? So, artist, especially from the French counterparts, if you talk about, so artist in Europe, they started personifying. They started personifying different virtues or ideals as human figures. We all have learned in the English, you know, we all have learned in English about personification. So, what you do is, what is personification? When you give an abstract idea, a human form, let's say if we talk about love, love is a very beautiful feeling, isn't it? But if I give love a human form, I'll say that I have personified love. In the same way, the artists during the French times, during the European times, what they used to do was, they used to give a human form to an abstract idea. Abstract means something that you cannot see or touch. 
लाइक फ्रीडम यू कैन जस्ट फील यू कैन नॉट सी योर टच राइट सो दे गेव अन फॉर्म टू फ्रीडम इन द फॉर्म ऑफ दिस स्टैचू ऑफ लिबर्टी यू कैन सी दैट शी इज होल्डिंग अ टॉर्च इन वन हैंड एंड दिस इज नॉट द केस बिकॉज देर इज नो इलेक्ट्रिसिटी इन आर हाउस नो देर माइट बी सम स्टूडेंट हू माइट बी थिंकिंग दर सर देर आई गेस शी इज होल्डिंग द टॉर्च बिकॉज देर इज नो इलेक्ट्रिसिटी इन द हाउस दैट्स वाई शी इज ट्राइंग टू फाइंड हर कीज सो दैट यू कैन यू नो दैट्स नॉट द केस हेर द टॉर्च सिम्बोलाइज एन लाइटमेंट the torch symbolizes light that is growing that is going to drive away the dark thoughts out of your mind so that is what the torch symbolizes and on the in the other hand you can see a book there it's a kind of book it's a charter now some question some students last year they asked me sir is she holding ncert book now i i'll tell you this happened last year i was taking the same english marathon on the same platform and i got a comment sir is uh, this auntie holding an ncert book so well this is not an ncert book this is a charter it's a kind of book that declares the rights of man and citizen okay that declares the rights of man and citizen so basically what has been done here the painter has tried to show the different ideals he has tried to present an idea that all the nations are living peacefully now many of them have become nation states they are democratic countries now they are republics now and they are paying their respect to this statue of liberty okay clear with this now you can see some debris lying here now this debris or you can say the uh, broken remains okay so these are basically the broken remains of the despotic institutions right now what are these despotic institutions broken remains of despotic institutions right bachcho okay so basically what are these despotic institutions what are these based despotic institutions so broken when you break something when you break it in parts right so what frederick soro has tried to portray here is the despotic institution that means the rules of the monarchy the autocratic monarchy is no more people have transformed into democratic countries republic countries and such kind of institutions who were earlier autocratic in nature they have completely dissolved they have completely broken so this is what the painting tries to signify they may even ask you a picture based question based upon this particular point theek hai chali ओके किंग राजा का मुकुट नाइस बच्चे आई हैव ऑलरेडी टीचिंग फास्ट आई हैव लॉट ऑफ सब्जेक्ट टू टीच बट इफ यू डोंट अंडरस्टैंड द कॉन्सेप्ट देन अगेन देर बी नो पॉइंट राइट सो यू हैव टू राइट आंसर्स इन द पेपर्स यू हैव टू सॉल्व कॉम्पिटेंसी बेस्ड क्वेश्चन सो हाउ विल दैट वर्क इन दैट केस ओके सो लेट्स मूव फर्दर ओके सो बच्चे हर्षित राज ब्लॉक मैं पहले बता चुका हूं कि हिंदी मैराथन नहीं है This channel is in pure English, इसलिए मैं आपको पूरा इंग्लिश में पढ़ा रहा हूं जो हिंदी वाला मैराथन आता है हिंदी और इंग्लिश वाला वो फाउंडेशन चैनल पे आता है बेटा एंड वो शॉर्टली आ जाएगा तो आप उस वाले को भी ज्वाइन कर सकते हैं ठीक है सो दिस इज फॉर ऑल द स्टूडेंट जो हिंदी नहीं समझ पाते एंड दिस इज फॉर देम इन इंग्लिश ठीक है सो आई होप आई एम क्लियर आई होप आई एम क्लियर बच्चे चलिए अब तुम खुद सोचो बच्चे की अगर मतलब तुम इंग्लिश जानते हो और तुमको मैं हिंदी में पढ़ाने लगू तो अच्छा नहीं लगेगा ना फिर आपको तो इट्स वेरी सिंपल ओके चल बच्चे हाउ लॉन्ग दिस क्लास इज गोइंग टू बी हाउ मेनी चैप्टर्स यू हैव इन योर सिलेबस सो इट्स वेरी सिंपल इफ आई विल कवर ऑल द सिलेबस देन डेफिनेट सी बात है कि इट विल टेक लिटिल बिट टाइम राइट वी कॉन्ट फिनिश द इंटायर सिलेबस इन थर्टी मिनट्स कैन यू वी कॉन्ट राइट सो एटलीस्ट बी पेशेंट फोकस ऑन द क्लास सो दैट विल बी हेल्पफुल फॉर यू बच्चे यू कैन कीप समथिंग फॉर योर सेल्स टू ईट सो दैट यू आर नॉट टायर्ड और यू आर नॉट हंग्री राइट ओके now there is one more question that that you know that is here so let me ask you a question and we'll we'll have this on polls okay so let me ask you a question here and we'll just uh, have this on polls okay so it's very simple <coughs> dash is an institution which has complete control over a defined territory over a defined territory done okay we have four options here a b c and d modern state nation state republic or we have this as none of these okay chal so what i am going to do is i am to going to release a poll for you guys okay there will be 30 second poll 
वॉट एवर यू फील इज द करेक्ट आंसर यू जस्ट हैव टू टाइप इट इन द चार्ट ए बी सी और डी सो वट एवर यू फील इज द करेक्ट आंसर जस्ट टाइप इट इन द चार्ट ए बी सी और डी वट एवर यू फील लाइक करेक्ट एंड देन विल हैव द क्वेश्चन आंसर है सो डैश इज एन इंस्टीट्यूशन और अ सेंट्रलाइज अथॉरिटी विच हैज कंप्लीट को कंट्रोल ओवर अ डिफाइंड टेरिटरी वेरी नाइस बेटा very very nice very very nice okay very nice Adi Vibhor I can see a lot of people here yeah so you can yeah this marathon is also good for you helpful for you in case of writing answers yeah but say I'll teach all history geopolity economics everything in one shot everything in one shot right but show everything in one shot hi Devika how are you but say this is class 10th CBSC marathon you know for class 9th uh, content you can visit uh, two channels one is PW foundation and one is PW Hindi 9 and 10 so that is also for all the Hindi medium students for the Hindi content so you can visit that channel so you can visit that Hindi content per sakte ho. Hai? so I have the answers with me so this question can also be asked as Dash is an institution or centralized authority which has complete control over a defined territory the correct answer is modern state right now what is the difference between a modern and a nation state it's very simple in a modern state, the ruler will have no connectivity with the people, right? The ruler is least bothered with the people. He is least interested what is going to be there. Okay, he doesn't have a common bonding with the people. But uh, in the case of nation state, the ruler will have a common history with the people living in his area, living in his territory. They may have common language. They may have common culture. So this is what makes nation state different from a modern state, right? So option number E was correct here. And 40% people gave me the correct answer. However, that's a fair number that will keep on improving as we progress further in the chapter. Right? Okay. So, there's a big difference between modern and nation state. This question is also asked at times. Modern state is a state, okay, where a centralized authority, it's a central authority that has control over certain area, but the rulers are not having any connection with the people living there. Whereas, when we talk about a nation state, this is not the case. In a nation state, the rulers they have a connection with the people. It may be they are having a shared history, a shared culture, a shared descent, right? So something that bonds them together. So this is what is a nation state and a modern state, right? So let me have a few people. Okay, we have Zeus with us. Hardik Tiwari, Akash, Rohan, Ashwini, Athar, Varsha, Rajni, Adi, Prince. Okay, Racer, Kar, Bhoat, Sare Bache. Okay, so let's move further now. Okay, so there is a question. There is a question. I'll just uh, help you out with the same. So there is a question that is very, very popular. That's very, very popular in the board examinations and now what is this question there is a question that is very often asked the question is what steps were taken by the french revolutionaries what steps were taken by the french revolutionaries by the french revolutionaries to create a sense of collective identity by the french revolutionaries to create a sense of collective identity to create a sense of collective identity. Done? Okay. So, this is a question that can be asked in three markers or five markers. Now, what are the points that we need to write? So, we all remember that we had a revolution in France in the year. Come on, fill in the blanks. In which year did we have a revolution in France? I want the answers in the chat. All my amazing superstars. Yeah, all the amazing superstars. So, we had a revolution in France in which year? In which year? Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Oh, so people started, people started answering, giving me the correct answers. Wow, that's really amazing. <laughs> one student is asking, sir, aapne kab English seekhi? Oh, let me tell you one thing. Uh, I guess, you know what happened? The, this year, we did not have that many English batches. So, or the people, those who are coming from the foundation platform, like VW Foundation channel. So, they will be little surprised seeing me speaking in English because they all know that. Okay, now the point is, last year, there were multiple batches we had. We had an Ignite batch on VW English platform. We had a complete board booster batch in English. So, this year, we are having more of YouTube content, free content. So, that is why you people haven't seen me taking lectures in English, right? I have taken lectures last year as well. Okay. So, this is after a long time, I'm coming back on this platform. Okay. So, Bacha Badi has given me the correct answer, sir. The revolution was in 1789. Yeah, that is perfect, right? So, we had a revolution in France in 1789. And what was the result of this 
revolution the result was very simple that the power transfer there was the power transfer from the power transfer from absolute monarchy that is from louis 16 okay to a body of french citizens to a body of french citizens so we all remember then that whenever when the revolution happened in france in 1789 then france turned into a constitutional monarchy right do you remember your class 9 lectures do you remember your class 9 lessons that what happened when 1789 a revolution happened in france when the revolution happened in france then the result was that france turned from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy that means the leader of the government will still be the king okay but his power is going to be limited by the implementation of a constitution so the real power now rested in the hands of the french people than being in the hands of louis 16 that same poor guy who was literally tortured by his wife you know i'm i'm really telling you the fact his wife was beautiful there's no doubt about that but his wife was you know uh, she had his her own uh, like you can say that luxury choices right and that is the reason louis 16 my poor louis 16 my poor friend he was you know he spent his entire life in fulfilling the multiple choices right so basically what happened in 1789 when french revolution took place its result was the power transferred from absolute monarchy to the body of french citizens or france became a constitutional monarchy now so basically what happened there were revolutionaries in france who in order to create a collective identity took some measures right so you can write these pointers in your board examinations in your answer sheets right these are very good pointers you can note them down okay you will get the notes also you get the link of the notes in the description of the video you can check out after the session ends okay so what happened here was number one uh, number one the first expression of nationalism came with french revolution Second important point, during the French Revolution, what happened? The power transferred from absolute monarchy to a body of French citizens. That means from absolute to constitutional monarchy. Then what happened? There were certain steps taken by the French revolutionaries so that they can create a sense of collective identity among the people. Now, what were these steps? Number one, the ideas of La Patre and Lee Citoyen. So basically, the revolutionaries in France, in Hindi, we call them Krantikari right so the revolutionaries in france they started promoting the idea of the concept of fatherland like in india we call india as a motherland we call it as bharat mata that is a way of referring to our nation in the same way these revolutionaries also started referring to the nation as the fatherland or la patre okay prior to the revolution if you see there was a culture in the french society of calling the males as monsire or sir and calling the females as madame or ma'am like suppose if you want to approach a lady in France in those times, you would say that Madame, bonjour. Okay, so that means very simple. So basically, this idea uh, actually segregated the people, right? And the revolutionaries in France thought that why not design a common term for the people so that they can feel united and not discriminated. So they started calling people by the title of Lee Citoy and that means the citizen. So the ideas of Monsire and Madame were re removed. And that was replaced by Lee Sitoy and that means the citizen. Okay. Second important point. Now, and why this was done? This was done so that a united community can enjoy equal rights under a constitution. So, that was the idea or the objective behind this particular change. Second, there was a new French tricolor flag that was chosen in order to replace the former royal standard. Because earlier what happened, you must have seen that the different kingdoms, they used to have their own symbols they used to have their own flags but again that did not promote unity among the people that only showed the superiority of the king so what happened here was the french revolutionaries they designed a new tricolor flag like we all love our national flag isn't it we all love our tiranga tiranga is the flag that has three colors in the same way they also designed the french flag that has three colors and it replaced the formal royal standard now you remember about that body political body that Louis XVI used to call in order to increase the taxes. You remember that a state general good for nothing? Yeah, we used to have a political body in France that was only meant for increasing the taxes, right? 
So when power got transferred in the hands of the people, what they did was they re-elected that body and renamed that as National Assembly. So basically a state general was re-elected and it was renamed as National Assembly. Now, what happened? Centralized administration system was put into place. So basically the administration was centralized. So there was a particular, now the parliament was uh, making laws, uniform laws for the entire French people. Okay, so, they, so that there is no discrimination among the people, right? Right. Okay. Apart from that, the internal duties, internal customs, the taxes or the dues of the peasants. Dues are something that we call karza in Hindi, right? So the dues of the peasants, that is the farmers, they were abolished, right? All the internal taxes were abolished. Apart from that, uniform system of weights and measurements was put into place. Because if you want to do a business, right? If you want to uh, do trading, right? So it's very important that you should have some friendly laws. You should have some uniform systems of weights and measurements, right? So that will facilitate easy movement of goods and capital. So as a result, what was done? Uniform systems of weights and measurement was uh, yeah, uh, adopted. And the best part, there were many regional dialects that were very much prevalent in the French society. So these revolutionaries, they said that all the dialects will be stopped from now on. And there will be only one common language that is French language that will be promoted among the people. So that people could feel that they are living in a country, they are living in a united community who is having the similar kind of rights and who, are, who is joined by a certain emotion or certain uh, laws or regulations that would make them feel that they are a part of a united family, a united community, right? And apart from that, uh, this, you can also add a point here that new hymns were written, new songs were composed, oaths were taken, all those people who martyred for the cause of the nation, they were remembered. Even we remember our soldiers, right? We all respect our soldiers who fight day and night to protect our country. And we also remember them for their contributions, especially on the national festivals, whether it be uh, Independence Day or the Republic Day. We all remember our soldiers, right? Who had sacrificed their life for the nation, who had died for the sake of the nation, who had died, sacrificed their life protecting the nation. So they are martyrs. In Hindi, we call it as Shaheed. In English, we call it as martyrs, right? So, we all remember our martyrs. We have patriotic songs that we always sing, right? So, basically, this kind of feeling, we can say that, was kindled in the entire French territory, right? So, this is a very important, important topic. Now, let's move further. Okay. Now, let's come to a very interesting personality in history, and that is Napoleon. Recently, there was a movie based on Napoleon Bonaparte. However, I just missed watching that movie. So, there were many recommendations also. Well, uh, how many of you, uh, chalo, let me ask you a very simple question. A very, very simple question on polls. Okay. So, on polls. Let me have this question on polls. Actually, the stylus is little bit changed. No. So, that is why the friction is very less on the board. However, we will just have a question here. So, Napoleon was crowned French Emperor in Dash. Okay, so we have four, four options, A, B, C and D, 1801, 1804, 1808, 1810, okay. So we have four options and you know what to do, you know the drill, you just have to write the correct options in your chat and that will be recorded, that's all, okay. So 30 seconds, very nice, I can see some good students, okay, very nice, yeah. very, very nice. Now, who is this creating a gimmick in the chat? It's a pre-recorded stream. But one entire live person is standing, standing right in front of you. I'm teaching with all my heart and soul. And then you come and say that, sir, it's a pre-recorded stream. But it hurts here. You know, you comment, it hurts here. Good comment, but it hurts here. It's not a pre-recorded stream, my dear. Okay, there's a difference between recorded and live. Hey, na? Yeah, literally. But it hurts and it hurts a lot and there is no one to repair it as well. Okay? Hanji. So, but see, the correct answer is very simple. Okay? Okay. But see, there are multiple countries, you know, multiple countries that you can identify. Germany was also there, Switzerland was also there, right? German states were there, Switzerland was there. Right, then Belgium was there. So, there were many states who were still not the nation states. Right. So, you can identify them. Okay. So, correct answer for this one is 1804. Now, there is a student who is selling that. Sir, is your shop closed today? 
Is your DK samosa bhandar closed today? Yes, but say today is Dogesh is managing that you know store. So because he is, he said that I'll take the responsibility to manage the store, and that is why I'm here. You know, uh, just teaching all the my lovely students who are very much comfortable in the English language. So that's uh, the reason I'm here. And those who don't know what is who is Dogesh, so you can find that guy in in some other marathon, right? So he is uh, managing one of my stores where we sell crispy samosas, right? Kunal Chauhan, Anmol Chauhan, Yuvraj, Naitik, Vaibhav, Arpit, Sari Konda, okay, Dhruvika, Akhilesh, Shreyanshi, very nice, very, very nice. Okay, that's superb guys, that's superb. Okay, so the correct answer was, achha, the correct answer was 1804, now let's move further. Okay, now let me talk, talk about this interesting personality called Napoleon. Now, Napoleon was a very interesting guy, you know. He was one person. Achha, this is very, very special talk about Napoleon. If you have, if you ever read about the life history of Napoleon, there were multiple times when Napoleon failed. There are people who are afraid and scared of failures. People say that, sir, I haven't scored good in pre-board exams. Will I score well in my board exams? The answer is yes. If you are ready to score, you will score. It's very simple as that. If you talk about the life of Napoleon, Napoleon failed many times in his life. But ultimately, we remember Napoleon for multiple things he did in the European continent and the name he created for himself, right? So, if you talk about the Napoleon's rule, roughly last from somewhere around 99 to 1815. Now, if you talk about Napoleon was the guy who took the benefit of the weakness of the directory in France. Remember, after that reign of terror, there was a new kind of government that was ruling France in those days and that was directory. Now, this directory had a loophole because the people in this particular government were always fighting for the powers amongst themselves, right? So, as a result, we see that, as a result, we see that the Napoleon was one guy who was excellent military journal. He took the advantage of this and formed a new government that is called as consulate, right? This consulate term is not given in NCRT. So, I'm just introducing it to you. So, he formed a new government somewhere around 1799-1800 that is called consulate and then he became the first consul. So, since he was the first consul or the first minister, you can say, of that government, so he was very powerful. And later on in 1804, he declared himself as the emperor of France, right? So, by returning to monarchy, Napoleon destroyed the democracy in France. So, no doubt he destroyed democracy, all the democratic principles that were, you can say, that flourishing in France. Because when Napoleon, you know, he started, he started getting power, he transformed himself into an emperor. He crowned himself an emperor in the year 1804. Now, there were some changes that Napoleon introduced in the administrative field, right? In all those regions that Napoleon captured, he introduced multiple changes. Okay, now there's a question on Civil Code of 1804, Napoleonic Code of 1804. This question comes for three markers, right? Three mark questions, okay? Now, so what was basically the Napoleonic Code or the Civil Code of 1804? It's very easy to understand. See what happened in European continent. Basically, the people were given benefits, the social benefits on the basis of the class they were born into, right? Suppose you are born in a king's family, in a nobility family or an aristocrat family or you are born in someone's church family. So, you will be getting all the social benefits. But if you are born into a common man's family, you will be deprived of all the benefits. You will not be getting any benefits of the society, right? So, this was something that's not justified. So, what Napoleon did, he removed all the privileges, all the benefits based upon the birth. Second, what he did was he promoted equality and secured the right to property. Earlier, what happened, even if you are having money, you did not have the right to buy this, uh, the private property because private property was bought only by the rich and the influentials in the society, like the nobility class, like the church. So, what he did was he established the right to property. Third important point, he abolished the feudal system. Right, so like we had zamindari system in India in the olden times where there was a huge zamindar with big, big moustache. You know, he used to have a great piece of land. On, he, on that, he used to make the people work either for free or either at very low cost. So, similarly, in European uh, times, we had, in the European countries, we had a similar system called as feudalism. Okay, so what he did was he abolished this system and he made the peasants or the farmers free. And he also abolished a lot of dues of the farmers, right? Apart from that, in the towns, there were certain organizations to manage the business affairs and they are called as guilds, right? So, there were certain restrictions on those guilds. So, what Napoleon did was he removed all those restrictions. So, they were also now free to do business activities. Now, the point is people were very much happy. Now, people were very, very much happy with all the uh, changes that Napoleon introduced. For example, and the best part was 
he introduced these changes in all the territories that Napoleon captured, right? For example, the Dutch Republic, the Switzerland, right? The German states. So wherever the Napoleonic armies went and captured the areas, he introduced all these reforms in all those states, right? So people initially, the businessmen, the farmers, they were very much happy with this new kind of freedom that they were getting, the new kind of development that they were experiencing. But again, all this happiness and achievement was very short-lived, you know? It is said that with great power comes great responsibility and a great ruler is a person who is able to connect well with the subjects. That means the people who are living in his territory. No doubt Napoleon introduced some drastic changes, some revolutionary changes in the administration of the territories managed by him. But there were few pointers on which Napoleon lacked and this is what made the people hostile towards Napoleon. But this is what made the people turn against Napoleon. Right. And what were those pointers? Number one. He took away the political freedom. Now, what is the political freedom? Basically, the freedom to express, freedom to criticize the government. People did not have that. He increased the taxation. In certain areas, he increased the taxes. Then, he forcefully started recruiting people in the army. Because Napoleon was one guy who had a dream to conquer the most parts of the Europe, right? And for that, he will be needing a strong army. And since when you go on a battle, definitely you don't have superpowers, right? If you, are, if you get shot by a bullet, you are going to die. It's that simple. And you have to be replaced by someone else. So, continuously, you will be requiring the number of soldiers. So, as a result, Napoleon started recruiting the people into the army forcefully. And this is what made the people angry. And we say that since Napoleon's growing power was also a matter of concern for multiple states around him. Like Britain, like Russia, like Prussia, like Austria. So, these were the big powers who were very much disturbed because of the growing power of Napoleon. And that is why we see that these powers, they come together to crush the glowing influence of Napoleon. We see, witnessed two battles here. Number one, the Battle of Leipzig, that is 1813 to 14, where England, Austria, Prussia and Russia, they formed a coalition. They formed a big group against Napoleon. Okay. So, what happened? Napoleon, in the initial phases, he was little bit successful against these countries and he still won few territories but again in October 1813 he was defeated in the battle of Leipzig and he was arrested and then again sent into to send to the Elba right now again what happened Napoleon returned back again he tried to recapture back everything and 1815 we see that Napoleon okay Napoleon he returns back to France rules France for 100 days and again a battle breaks out between these four powers that is England Austria Prussia and Russia and Napoleon and this was called as the Battle of the Waterloo, 1815. You can call it, there's a very famous, you know, I remember, it's a very famous idiom or a proverb in English, that is the last nail in the coffin. Last nail in the coffin is like the final event. So, 1815 turned out to be a final event in Napoleon's career and his achievements. And we see that he lost the Battle of Waterloo. So, after he lost the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon was sent to an island, that is of St. Uh, Helena, right, where he spent the last days, right. Okay, so finally what we see here is Napoleon's rule ended and again the superpowers became super influential, right? Okay, so I have a question for you and the question is very simple, okay. What were the major causes? What were the major causes for people turning hostile towards Napoleon, right? Okay, so this is the question in very simple terms. We have four options here. Increased taxation and censorship. Improved communication. Freedom from taxes. Freedom from taxes or both B and C. Done. So, these are the four options we have. Now, let me release the poll, guys. 
Say if I am releasing the poll and here we go. 30 seconds poll, you need to tell me that what should be the correct answer. Okay, superb. Okay, superb guys, superb. Very nice guys. Anyone wants water? Shall I order a few garam samosas from the DK Samosa Bandar? What do you say guys? Okay, very nice, very nice, very nice. But say English, I will teach on the foundation platform, hai na, my dear Balak. So Balak, Bacha Gera, Bacha Gera, sir, English will be So Bacha, sir, English will be taught, but foundation wale platform. Pe. Thik hai? Ya, thoda hamare English wale Bacha hai, thoda confused rehte hai, bichare. Inko be thoda padh lein dete hai, hai na? To achche se padh lein, Bacha, inko be padh do thoda Angreji mein ekdam dekh raha tu. Chalo, <laughs> chalo. So, bhai, very simple. The correct answer is increased taxation and censorship can be the most probable reason. So, option number A was absolutely correct. 88% people have answered me the correct answer. That's really appreciable, guys. That's super, bhai. Okay, Athar, Nitish, Vaibhav, Anmol, Daring, Priyanka. Wow, that's superb. So, dar kya aage? Jeet hai. Daring, Priyanka. Very nice. So, bache, vese, any daring experience you would like to share? Hum baad baad karenge. Thik hai? Chal. Okay, now let's 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 come to a very interesting concept that is making of nationalism in Europe. Okay, hi, Acha. Print culture. Ha, Tanish, we'll be doing the print culture, beta. I cannot jump from Napoleon to print culture directly, right? And those who are uh, one person asked me the questions and changes by Napoleon. So, beta, if you scroll back a little bit in the video, I was explaining that only ki what were the changes introduced by Napoleon. So, you can just reach out to that slide, right? So, we'll be doing print culture also. But, but I cannot jump in the midst from Napoleon straight away to print culture, right? So, that will create a khichdi or you can say a porridge in the mind of the people, isn't it? So, how many of you have eaten khichdi at your home? Khichdi. All the Indian households, all the Indian households, we always know one particular dish that's called khichdi. So, how, have you, how many of you have ever eaten khichdi at your home? Achha, okay, okay, very simple. Satyam, beta, Satyam, my dear, that only like I have discussed, right? A few minutes back. So, do a little bit of hard work, scroll a little bit back, you'll get your answer. Okay. Fine, Devesh, hi, Devesh. Okay. Achha, very nice, Avinash. Sabudana khichdi and rice khichdi. Okay. I'm afraid of both, you don't have to be here. Devesh is saying, sir, why bana hua hai? Okay, very nice. Several times. Very nice. Eating now khichdi. Ashwag is saying, sir, I am eating khichdi now. Okay. So, if you understand this, you see, if you can see this map or you can talk about Europe. So, Europe was also khichdi in that case. In khichdi, what we do is we mix multiple ingredients and then we pick, uh, prepare a certain porridge, you know. It's, it's uh, multiple types of pulses, multiple types of rice. So, we are multiple, multiple things in which we, you know, just mix it up and we prepare this khichdi or the porridge. Now, the point is, if I ask you, what taste are you getting out of khichdi or which dal have I mixed? It's very difficult to make out, yeah. You are least concerned about which dal I have mixed, which type of rice I have mixed or whatever I have mixed. You are least bothered about that, right? In the same way, if you talk about this map, if you see this, Okay, so basically this is a map of the Habsburg Empire. Okay, so basically Habsburg dynasty, Habsburg Empire. So this is basically a dynasty. Okay, just like we have dynasties in India, right? The Mauryan Empire, the Gupta Empire. In the same way in Europe, we had in Habsburg Empire. And this empire ruled over the territories of Austria and Hungary. It ruled over the territories of Austria and Hungary, right? Now, the interesting thing about this empire was Every part that came into this empire had a different culture. People spoke different languages and also geographically, the areas that came under this empire were very much different, right? If you talk about, you can see some areas here like Austria, okay? Like you can see the Tyrol, Bohemia, right? If you can talk about, uh, you can see this one, Hungary, right? Transylvania, then we have Slavonia, right? Then we have, uh, uh, again, then we have so many areas here, right? So you can see these. So these areas, the Cro Croatia, Carniola. So in the present case, these are independent nations, right? These are now independent nations. But in those times, they were the part of this empire called the Habsburg Empire. Okay, that ruled over the areas of Austria and Hungary. Now, interesting case in this empire was the different regions 
that came in its extent the people living in these regions had a different language okay they spoke different languages they had different culture only thing that was common between them was their emperor so there was nothing common in them the only thing that was common in between them was their emperor right otherwise all these regions that came under the extent of this empire had a different culture had a different languages okay the people living here were also very different some belonged from the rich aristocratic classes some belonged from the poor uh, farming classes some belonged from the rich farming classes so there was lot of variety in this entire dynasty now you have to create a feeling of unity among the people a feeling of patriotism among the people a feeling that should make them feel that they are the part of a united country and that feeling is called nationalism so how will you make that feeling so that feeling will definitely not be made in one day or a two day or three day so that will take time right that will take time to create now let's understand how this happened okay so that we come to the topic the making of nationalism in europe right so we talk about there were no nation states in europe right we cannot recall of a nation state in europe because people did not have a common identity or culture second thing the people that were living in the different areas they spoke different languages for example the people in hungary right if you talk about the people living in hungary half of the population spoke magyar language and the other half spoke a variety of other languages if you talk about the people living in galicia most of the people spoke polish language so what we see here is in the different kingdoms that were there in europe and the people living in those kingdoms there was nothing common people were different on the basis of their culture on the basis of their language the only thing that united them was their common emperor that they were the part of a kingdom who had a certain emperor that was the only common identity now let's try understanding the classes let's try understanding the society of europe because this will help us to get a better idea of how europe was doing right so let's try to get an understanding of the society of europe number 1 so if we talk about europe there were three major classes aristocracy peasant class and the middle class aristocracy were the guys who were very rich they had large land large public estates you know just like you can call them as uh, modern day ambani right so as in india we have modern day ambani tata they have large properties big houses lot of money you know so money man money paisa so they had lot of paisa so this class was called as aristocracy okay this class had this was an entire europe it's not the case of only few parts of europe but the entire europe this class was very dominant right so they had a large amount of lands again they spoke french language for the purpose of diplomacy like in india we speak english language to you know at times to impress people english okay here i'm not trying to impress you guys okay it's not like that sir wants to impress us that's why sir is speaking in english it's not the case i'm speaking in english for all those students who don't understand hindi okay ha uh, because i know that there will be someone coming up with a comment oh sir that is the reason you are taking the class in english language okay now we understand sir okay you're trying to sir impress sir hai na that is not the case okay so well i'll talk about so in general if you talk about english language so what happens in india also we say that a person who is speaking english is a very educated fine person right you always hold that person in high esteem you give a lot of respect to that person the same way we talk about if we talk about in uh, you know europe so in europe what happened this rich class aristocratic class they used to speak french language so they used to speak the french language and a, and apart from that they used to marry within their own classes nowadays also if you see that if there is a rich guy he will never marry a poor girl or a rich girl is not going to marry a poor guy that's very common nowadays also the big fat indian weddings you have seen that people rich people marrying into rich classes marrying into rich families isn't it and that was also the common case in terms of europe also now if you talk about in terms of number their population was small but yet they were very influential and very dominating second class was the peasant population so majority of people in european continents also were farmers however their position was very much different if you talk about the eastern europe their condition was little much better some of them they had their own land so they were tenants okay when we talk about central and the western europe and all you will see that most of them they work on certain other people's land okay so the peasants or the farmers were also very much divided some of them they had their own small lands while most of them they worked on as a labor on someone others lands okay now now comes the middle class 
So as industrialization and urbanization started spreading soon in the European continents, so what happened? We see the emergence of a new class that was working in these factories, that was doing some kind of business activities, or the people who were working as teachers, as doctors, as lawyers. So this was the professional class. It was educated, palhalikha, literate, right? So this is the class who is considered to be the backbone of several movements, not only in Europe, but across the world. So, it's always the educated people who get to understand that something is fishy around, right? It's always the people who are aware about their rights and they are the people who try to raise their voice against the wrong practices, right? In Europe also, we see that middle class has an important role to play when we talk about, when we talk about, what do we talk about? Raising the voice against the unjust practices, okay? Now, if we talk about uh, the French Revolution, let's return back to those French days. How many of you like the King Louis XVI? Just tell me honestly in the chats. You must have read about Louis XVI in your class 9. How many of you have sympathy with that guy? That's a poor guy, let me tell you really. That guy was first of all married at a very small age. When he should be playing around, he should be exploring life, he got married. And to uh, the girl, very beautiful, no doubt about that. You know, boys will be like, Louis XVI will be like, Vaise to main sakt hun, but yaha main pigal gaya. Marie Antoinette was beautiful. Undoubtedly, she was beautiful. But the point is, that guy had a poor life. He was burdened with all the taxes, plus poor advisors, right? Even his wife also was not a good advisor. She was moreover, you know, you can say that, ki, you know, moreover, she was more, you can say that, uh, busy in her own uh, luxuries, right? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so what type of question will come from? Basically, but say this, uh, this uh, from this particular part, the question has not been asked in the boards. I'll talk, uh, I'll talk about like how the question comes from this particular part, right? So there's a question that comes here. Uh, right, so let me write down the question from this topic. So the question is very simple. Liberalism stood for different stood for different meanings in different aspects, yeah, various aspects, in various aspects. Okay, explain. Okay, so this is how the question comes from this particular topic that liberal nationalism or liberalism stood for different meaning in various aspects. Explain this point. So this has been asked in the previous years also. So wherever the question is there, I'll, I'll just keep on writing. So basically what is liberal nationalism? Try to understand this point. Okay. Basically the word liberal nationalism or liberalism comes from a Latin word liber which means free. Right. So if you talk about liberalism, it stood for the freedom of the individual and equality of all before the law. So, liberalism was a kind of concept, okay. Just like we had Satyagraha concept, right. We remember Gandhi ji and his Satyagraha. It was a kind of concept, a way of fighting the Britishers or the unjust authorities, right. In the same way, liberalism is also a concept which talks about freedom of the individual, any freedom of the people and equality before the law. So, that there is no one is being discriminated by any means, okay. So, we can understand liberalism in three common aspects, political sphere, economic sphere and the social sphere. So, in society, yeah, for the middle classes, the meaning, of, uh, the meaning of liberalism was that everyone should have the freedom and everyone should be equal before the law. If you remember the French Revolution, these were the common ideals in those times. People were very much active in fighting for these causes. They always wanted freedom of the individual. They always wanted to be equal before the law. And this was again the major demands of the middle classes in the European continent, right? Now, second, if you talk about political terms, the people of the middle classes, the educated people, they started focusing, they started demanding a government that is run through a parliament. The concept of government by consent, that means by approval, that is a parliamentary government. They wanted to end the rule of autocracy. They wanted to end the domination of the king, the nobility, and they wanted that a voting system should be organized, a parliament should be made, a constitution should be made and the power of the king should be limited by that constitution. 
Now, let me be very clear in this case that these guys are not talking about democracy. Democracy is not being asked or demanded by the middle classes. They were very comfortable with constitutional monarchy. Okay, many people mistake it here for uh, they, that they are asking democracy. They are not asking democracy, guys. So, basically, the concept was to uh, make a government, to set up a government that is constitutional monarchy, where the leader will be a king, but his powers will be limited by a constitution. There will be a parliament. Parliament will have the representatives and the people will be asked before taking a certain decision. So, this is what liberalism stood in the political sphere. Now, let's talk about economic sphere. So, what happened? In the European countries, most of the business activities were very much regulated because these kings and rulers, they used to take a lot of taxes on the business transactions, on the trading that was done, right? So, it became very difficult for the people to operate the goods and capital. So, basically, liberalism focused on the concept of abolishing all the unnecessary trade barriers, right? and abolishing all the government restrictions on the movements of goods and capital. If the government will allow to the free movement of goods and capitals, definitely the business will flourish and also the people will grow. So, basically they wanted to remove all such kind of restrictions on the movement of goods and capital. So, this is a very interesting example in NCRT. Okay. So, if you have heard about German speaking nations, now German is a language. Okay. So, what Napoleon did, Napoleon uh, created a group of 39 states where the people spoke German language, okay. So, created a 39 states confederation where the people started speaking the German language, okay. Now, what happened in these German states, every state had its own currency and the system of weights and measurement. Now, this also brings me to a very great example that is Kunal Kaprawala. Now, in my previous birth, however, I have stopped believing in this birth and rebirth wala process. But still, I remember in my previous birth, I was a cloth merchant. And I, I was a person who used to sell kapra in Europe or the cloth in Europe. Now, suppose if I was in these German states and I have to go between two places selling my clothes. Let's say Nuremberg to Hamburg. There are two places. If I have to sell my cloth, then what is going to happen here is from Nuremberg to Hamburg, I'll have to pass through 11 tax barriers. So, I used to sell clothes there. Fine cloth, beautiful cloth, wonderful cloth. Once you go and take this cloth, you will never return back. Okay, so I, I used to sell my cloth there. Okay, so just imagine if I'm, if I'm traveling between two points. So, I had to pay taxes at 11 places. There were 11 trade barriers, 11 tax barriers. And every place I had to pay 5% tax. Now, imagine if I'll have to pay so much of tax, what will I save? That's a big problem. And apart from that, tax was implemented according to the weights and measurements of the product. So, in those times, the cloth was measured not in meters, but LA. So, LA was the unit of cloth measurement in Germany and every place had a different measurement for LA. So, as a result, as a trader, as a business person, it's very difficult for me to trade between these states as it will be very costly for me. Right. So, what happened? The middle class Germans, they realized this problem and they decided to bring a, come up with a solution. So, what happened? Prussia was the strongest state, right? Out of these, all the German speaking states, there was a state called Prussia and that was very powerful. So, Prussia took the initiative and he said that uh, let's, form a, uh, let's form an organization or a customs union and the objective of this customs union will be to abolish the unnecessary trade barriers and also to reduce the number of the currencies. Okay, in German language, we call such a customs union as Zolverin. So, what was Zolverin? Zolverin was formed in 1834 at the initiative of Prussia. Okay, and its task was to reduce the number of currencies to from over 30 to 2 and also to reduce the trade barriers, the unnecessary trade barrier, unnecessary trade barriers that basically hindered the movement of the goods and the capital. Okay, so after the Zolverin was formed, the trade between these German states became very smooth. Also, the transportation system was improved. So, as a result, people realized that if there is a uniform law throughout the country, then everyone will be very happy with that, right? Everyone will be able to function well and live well, right? So, this is the concept behind. Okay. So, fine. So, we have done with this liberal nationalism. Okay. So, let me have a question. So, let me have a question. So, it's a very simple question out here. So, it's a one mark question, a very much repeated question. So, let me ask you this one. So, Zolverin was formed 
एट द इनिशिएटिव ऑफ डैश ओके फोर ऑप्शंस रशिया ब्रिटेन ऑस्ट्रिया एंड प्रशिया डन ओके सो जोलवरीन वॉज फॉर्म्ड एट द इनिशिएटिव ऑफ रशिया ब्रिटेन ऑस्ट्रिया एंड प्रशिया ओके सुपर वेरी नाइस गाइज वेरी वेरी नाइस वेरी वेरी नाइस बच्चों वेरी वेरी नाइस स माई डियर उड़ाओन के बच्चों का अलग से मैराथन होगा जो हम लोग हिंदी इंग्लिश मिक्स वाला करते हैं ना बच्चे वो फाउंडेशन चैनल पे होगा ठीक है सो वो अभी शॉर्टली स्टार्ट होगा वो भी आपका ये हमारा इंग्लिश का मैराथन है बच्चे सारे इंग्लिश वाले बच्चों के लिए जो हिंदी नहीं समझते ठीक है सो दिस वो सो देन श्योर श्रद्धा आई डू दैट Will come up with the Russian reason as well. Okay, so let let me have this question here. Okay, so very simple. Uh, so Zolverine was formed at the initiative of. You all know that it was formed at the initiative of Prussia. Okay, so option number D is here. Okay, here we go. Ninety-seven percent people have given me the correct answers. That is superb, guys. Scan the Sari Konda, Avinash, H C Gamein, Manuna, Arpit Singh, Farooq Abadi. Hi, Arpit. Athar Varadya, Inba. Very nice. Now this is a very, uh, very you know, amazing student. She has asked her, "What is a modern state?" See, it's very simple. Have you heard about? Uh, you must have known. You must know about. You know, remember the times when we were in the under the British, right? Remember those times. So the Britishers, they had no connection with the Indians, right? They were just a central authority. They just had their government, and they were ruling over India. That's all, right? so modern state is basically a kind of country a kind of region where we have a government okay and that government is ruling over a certain area the leaders of that government they don't have any connection with the people they don't know the people even they are least bothered about their rights their problems their emotions they don't care about anything they are just concerned with the area that they are ruling over that's all right so that is basically what a modern state all about in a nation state that is not the case in a nation state the rulers they have a connection with the people okay like for example when we got independent right so our indian rulers they had a connection with the people they had struggled with us we had similar culture right we have experienced everything together so that is what makes a nation state right and in a modern state all such things are missing so i hope this clears your doubt beta chali so let's move on further okay so Fine. So this is what is, but so liberal nationalism. So liberal nationalism is a very, very, very good concept. Okay, and it's very much asked in the examinations also. Now let's quickly move further to the new conservatism of 1815. Now, brother, what happened here? Okay. Now, so you remember our dear Napoleon got defeated in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Okay. So our Napoleon got defeated in the Battle of Waterloo. He was kicked out of France. Hey, Napoleon, just go. So he was kicked out of France. so what we realize here what we see here is number 1 so basically the conservatism now what is this idea called conservatism now conservatism is an idea which believes that the old traditions and institutions what are the old institutions the church the monarchy the nobility so these guys they believe that these institutions should be respected their orders should be followed right so these are the guys who are still having a very orthodox thinking very backward thinking right so they believe in the dominance of these institutions and they believe that these institutions should be well respected so what happened when napoleon got defeated in the battle of waterloo and he was sent out of france so these big powers that is britain russia austria prussia they thought that why not to reverse the changes that napoleon had introduced okay so what they thought was they thought that let's reverse the changes that napoleon had introduced in europe so they called a congress now what is a congress it's a gatheration of people okay in panchayat you can call hindi may you can call it as panchayat so they called a congress of people in vienna so vienna is a city in austria okay so vienna is a city in austria so they called a panchayat in vienna in 
ओके एंड दिस वॉज होस्टेड बाय द चांसलर ऑफ वियना दैट इज ड्यूक मिटर्निच ओके सो वॉट हैपन जिस राइट ऑल है वियना कांग्रेस होस्टेड बाय ड्यूक मेटर्निच ओके सो ड्यूक इज बेसिकली अ टाइटल लाइक इन इंडिया वी आर चीफ मिनिस्टर प्राइम मिनिस्टर्स राइट in the in the case of austria we had a chancellor a very high official in the government right and his name was metternich duke is the title okay so basically a vienna congress was hosted and a treaty was signed in vienna so basic objective of this treaty was to reverse the changes that were introduced by napoleon okay now what happened here is number 1 what was the first reverse that bourbon dynasty you remember the bourbon dynasty to which that louis 16 belong i'm not talking about the bourbon chocolate biscuits now people will be hungry they'll be saying sir yeah bourbon chocolate biscuits we all remember that oh sir it's my favorite it's actually my favorite yaar theek hai so if if you also eat those biscuits they are very tasty isn't it okay let's move from the bourbon biscuits otherwise i'll start feeling hungry and to be honest yaar i haven't eaten anything since morning last meal i had was in night yesterday the reason i had lot of classes and also i had to meet you so that energy comes from you guys okay so what happens here is bourbon dynasty was restored to power in france okay so one of the relatives of louis 16 was again made the emperor of france now a series of states were created on the french boundary so that french power should not expand in future for example in the northern part of france you can see that kingdom of netherlands was created right and belgium was also added to this kingdom apart from that german confederations were left untouched the other powers like prussia and austria they also gained important territories they also got hold of important european territories which were under earlier under the control of napoleon okay however the 39 german states were not touched so they were not uh, disturbed at all okay so the major intention the main intention here was to restore the monarchies that had been defeated and overthrown by the napoleon right okay now let's come to the next very important topic that is the revolutionaries now who are these guys revolutionaries so basically are these are those people these are those people who want to bring a sudden change in the society who want to bring a drastic change in the society they are called as the revolutionaries right okay beta raja we are here to discuss the marathon and do something more productive so bachche if you are uh, very much into understanding so this is basically a marathon about uh, all those students who have come here to study who find hindi difficult to understand so beta when your name says raja at least do things like that isn't it so it's very simple bachche so people have come here to study if you feel like studying you can also study bachche hai na so it's very simple so gain something your board examinations are coming so it's a marathon for all those lovely students who find it difficult to understand the chapters in hindi right who find it difficult to understand things in hindi so this is a special effort from all uh, from the from our side to help those students as well okay because for us every student is important hai na ताकि जो बच्चा हिंदी नहीं समझ सकता अंग्रेजी समझता है इंग्लिश समझता है वो बालक भी पढ़ सके है ना तो मेरे राजा बाबू पढ़ लो यार तो आगे बात करते हैं तो टी एस गेमर ये ऑलरेडी मैं अच्छा आपको बता चुका हूं द मैरथन इज इन प्योर इंग्लिश बिकॉज इंग्लिश का ही चैनल है पीडब्ल्यू इंग्लिश चैनल है बेटा तो इसलिए क्लास भी आपका प्योर इंग्लिश में है दैट इज वाई एम नॉट टीचिंग इन हिंदी हिंदी वाला मैरथन हिंग्लिश हिंदी इंग्लिश वाला जो मैरथन होता है दैट इज ऑन फाउंडेशन चैनल एंड वो बहुत जल्दी आएगा तो हम लोग वहां पे हिंदी इंग्लिश मिक्स वाला पढ़ेंगे ठीक है माय डियर बच्चे ठीक है माय डियर बच्चे सो अगर किसी बच्चे ने न्यू ज्वाइन किया एंड यू आर थिंकिंग दैट सर व्हाई यू आर टीचिंग इन इंग्लिश आप हिंदी क्यों नहीं बोल रहे सो दिस इज अ रीजन माय डियर सिंस इट्स अ प्योर इंग्लिश चैनल प्योर इंग्लिश प्लेटफॉर्म दैट इज व्हाई आई एम टीचिंग इन इंग्लिश ओके आई होप आई आई मेड माय सेल्फ क्लियर ओके लेट्स मूव फर्दर नाउ so let's talk about the revolutionaries now who are the revolutionaries these are the people who want to you know create a sudden change in the society they are someone who try to bring a drastic change like for example if you talk about italy okay so italy was divided into multiple parts now that's very sad right so let's say if someone comes and captures your home and throws you out out, out of your own home now that will be very sad isn't it suppose your neighbor comes and attacks in your home and captures your home and throws you out of your own home it's very difficult right it's very difficult to relate to that isn't it in case of italy the same uh, uh, the same story was there right 
Italy was also divided into multiple parts, seven parts. And all of these parts were being controlled by the different powers. Now, there were many people living, the Italian people, the real Italian people, okay, who wanted to bring about a change, who wanted to again recapture back those Italian parts and unite Italy together. And one such person was Giuseppe Mazzini. You remember the great Bhagat Singh, the Shaheed Bhagat Singh? Okay, we all remember the Shaheed Bhagat Singh. Reason is, at a very young age, Shaheed Bhagat Singh Ji, he sacrificed his life for the sake of the nation. We talk about Raj Guru, we talk about Chandra Shekhar Azad, we talk about Ram Prasad Bismil. So they were the revolutionaries. They wanted to attain the freedom for the country. They wanted to win the independence for India. Isn't it? They sacrificed their life. So same way we had a person called as Gosipi Mazzini. He was born in Genoa in 1807. Okay. And he was a member of a secret society in Carbonari. However, in the early age, he attempted a revolution in Liguria for which he was sent out of Italian states. However, but still, he did not stop his fight and he went on to form two secret societies. Number one was Young Italy in Marseille and second was Young Europe in Bern. Right. So, what are the secret societies? So, basically, these are those organizations, organizations that work against the government. Okay. So, these organizations, they do not work openly. They are hidden. They are very secret, but they work against the government. So, basically, this Mazzini, born in Genoa in 1807, joined a secret society called Carbonari, okay, attempted a revolution for which he was sent into exile. But again, he formed two more underground societies, a secret society is named as Young Italy and Marseille and Young Europe in Bern, right? So, that was his contribution. So, being a revolutionary was very difficult in those times because you were going against the kings and the kings, they was those who were very autocratic in nature. So, that had a heavy cost to pay, isn't it? So, if you were caught, you were punished very severely, right? Okay, so let's move on further guys. So let's move on further. Okay, I have a question for you. I have a question for you. A very, very, very repeated question. Okay, so question is very simple. So Dash was a secret society. Okay. So Dash was a secret society. Set up in... Born by Mazzini. Set up in Born by Mazzini. Done. Four options. Young Italy. Young Europe. Young Canada. Or Young Germany. So we have four options out here guys and let's 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 start doing this okay so 30 seconds we have 30 seconds okay superb superb very nice but see you just have to answer a b c or d so your answer will be counted from the chart itself okay my dear bacho so you have to answer a b c or d and then your answers will be counted from the charts itself very nice very nice but very very nice superb superb Shraddha sure we are coming over to that only. Request you to please uh, pay a little bit attention towards this. So, this is why what I like explained, conservative, right? So, but say conservative itself, regimes means rule, right? So, the kind of uh, rules that were set up in Europe, they were conservative in nature, okay? Uh, that means very simple. They were the rules set up by the kings or in English, you can also call them as monarch, right? So, they were autocratic monarchies. So, these terms autocracy, despotism, right, conservative, they refer to one common ideology, that is where the king has the absolute power, okay, and the king is not ready to accept criticism, the king is not ready to give rights to the common people, and is only, you know, interested in having the complete power with himself, and always bene giving benefits to the people who are in his empire, like in higher positions, like the aristocracies or his ministers, which came in the nobility class or the people of the church. So, this entire setup is called as a conservative rule or a conservative setup. Okay, so all these terms, despotism, despotic rule, autocratic rule, right, all these terms refer to this common ideology. I hope this gets, uh, I hope this clears your doubt. Okay, so the correct answer is young Europe. We just had, uh, had this one. 
prior to this slide. 83 percent have given me the correct answers. Okay, Inba, Adi Pradeep, Sajal, Avinash, Archita, Atharv, Manuma, Deepti Kumari, Sia with us. So, a lot, lot of people here. Okay, so very, very nice. Okay, super. Now, so we talked about the aristocracy, we talked about the revolutionaries. Now, let's move further. Let's move further. Okay, now, it's very simple. Let's talk about a very important, very, very important topic. That is the age of revolutions, 1830 to 1848. So, we have come a lot far in the chapter, guys. We have come a lot far in the chapter. See, this is the European chapter. So, world history again, a little bit, little bit, little bit mixed up. But still, if you pay attention, we will be able to solve this very quickly. Okay. Now, the age of revolutions, 1830 to 1848. Now, this is a very interesting topic. Very, very interesting topic. So, if we talk about this time period, if you have this timeline in history, 1830 to 1848. Now, this was a time period in Europe when the entire Europe was in chaos. Chaos means there was a lot of disturbance in the entire Europe, guys. So, there were revolutions going on. Lot of revolutions. Okay, people were protesting. They were not happy with their rulers. They were not happy with the kings. So, as a result, they started protesting. Now, what happened? Let, let's try to reconnect the events. You know, this, uh, you remember this Austrian Chancellor, uh, Duke Metternich? So, he had a very famous saying. And he said that when France sneezes, the rest of Europe catches cold. Why did he call so? There is a reason behind that. You remember guys, the Treaty of Vienna 1815, the Bourbon dynasty was restored in France. Yeah, so that ruler, that relative of Louis XVI was not efficient at all. So that was a puppet ruler you can say, moreover, right. And he adopted the exact same ways as his ancestors, as the previous rulers. That is having the complete power, not giving rights to the people, not listening to their demands. As a result, the people of France, they were again very much angry. Now, they again started revolutions. They again started protesting against the king. As a result, what happened? In July 1830, the Bourbon king of France was overthrown and again a constitutional monarchy was established. So, people were very much married. People were very much angry because what happened in 1815, again the same history repeated, right? So, this king who was appointed in 1815, he was again not able to listen to the demands of the people. He always tried to suppress them. He always tried to suppress their voices. As a result, finally, the French people got agitated and they started revolting against the king. As a result, this king had to leave his throne and a constitutional monarchy was established in his place and Louis Philip became the new king. Okay, Louis Philip became the new king. Okay, so Louis Philip became the new king. Now, because of this revolution, the people in Belgium, they got inspired. You remember after the Treaty of Vienna, Belgium was given to the United Kingdom of Netherlands. So, the people in Belgium, they got inspired by France. Okay, and then they started their struggle for the freedom. So, as a result, what happened? Belgium broke away from the United Kingdom of Netherlands. Okay, and Belgium became independent. Now, as these ideas were spreading, as these ideas were spreading, this also sparked off a movement in Greece. Now, understand the history of Greece. Greece is very important, guys. Now, Greece is said to be one, one particular region in Europe that has a great history, that has a great culture. Now, if you talk about the time period of 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, Greece is one, one place that was dominated by Christian people earlier. Okay, because Greece used to be a very much part of the Roman Empire at one point of time. And Roman Empire, this was an empire, this was a dynasty that was again ruled by the Christian rulers. Now, when this Byzantine, the Eastern Roman Empire, when its power started getting reduced, there was one and more empire, there was one more dynasty that started to gain power in Europe and that was the Ottoman Empire. Now, many people are confused that what are Ottomans? Who are Ottomans? Right. So, basically I'll tell you, there were few warriors of Islam. Now, Islam, we all know that there is a Muslim religion. People follow Islam. You yeah, know, it's a religion. So, there were few warriors of Islam. They were called as Ghazis. Okay. So, one of these Ghazi, Usman, was very powerful. So, he had a dream to build an empire near what you call as Turkey in the modern times. What you call as Turkey in the modern times. So, he, he had a dream of building an empire around the same. So, this person called Usman, Usman, right? So, the western people, they were not able to pronounce his noun, uh, noun well. So, they were not able to pronounce his name well. Like if you see the Britishers, 
they have transformed many hindi words into their own way so in the same way the western guys they used to call this person as ottoman ottoman so they could not pronounce his name osman well so they called him ottoman right so this guy osman he started the foundation of this ottoman empire nearby the areas of turkey that you called as today okay and this empire started growing in power okay so there was a time when this ottoman empire first defeated the eastern roman empire or the byzantine empire then started capturing different parts of Europe. Okay. So the people living in Greece, they were very much scared. Now they got afraid. They thought that these Ottomans are going to kill them. Because again that religious rivalry, Ottomans were Muslims and Greece people were Christians. So that rivalry existed between the two. So as a result, many Greek scholars, they ran away from Greece to different parts of Europe. And they took along with them a lot of literature, a lot of scientific developments, a lot of scientific text. And this is one of the reasons why we say that Greece, the culture of Europe was developed because of the contribution of the Greeks people. Right. So this is, one of the, this is the reason why we called Greece as the cradle of the European civilization. So we give a lot of credit to the Greek people for the development of the European culture. Right. So these people, they settled in the different parts of Europe, you can say. Okay. So what happened when these nationalist ideas started spreading in the entire Europe? So people who were still left in Greece, they got a hope, they got an inspiration to fight back for the freedom. Now they wanted independence from the Ottoman Empire and as a result, we see that the Greek struggle for independence starts in 1821. Okay, the Greek struggle starts in 1821. Okay, so this Greek struggle for independence starts in 1821. And finally, after the great struggle, achha, there was one more point. The people who were living inside Greece had support from the people living outside Greece. There were many European people who supported Greece. They had a sympathy with them. There were two reasons. Number one, because of the Greek culture. Second, because they were Christians. So all these Christian countries, they had a sympathy with the Greek people and they started supporting them. As a result, Greeks were successful in winning back their freedom from Ottoman Empire and there was a treaty signed in Constantinople. So, Constantinople is modern day Istanbul. Okay, it's a modern day Istanbul. We all have heard about Istanbul. So, earlier it was called as Constantinople. Later it was renamed as Istanbul. So, a treaty was signed in Istanbul or Constantinople in 1832 that made Greece as an independent nation. So, we see that the July revolution in France sparked off a series of events in the entire European continent. The immediate impact can be seen in the case of Netherlands. Then further we can see the same in the case of Greece also. Now how the Greece people, they got a lot of inspired from the revolutions, from the events of France, right? And again they started their, uh, they, this thing struggle for the freedom. Finally they gained their freedom or independence from the Ottoman Empire, right? Now, so let me have a question for you. So there is a very, very, very simple question for you. So let me ask you a question. So all of you guys pay attention here. Okay. So the question is very simple. And it's a very good important PYQ. So which treaty recognized Greece as an independent nation? Okay, which treaty recognized Greece as an independent nation? So, we have four options. Treaty of Vienna. Treaty of Constantinople. Treaty of Purandar. Yeah, Treaty of Berlin. Okay. So, we have four options out here, guys. And here we go. Okay. So, 30 seconds. You have to tell me that which treaty recognized Greece as an independent nation. Very nice. Superb. Okay, done guys.
हार्दिक तिवारी माई डियर बेटा ऑल द नोटिफिकेशन विद रिस्पेक्ट टू एग्जाम एंड रिजल्ट दे आर ऑलरेडी दे आर ऑलवेज अपडेटेड इन योर नोटिस और अनाउंसमेंट सेक्शन सो यू कैन कीप चेकिंग दैट ओके सो इट्स वेरी सिंपल ऑब्वियसली बच्चे आई हैव टेकन योर रिक्वेस्ट बट वंस आई एम डन विद द मैरथन देन ओनली आई बी एबल टू फॉरवर्ड द सेम है ना आई होप यू अंडरस्टैंड माई डियर बिकॉज वाइल स्टार्टिंग इट्स मोर इंपॉर्टेंट टू यू नो टीच द स्टूडेंट्स सो आई टेकन डाउन योर रिक्वेस्ट आई जस्ट फॉरवर्ड द सेम दैट आई कैन डू फ्रॉम माई एंड राइट so or alternatively you can check your announcement sections of the batch or the notice section of the batch right fair enough okay fine but you will get the pdf here itself matlab uh, you can check the description of the video okay so there is always a link for the marathon going on and so we what we do is we create a batch on the platform on the app that is absolutely free of cost so you can download the pdf notes from there okay so that will be helpful for you guys okay so anyone wants anything special you want a sandwich you want a sandwich or you want a what do you say you, do you want something some garam samosas you want some hari chutney lal chutney you want some sandwiches you want some anything special if you do want that please let me know in the uh, chat section okay so i'll arrange for you i have a great samosa shop in which we sell lot of samosas not only in india we have it in uganda also the students who study on the pw platform the foundation channel other platforms they know that actually we had that udan batch na so we created a company called as dk samosa bhandar so this is my friend called dogesh i'll i'll bring him some other session for sure okay so fair here, here we have option number b that is treaty of constantinople okay so option number b is there my dear now 98% are giving me the correct answer that's real games guys at so bachcho at so so ekdam dil se love you so 98% are giving me the correct answer daring priyanka you remind me of that mountain dew slogan dar ke aage jeet hai right anmol athar shyanchi dipanchu rimjim hardik tanmay dear sufyan okay not just sufyan is very cute student right he himself has put the dear in front of his name that's but you are really nice bachche okay so let's let's come further let's come further let's come further okay let's talk about the romantic imagination and the national feeling now the moment the students hear this word romantic ha ah, sir this is the word we all know in english isn't it the moment you see the words are romantic sir sir now what are you going to teach about sir will you teach us the ddlj style sir you will you teach us how srk moves no yaar i am not going to teach you anything like this so don't keep your hopes high that i am going to talk about sharukh khan here or salman khan or i am going to talk about any other person so this romanticism or this romantic feeling is absolutely different not the one that you guys must be thinking okay sir romantic are sir this one i know sir okay so this is not the romantic feeling so basically we are talking about romanticism it's a cultural movement right okay so very simple when will be the marathon come on foundation challenge manish very shortly will be starting with the marathons jo hindi english wala hota hai usko hum log start karenge wahan pe youtube channel pe apna jo foundation wala hai to wo bhi aapka aa raha hai exams aa rahe hain to obviously aate hain marathons aati hain uske aas paas hi aati hain to wo start ho jayengi to abhi aaj english wale bachcho ke liye hum log marathon kar rahe hain so that we can you know just have them something okay so let's talk about this romantic imagination now guys this romantic imagination or romanticism is basically a movement in europe where the artists the painters the writers the song writers they tried to connect people with the help of emotions you know like suppose uh if i want to approach someone you know, let's say if i want to approach someone and if i approach a person very scientifically like let's say let's say ki if i want to uh, you know befriend someone of my class i class i mean someone from um, the class i'm studying so how weird it would sound if i go and just ask that person hi are you interested in mathematics how about solving the sums of trigonometry together in this way we can build a relation with a tan c okay and together we can sit on a cot c and then we can uh, have our sin theta and cos theta and see if we can do tan 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 theta so that will be very weird type of approach isn't it that's not good and if i instead of this type of scientific approach if i approach someone with a more uh, emotional hi uh, do you like to have a cup of coffee or do you like to uh, study together this particular amazing topic so that will sound more amazing isn't it so in the same way what happened here is the writers and the authors they perfectly understood the importance of science and reason but they also proposed something new they said that if you want to connect the people if you want to connect the people if you want to instill a feeling of patriotism in them it's very important to reach out to the people with respect to their culture connect them with emotions connect them with the culture and this is what romanticism talks about 
सो दिस इज वॉट बच्चे रिमांटिसिजम टॉक्स अबाउट हाई एम एन एन सी आई एम आई एन ई सी गेम हाउ आर यू बच्चे ओके सो इट्स अ कल्चरल मूवमेंट दैट ट्राई टू डेवलप अ नेशनलिस्ट सेंटिमेंट अमंग द पीपल ओके इट रिजेक्टेड द ग्लोरिफिकेशन ऑफ साइंस एंड रीजन इट सेट दैट साइंस एंड रीजन इज फाइन लॉजिकल थिंकिंग इज फाइन बट एटलीस्ट यू नीड इमोशंस टू कनेक्ट टू द पीपल इफ यू टॉक अबाउट लाइक जर्मन फिलोसफर जोहान गोटरिफाइड हर्डर सेट दैट इफ यू वॉन्ट टू डिस्कवर द ट्रू जर्मन कल्चर यू हैव टू गो अमंग द पीपल अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट इफ यू सी दैट बच्चो देर आर मेनी मोर पेंटिंग्स बींग मेड दैट डिस्क्राइब द डिफरेंट ह्यूमन एक्सपीरियंसिस If you talk about language, was also one of the important role that connected the people. Let me give an example for this. Uh, now there are many students who love Russia for multiple reasons. Now what happens here is Russia occupied a part of Poland. Okay, so Poland is again a country. So what Russia did? Russia occupied the part of Poland, and it forced the Polish people to speak the Russian language. Okay, now Indians must be very happy. Oh wow, we love Russia. Okay, so the point is very simple. so when russia captured poland what it did was it forced the people of poland to speak the polish language now the people of poland they tried to revolt against russia they tried to you know revolt with respect to military skills against russia but russia was a very strong uh, country a strong kingdom at those times right so it was very difficult to defeat russia in terms of military weapons okay now so the people living in poland they started to use language as a symbol of resistance for example the priest that were there in the churches like we have pandit ji in the temples who does the aarti who does the prayer in the same way we have priest in the church so the priest in the church in poland they started preaching or telling the word of god in which language in the polish language so they were asked to uh, preach the word of god to take the prayers in russian but they refused to use the russian language and they continued preaching the people in the polish language as a result these people were arrested they were sent to siberia in prisons right but still language became a common symbol of defiance against the russian domination so this is how we can say that the culture played an important role in connecting the people and generating that feeling of nationalism among the peoples okay now so so far we studied that europe was a patchwork of kingdoms where people were living but they have no common identity then we studied that there were certain revolutions that started coming up in europe we studied that the middle classes in europe started having certain demands they started asking for multiple rights okay then we gradually studied that this uh, this particular time period 1830 to 48 this was a time period when lot of revolutions started happening it started with france then it impacted the other parts of the europe as well then we also studied that gradually the people were coming to understand that we have to stand united we need to find we need to form states in which people can live happily together the leaders the rulers of those states should be known to the people should be sharing some common history to the people and we also see a kind of romantic revival movement where the people focused on more on culture more on traditions more on emotions rather than on science and logicals theek hai okay so so far this is the case now there comes a time in europe now there comes a time in europe where there was wide spread hunger hardship now what is hunger what i am having right now really i am feeling hungry a lot if someone has anything to offer me please do i would love to have a rice and dal at your home you know that will be the most comfort food i can go for okay we all have our comfort foods na that we like to eat a lot okay so let me talk about this hunger and hardship so there was a time period in europe when the people were suffering a lot reason the food prices were very high there were uh, continuous food shortages people were unemployed they were having no place to live so there were multiple problems that the people in uh, entire european continent were facing so what happened in most countries there were more job seekers than employment so most of the people were unemployed second population from the rural areas in search of better opportunities started migrating towards the cities as a result the cities became very much crowded second the rise of the food prices or maybe whenever there was a bad harvest that led to the food shortages the food was not available for the people right so what happened again the france you must be wondering sir why this france again again it is the france who is coming over to, to our rescue you can say that was coming to revolt so again what happened remember in 1830 in july 1830 a revolution took place in france when they replaced the king okay and the government louis philip became the new king now this guy louis philip was also not able to solve the problems of france 
people were unemployed people did not have uh, food to eat people had food shortages the food prices were very high cities were crowded so people did came out on streets on the paris okay so paris is a city in france so people of paris they were very angry against the government so what happened they came out on streets they started demonstrating they started protesting okay and as a result louis philip the king of those times had to free okay so had to flee had to flee means had to run away the the people were very angry the crowd were very angry because this ruler has also not made any difference to the france so as a result people were very angry they were like i will kill the king now the king had no option but to swipe up his lungi and and just tie it very tightly and run away from france okay so that is what happened and then what happened again france turned into a republic voting was conducted okay and again a national assembly was proclaimed right so we also witness a silesia uh, there was a place called silesia we also witness a revolt there in 1845 where the revolt was against the contractors so basically the weavers who were asked to prepare the cloth okay so they were not paid better wages as a result they started protesting against the contractors who used to give them the work and it turned out so be so violent that at the end 11 weavers were shot dead so these kinds of revolts became very much common if you talk about in the cities of uh, this thing europe right and particularly in france if we talk about because france was one uh, country that was a house of revolutions you can say anything happened in europe straight away a revolution sparked off in france okay so let me ask you one more question here okay let me ask you one more question here and then we'll talk about the revolution of the liberals okay fine assertion Metternich remarked when France is this when France needs this rest of Europe catches cold okay reason events in france sparked of revolutions sparked of revolutions in other parts of europe in other parts of europe have the four options both a and r true r explains a okay both a and r true r does not explain a a is true r is false okay and a is false r is true okay chalo so we have four options out here i'll give you the polls guys and you have to answer me the question okay chalo so we have the polls here and you just need to very nice very nice But the details of the exam you can always remember by practicing. See, the more the revision you do, the more questions you practice, the better you get in terms of the better you get in terms of bacho the recall of the chapter because recall of the chapter is very important, very very important. Okay, so the recall of the chapter is very very important, right, bacho? My dear, this is not recorded. Okay, this is not recorded. आदित्य शर्मा बेटा हिंदी मैराथन नहीं है बच्चे चैनल ही इंग्लिश का है दैट इज द रीजन हम लोग गोल भी इंग्लिश में रहे हैं मैंने बहुत बार बताया है 
सेशन के स्टार्टिंग में भी बताया आपको कि जितने भी हमारे इंग्लिश वाले बच्चे जो हिंदी नहीं समझ पाते उनके लिए मैराथन है ठीक है तो आपके लिए प्रॉपर हिंदी इंग्लिश वाला मैराथन आएगा फाउंडेशन चैनल के ऊपर सो दिस इज फॉर ऑल दो गाइज हू डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड हु डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड वॉट बच्चे हिंदी ठीक है सॉटेड तो आई होप आई एम क्लियर विद दिस बच्चा आई एक्सप्लेन रोमांटिसिज्म ओनली मेटर्निस रिमार्क इन फ्रांस इन दिस रेस्ट ऑफ यूरोप कैच इज कोल्ड इवेंट्स इन फ्रांस पार्ट ऑफ रेवल्यूशन इन अदर पार्ट्स ऑफ यूरोप राइट सो वी सी दैट बोथ आर वेरी मच इंटर रिलेटेड बोथ द स्टेटमेंट्स आर करेक्ट नॉट दिस अ वेरी सिंपल ट्रिक टू सॉल्व ऑल दीज क्वेश्चन नंबर वन चेक फॉर बोथ द स्टेटमेंट्स इफ दे आर करेक्ट यू कैन एलिमिनेट द लास्ट टू ऑप्शन नाउ यू कैन पुट यू नो जस्ट जस्ट पुट अ क्वेश्चन मार्क वाई ओके एंड इफ यू आर गेटिंग द आंसर इन द रीजन देन फर्स्ट ऑप्शन इज करेक्ट If you don't get the second one is correct, okay? So basically, what we see that definitely the events in France they always inspired the people in the other parts of Europe, and that is the reason why Metternich said that when France sneezes, the rest of Europe catches cold. So option number A is absolutely here. Correct, okay? Done, right? So hundred percent people have given me the correct answer. Anmol, Tanmay, Yadav, Harsh, Mishra, Athar, Vaibhav, interesting facts, Julie. Okay, we have Alchita and Aradhya Jain. Okay. so very simple bachcho very recently i have explained you what is romanticism okay so i already told you that romanticism was basically a cultural movement with rejected the scientific ideas and promoted more of emotions and culture it told that if you want to connect to the people or develop the feeling of nationalism you will have to understand the culture of the people right so where there were many people like johann gottfried herder was a german philosopher who said that if you want to discover the true culture then you will have to go among the common people of the germany okay then only you will understand what is the true german culture right so uh, the spirit of the nation can be find among the common people same way in poland we have a very famous music composer called karol kurpinski so he made the national dances okay as the national symbols of defiance against the russian domination right then we also saw the usage of language as a way of resisting against russian domination in the case of poland so these are the multiple cases we already discussed discussed in the topic that is romanticism so if someone has joined just recently but say i've already discussed this topic right and also we discussed the hunger hardship and revolt now let's move further okay now let's come to the part that is 1848 the revolution of the liberals okay so the question straight away here is explain this okay so the question straight away here is explain The 1848 revolution of the liberals. So basically, what was this revolution? Now let's try understanding this. Okay. Now this particular time period, that is 1830 to 1848, was one such time period when there were multiple revolutions going on in the entire Europe. Right. Now what happens here is, बच्चों, there were poor people revolting. There were, uh, you can say, workers revolting. There were some business persons revolting. Now there one more movement started in Europe. and that was organized by the educated middle classes who wanted a national unification of their countries as well as a constitution so they were the these were the two prime demands of these educated middle classes who started a revolution back in 1848 in the respective countries in the respective regions they wanted number one to unite their states and second bring a constitution for them right now so we see that they they wanted a kind of government which has a parliament which has a proper constitution there was a freedom of press and the freedom to form political associations so these were the demands of the men and women of the liberal middle classes in europe right okay so let's take the example of germany so you remember there were 39 there was a group of 39 german speaking states who used to say, speak the german language now if you remember then the middle class people living in these german speaking states they had earlier experienced how smooth it was if there were uniform laws right you remember the economic parts i told you when we are talking about liberal nationalism okay so basically these middle class people living in the german states they thought why not to unify these german speaking regions and make one common country that is germany okay so they wanted to make a one common country that is germany so with this objective on 18th may 1848 members of the different political associations of these german states they voted for an all german national assembly so understand try to understand the concept here what is happening here there are 39 different regions okay which speak german language okay now the people living in these regions they want to unite them and make them a single country 
so for this particular objective what they do is they form a grand parliament okay like we have sansad bhavan in india so they decided to form a grand parliament on the representatives or the members of this parliament will be elected through the votes so finally 831 members were elected and this parliament was called in the church of saint paul in the city of frankfurt in the church of saint paul this parliament was called and hence it was came to be called as the frankfurt parliament okay so basically what happened this parliament started framing a constitution for germany and they want to establish a constitutional monarchy in germany so what they did was they framed a constitution and they offered the crown to the king of prussia now this king he rejected the crown because he was not ready to follow the constitution or accept the constitutional monarchy finally after a lot of you can say that tussle gradually this complete from frankfurt parliament started losing its support because again it was dominated by the rich middle class people the poor people from the middle classes they had no rights the women had no rights so as a result this parliament started losing support and at the end it was thrown out by the combined forces of monarchy or the kings and the big big land owners also called as junkers and finally the dream finally the dream to establish an all german state or the all german nation was completely demolished right however after this if you see that there were changes in these autocratic systems also like many of the rulers they understood that if you want to you know rule over a long period of time then you will have to give certain freedom to the people so we see that ki the type of you know the rule in these monarchies they start changing but still we can say that there was a lot more to go in europe okay fine so frankfurt parliament was convened in the church of saint paul okay with this let's come to the uh, second last topic that is the making of germany and italy we'll talk about the female allegories we'll also talk about the strange case of britain and then we'll talk about the balkan regions which also is the final uh, topic for your chapter nationalism in europe okay now so we started around 140 it's lagbhag lagbhag uh, almost 2 hours this chapter is little bit lengthy after that we don't have that much lengthy like we don't that much lengthy content so it will like uh, go with a good pace okay let's talk about germany so this is also called as unification of germany the five marker questions okay unification of germany and italy now let's try understanding how was germany unified so the prussian chief minister otto von bismarck is called to be the architect of the german unification now this he was a smart guy what he did was number one he modernized his army because he knew that if you want to unify germany you will have to fight battles with powerful forces like austria okay like russia so you have to modernize your army so what what kever did what this sorry what bismarck did number one he modernized his army prussian army and also with the help of bureaucracy or the diplomatic relations what he did he took on the leadership of unifying the german states now there were three wars that were fought over the span of seven years okay so three wars were fought over a time period of 7 years with denmark okay with denmark austria and france in which prussia turned out to be victorious and all the german states were united and finally kaiser william 1 of prussia became the uh, the emperor of the modern german country okay now if you see that the modern german state that was found okay the nation state of germany that was found right that focused now on currency banking system improving the legal arrangements and also making a more dynamic nation right so this is basically the unification of germany okay in very simple terms so three wars over seven years with denmark austria and france prussia became turned out victorious and with the help of diplomatic relations it was able to the bismarck was able to unify the german states now let's talk about italy italy also has an interesting history So if we talk about Italy Italy was divided into seven parts out of which there was only one part called Sardinia Piedmont that came under the control of an Italian prince rest all the parts were under the control of different powers like the northern Italy was controlled by Austria the central Italian states were controlled by pope pope was the supreme head of the christianity and the southern Italian states were controlled by the bourbon dynasty of Spain So basically we see that only there is one state that is controlled by an Italian person. Obviously when Britishers were controlling India we were fighting against the British. The reason is we don't want British in our country. We want an Indian person to rule our country. In the same way the Italians will also want someone Italian to rule their country. The first task is to unite the different parts that have now been segregated. Okay. Now what happens here is 
इटली वॉज डिवाइडेड इन टू सेवन स्टेट आउट ऑफ विच ओनली सार्दीनिया पियडमोट वॉज रूल बाई एन इटालियन प्रिंस नाउ वट हैपन इनिशियली Giuseppe Mazzini, the revolutionary, tried to unify Italy, but he failed. So this task came upon the chief minister Kever to lead the movement of what, but the unification of Italy. So with the help of Giuseppe Garibaldi, another revolutionary, Kever was able to Kever was able to unite the different Italian states. Now there is a timeline for this. Number one, this guy called Kever, the prime minister Kever. Number one, what he did? First, he made an alliance with France. to fight against austria because he knew that austria will one or the other day fight with respect to the states so he made an alliance with france he fought against austria austria got defeated and the northern italian states were now under the control of sardinia piedmont seeing this the central italian states also voted in favor of joining sardinia piedmont so north and central italy is now captured okay now the task is uh, capturing the southern italy so what happens when garibaldi garibaldi is another revolutionary when he comes to know that these many parts have been successfully captured by sardinia he leads his army of volunteer called the red shirts towards the southern part of italy he has a great fight with the spanish armies there but finally garibaldi turns out to be victorious and that part is also now merged with the other italian states and this completes the unification of italy and king victor emmanuel the second becomes the ruler of the united italy okay so i hope this is clear so in 1861 the victor emmanuel second becomes the king of the united italy now we have the third unification called as the strange case of britain now why this is called strange i'll tell you the reason because they, there isn't any fight here there isn't any big revolution here to unify british states now let's try understanding what were british states all about so there was no complete country prior to formation of britain there were different islands okay one is britishers one is scottish people one is ireland other one is wales so there were different islands right now out of these the english people the guys who spoke english they had their own culture so these people were the most powerful now they decided to form a united kingdom by combining all these small states right so what happened in 1688 number 1 england was established as a nation state okay so the english parliament it took the power from the monarchy and it went on to create a great kingdom called as a united kingdom okay so what first was done first they signed an act with scotland called as the act of union in 1707 and that led to the formation of the united kingdom of great britain now the problem here was scotland was forcefully made to join this united kingdom the first scottish ministers were not even able to speak their local language that is the gaelic language they were not allowed to wear their national dress in the english parliament also they were not allowed to speak or participate in any kind of decision making matters now let's talk about ireland in the case of ireland the problem was little bit more dark reason is if we talk about ireland ireland was divided into two different nation groups that is protestant and catholics if you talk about britishers britishers followed protestant group they were christians but they belong to the protestant group in ireland also there was a division between catholics and protestants so definitely britishers are going to side with the protestants only they are going to support the protestants only and britishers were powerful so britishers started what supporting the protestant people of ireland and asked them to dominate over the catholics and make them to join the kingdom of great britain and this is what happened finally in 1801 ireland got defeated and again joined the kingdom of great britain so finally a new british nation was found okay with the english culture being promoted english language being promoted thereby subsiding all the other cultures that they have captured okay so this basically led to the formation of the great britain okay one done chalo so i have a question for you again let me have a question for you so who among the following who among the following was also called bismarck of italy who among the following was also called the bismarck of italy done you have four option guys otto von bismarck now it's a good question all in all many people they mistake it okay count kever 
ड्यूक मेटर्नेट्स और ड्यूक एंटोनियो ओके सो वी हैव फोर ऑप्शन है ओके आन योर टाइम स्टार्ट नाउ सो हु अमंग द फॉलोइंग वॉज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड बिस्मार्क ऑफ इटली ऑटोमॉन बिस्मार्क काउंट केवल ड्यूक मेटर्नेट्स ड्यूक एंटोनियो very nice guys very very nice superb superb bacha padi superb guys superb amazing 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 superb done done so correct answer is correct answer is option number b yeah so the question is who among the following was also called bismarck of italy Bismarck is the guy who helped in the unification of German states, and here we are talking about Italy. So we remember that Count Kever is the guy who was the person responsible behind unification of Italy. Okay, so option number B stands clear here. Okay, so we have sixty-one person answering in favor of question number B. So Atharva, okay, this is Bro, Anmol, Shrianshi, Renuka, Manuna, Jadu, Ka, Ogi, okay, Sajal. Daring, Priyanka, FM Raj, Gamers, Diksha, Deepthi, lots and lots of people out here. Okay, superb guys. So you have done super amazing. Okay, okay, okay. So with this, we are coming almost, almost to the end of the chapter, guys. And here we go. Okay, so let's talk about female allegories. Okay, so we talk about female allegories. the artists of the european times what they started doing was they started personifying countries as female figures highlighting the features of the country right for example if you talk about marine she was the female allegory of france right the question is asked at times this part comes in one markers that which was the female allegory of france so the current answer is marine so statues of marine can be seen at the different uh, you can say that uh, places in France, you know. So basically, this was a symbol to represent the country or the different ideals. Okay, the different ideas of the revolutionaries and the nationalist people. Same way, if we talk about Germany, so Germany represented the German nation. Okay, Germany represented the German nation, right? It stood for the heroism of the German nation. It stood for the causes of the German nation, the ideals of the German nation. In the same way, this is something that is not, uh, you know, at times students miss this out. So basically, we talk about Britain. we had a female allegory of britain as well and this was called as britannia right so you must be uh, wondering sir britannia as a bread sir it's a bread brand sir it's a biscuit brand sir no my dear so britain here is the female allegory of okay sorry britain's female allegory is britannia so what are these female allegories basically these are imaginary female characters whom the artists and the philosophers they personified in order to relate them to the nation okay so whenever they had to relate so when we talk about bharat mata earlier when we were fighting against the british we had no common causes right we did not know why we are fighting so we did not have anyone to identify with so there we see that when the image of bharat mata was created people were very much connected to it right so when we try to you know when you relate to a human being when you have something to see you relate with that concept better and this is why you can see that the artist and the philosophers and all they started creating such kind of images so that people can relate to them right so these are called the female allegories so for france we have marine for germany we have germany and for britain we have britannia okay now <coughs> sorry guys <coughs> so let's come to the last topic that is <coughs> the balkan regions okay So let's come to the last topic that is the Balkan regions. Now you must be seeing these Balkan mountain ranges here. Okay, so the region that composed of these areas that is Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Slovenia, Serbia, Kosovo, Albania, Macedonia, Greece. Okay, so basically this particular region was called as the Balkans. This region was called as the Balkans and Romania as well. Okay. so these regions were called as the balkans reason is number one geographical location because of the balkan mountain ranges it's a resource rich area now the problem with this region was most of the people living 
in this area were Christians. They belonged to Christianity. And the empire which dominated this region was the Ottoman Empire. So, Ottoman Empire was one empire that was dominated by the Muslim rulers or the Islamic rulers. And most of the people who lived in these regions were Christians. So, number one, there was religious rivalry. Okay, so number one, there was religious rivalry. Second, when the ideas of nationalism started spreading in this region, okay, there is one more interesting point to be noted. Does the people living in these states were called as Slavs? What do we call them? We call them as Slavs, okay? So, Slav nationalities or Slavs. So, what happened? When nationalist feelings started spreading in these regions, people got very much inspired. They said that we need complete freedom from the Ottoman Empire. So, what happened? Revolutions started in different parts. Okay. So, these different parts, the revolution started. Okay. And all of them, they tried to move away from the Ottoman Empire. Okay. So, everything was fine. There was no problem with this. Everything was fine. Okay. So, what we saw? The Balkans comprised of Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Croatia, Bosnia. Okay. Now, the problem is that Balkan was a region of geographic variation. Plus, the people who lived there had a different culture. Most of them were Christians and the poor part was this was under the Ottoman Empire which was a Muslim Empire. So because of the spread of the nationalist ideas what happened people got inspired to fight for their freedom. They said that we have once been very much independent and it is the western powers who have now dominated over us. So we want independence from the Ottoman Empire. Okay. So everything was okay. Everything was fine. But there was one more problem. Number one, they wanted independence from the Ottoman Empire, but also they were jealous of each other. They wanted to capture the territories of each other. And this is what made this region very much explosive. So the struggle for independence is okay. But the problem is not this. The problem is they were jealous of each other. They wanted to be independent. Also, they wanted to capture each other's resources. And this is what made it very much explosive. Right? Now, so, when big European powers, they entered the scene, like Russia, like uh, Britain, like France, like Austria, like Germany, when these big European powers, they entered into this scene, they entered in the support of these states, this movement became all the more violent. Because definitely these big European powers, they wanted to gain resources. They were very clear that they will support these smaller states and once they become independent, indirectly they will try to access these resources. So, for the big European powers, it was more of a profit game. Okay, for these small states, it was more of a game of jealousy or independence. Right. And all this mixed together make this region very much explosive. As a result, we see that in 1912 and 1913, wars broke out in this particular region. Okay, violence broke out in this particular region, also called as the Balkan Wars. And ultimately, we see that in 1914, this all resulted in the First World War. So, this is basically the nationalism and imperialism topic, all the Balkans topic. Okay, I hope this is clear guys. I hope this is clear my dear bacho. Okay, so what we see that ki Balkan is a region surrounded by the Balkan mountain ranges. Apart from that, there are many states that are very much different in their culture, in their geography and they all are being now dominated by the Ottoman Empire. Plus, the religion differences, most of them are Christians and Ottoman Empire rulers are Muslims. So, again, there is a religious difference. So, these uh, entire states, these, uh, these Ottoman states or these Balkan states, number one, they wanted to become independent from Ottoman Empire. So, they started revolutions. Second, they were jealous of each other also. They wanted to capture each other's resources and that is what made the region explosive. So, when big European powers, they joined the scene, it became all the more explosive, ultimately leading to the First World War in 1914. So, this is how the Balkan regions ends. So, this question is very much important. You can write these pointers in your answer for 5 markers. Okay? So, this topic is very, very important for the 5 markers. So, please make it a point that you solve these questions. Done? You solve these concepts. Done? Okay. So, no doubt here, this chapter took a lot of time. Okay. And this chapter was very much important also. We had to do this chapter. Okay. So, uh, okay, so fair enough. Now, let me have a poll here. Let me have a poll here. Okay, so let me have a poll here. The people living in, the people living in Balkan regions,
in Balkan regions were also known as okay were also known as dash nationalities also known as dash nationalities i'll have four options for you a b and c and d slavs slaves gustav or none of these so we have four options guys here we have four options and here we go so i'll give you the option 30 seconds here and here we go so the people living in the balkan regions were also known as dash nationalities okay very very simple very very simple guys okay very nice but very very nice very very nice superb bacha buddy superb you are doing super amazing you are doing super super amazing super amazing guys wow I love you too, bhai, Minak Gamer. Okay. 1 kilo piyaz, 2 kilo alu, 5 rupay ka saag. Hi, Anshika, how are you? Okay, very nice. Bita, Hindi ka marathon nahi hai, hai na? So, bhoat simple hai ki Hindi ka marathon nahi hai. And it's a pure English channel. Me, meinne bhoat baar bataya hai session mein. Ki aapka Hindi plus English wala marathon kaha pe hooga? आपके फाउंडेशन चैनल्स के ऊपर ये उन बच्चों के लिए मैराथन है जो हमारे प्यारे प्यारे बच्चे हिंदी नहीं समझ पाते सो फॉर देम वी आर डूइंग अ मैराथन इन कंप्लीट इंग्लिश ओके माय डियर बच्चा वाडी आई होप इट्स क्लियर माय डियर बच्चा देखो हर एक बच्चा इंपॉर्टेंट है यार एवरी स्टूडेंट इज इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर मी सो करेक्ट आंसर इज ऑप्शन नंबर ए दैट इज स्लैब्स ओके सो ऑप्शन नंबर इज एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट दैट इज स्लैब्स 96.23% बच्चों ने कहा है बिल्कुल सही ओके ओके डन Sunir Bhai, Priya, Manua, Daring, Priyanka, Rohit, we have Gautam, Gojo, Athar, Shriyanshi, Kritika, Shraddha, Strom, Stark, Tony Stark, okay, all the Starks in the house, okay. So, Bache, this ends your topic that is nationalism in Europe. Now, nationalism in India is here very much easier to go with because it's a story that we have heard multiple times, okay. Yes. Sir, PYQ repeat hote hain. Yes, bache, PYQs are repeated. So, definitely PYQs are important. Okay. So, motivation AI, beta again, I am repeating my words that it's a pure English channel. Hai na? To pure English mein Hindi bologe to saman nahi aaga na bache. To pure English channel mein apan English mein hi padh rahe That is why this marathon is for all the English speaking students. Okay. And for Hindi wale bache hamare, hai na? Hindi English wale bache, we have the marathons on foundation channel. ओके सो वहां पे आप मैराथन सम करेंगे तो वहां पे आप हिंदी इंग्लिश में पढ़ सकते हो राइट ओके ओके डन सो लेट्स अच्छा हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू वांट ब्रेक हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू वांट ब्रेक सर ब्रेक चाहिए ओके एनी वन हु वांट्स ब्रेक एनी वन हु वांट्स ब्रेक किसको ब्रेक चाहिए फाइव मिनट ब्रेक्स फाइव मिनट ब्रेक फाइव मिनट ब्रेक्स ओके फाइव मिनट पांच से छह मिनट का ब्रेक ठीक है बच्चे श्योर यू कैन गेट इफ यू प्रैक्टिस क्वेश्चन इफ यू प्रैक्टिस लिसन टू एवरीथिंग केयरफुली अभी हिंदी इंग्लिश वाला मैराथन आएगा देर ओके नहीं ऑल्सो टू आवर्स ओके 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 टेन मिनट्स नहीं 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 यस भाई टू आवर्स का हा 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 टू आवर्स का ब्रेक तो नहीं मिलेगा फाइव मिनट्स ब्रेक लेते हैं एंड देन लेट्स कंटिन्यू ठीक है सो लेट्स गेट फाइव मिनट्स ब्रेक पांच मिनट ब्रेक लेते हैं एंड देन लेट्स कंटिन्यू ओके तो लेट्स टेक फाइव मिनट्स ब्रेक फाइव मिनट्स का ब्रेक लेते हैं फाइव मिनट्स ब्रेक लेते हैं बच्चों एंड देन लेट्स कंटिन्यू ठीक है तब तक मैं बैटरी शैटरी भी चेंज कर लूंगा यहां पर एंड लेट्स गेट स्टार्ट लेट्स टेक अ फाइव मिनट्स ब्रेक पानी वानी पी लो कुछ खाना वाना है खा लो एंड देन लेट्स कंटिन्यू ठीक है चल
हाय सो लेट्स रिटर्न बैक गाइस आ जाओ वापस चलो सो एम आई ऑडिबल एम आई ऑडिबल आवाज आ रही है एम आई ऑडिबल सुनाई दे रहा हूं मैं आपको आई होप एम ऑडिबल गाइस आई होप एम ऑडिबल बच्चों बेटा टीवी फाइव ऑफिशियल इट्स वेरी ओके यू डोंट लाइक द सब्जेक्ट चलता है भाई मेरे को पसंद नहीं था स्कूल में गेटिंग अ नाइनटी फाइव फ्रॉम अ वन शॉट मैराथन बेटा देखो मैं आपको झूठ नहीं बोलूंगा इट्स वेरी सिंपल मैराथन आर फॉर द लास्ट मोमेंट स्टडिंग रिविजन बच्चे यू कैन वॉच द मैराथन यू विल गेट द मार्क्स नो डाउट अबाउट दैट बट फॉर नाइनटी फाइव टू अचीव समथिंग गुड यू नीड गुड वर्क यू नीड टू वर्क हार्ड Without practicing the questions, without uh, solving anything, just reading, just attending, but a one marathon just before the day, that is also not going to help. You will get the marks, but getting ninety five needs a little bit more of hard work. Shortcuts are never going to take you anywhere in life, my dear. Okay, so if you want to achieve something, you'll have to put in the hard work. So what if I say that? No, no, boy, you do this marathon, you'll get ninety five. Definitely, you'll get good marks. You'll get marks, but for reaching ninety five, you need that extra effort, right? so this is a reality this is a truth that i'm going, i'm telling you here so for achieving 95 we haven't studied the entire year you just watch one marathon just before one day before the exam definite it's very simple but you cannot recall everything if you haven't studied throughout the year theek hai aapne pure saal hi nahi padha hai aur aap socho ek din pehle main pad lu aur main top mar raha hu bachche aisa nahi hota movies mein hota hai reality mein nahi hota reality mein matlab bahut mushkil hai bhai theek hai so 95 96 97 lane ke liye you have to work hard थ्रू आउट द ईयर बेटा शॉर्टकट से अगर किए हैं तो फिर ऐसे कैसे काम चलेगा राइट सो यू नीड टू वर्क हार्ड यू नीड टू सॉल्व क्वेश्चन प्रैक्टिस क्वेश्चन स्टिल देर आर डेज इफ यू आस्क मी सर कैन आई ब्रिंग नाइनटी फाइव इन वन वीक आई से येस यू कैन ब्रिंग येस यू कैन ब्रिंग इफ यू वॉन्ट टू ब्रिंग नाइनटी फाइव इन वन वीक ओके बट फॉर दैट यू हैव टू वर्क हार्ड इफ यू वर्क हार्ड इफ यू रेडी टू प्रैक्टिस क्वेश्चन वॉच द वीडियोज है ना देन पुट इन एफर्ट्स डेफिनेटली बेटा यू कैन गेट नाइनटी फाइव है ना सो आई होप इट्स वेरी क्लियर ओके लेट्स रिटर्न बैक begin with another chapter that is okay okay fine 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 very nice bachche try to find out where you are losing marks it's very simple you might be working very hard and you might not be getting your desired percentages try to find out where you make mistakes try to find out what are your weak pointers start working upon them okay if you have scored 70% in pre board definitely you can get 90% and above in your board examinations pre board papers are generally you can say that designed a little bit on a harder note okay so definitely the board papers are exactly not the pre board ones so definitely board papers are a little bit different so if you are scoring 70% 75% in your pre board examinations definitely you can score above 90% in the board examinations just make sure to not mitigate uh, repeat the mistakes you have done in your previous exams work on your weaker pointers and definitely keep on revising you can absolutely score above 90% okay now let's get back to the chapter nationalism in india okay now bachche the complete map work i'll be covering towards the last of the marathons when we're doing the final uh, thing okay so when we'll be ending up this marathon then i'll be covering the entire map work from both history and geography okay so let's start with the chapter that is nationalism in india it's a very easy chapter guys very very easy and very very scoring chapter i must say right number 1 it is related to our country second the terms are very familiar the story is very familiar okay so we talk about <coughs> if we talk about the nationalism in case of india it is very much related to the anti colonial movement so if you remember guys we all know that uh, during the time of 17th and 18th century the foreign powers the british the french the portuguese the dutch they had already entered the different asian and african continents and since we know that the asian and african countries were comparatively far behind in terms of technology or development when compared to these european powers hence we suffered a lot right Britishers were able to capture India because of two reasons. Number one, the lack of unity among the Indians, and second is the advanced technology and power that the Britishers had. So basically, wherever these foreign powers, wherever these European powers, wherever which ever countries they captured, the people of these countries suffered similarly. 
Like if you talk about in Indians, they called Indians as dogs. They used to say that Indians and dogs not allowed. There were, uh, there were many, many things. Like recently, I'll talk about uh, two or three days back on Tuesday. I visited this one uh, restaurant known as, there's, an, there's a chain of coffee known as India Coffee House, right? So if we go to this particular outlet called as India Coffee House, all over India, it, has, uh, it is there at many places. Even today, their vibes are very much vintage and colonial. So this India Coffee House was one place where the Indians were not allowed. How ironic is this? Isn't it? So this was one place where during the time of the British years, Indians itself were not allowed. However, today you can go there. It's a very price friendly, pocket friendly place. You can have some good coffee. You can have enjoy some snacks and all. Okay, so just imagine it was a place where Indian themselves were not allowed. So this shows the kind of oppression the people faced under these European powers. And this is what made them hostile against these European powers. And this is what connected the people against and united the people against these British forces or the other European powers, right? Now, so people, they discovered the unity in their struggle against the colonialism. So colonialism is basically a process where a particular country captures over other countries and forms and establishes its government there. Okay, so that is basically a colonialism process. Okay, now let's move further. Okay, so there is a question that comes straight away that the first world war created a new economic and political situation in India. Now, why is it said so? Let's try understanding that. Okay, so in the years after 1919, we see that the national movement started spreading to the different parts of the country. So, the first world war that was fought between 1914 and 1919 that created an altogether new and political situation in India. So, India faced a lot of problems during the war period. Number one, so, uh, increase in the defense expenditure. Since Britishers were fighting a war since a long period of time, ever since the world war began. So, definitely they will need a lot of money to run the expenditure of the war. Definitely, Sibata, you need a lot of ammunitions, you need a lot of arms and weapons, you need to, uh, you know, supply the soldiers with different things. For everything, you need money. So, Britain was basically fighting this war on loans. Okay, and apart from that, apart from that, Britain used to get its money from the taxes that it used to take from India and the other colonies, right? So, basically what happened, India faced certain problems, number one, increase in the defense expenditure, second, increase in the income taxes, okay? So, the Britishers, in order to extract the money, they introduced the tax on income called as income tax. Also, apart from that, what did the Britishers do? They increased the customs duty or the customs taxes, then prices of the common commodities, the common goods, the food and everything, it started increasing in India. Right, so common people was not able to afford that. Apart from that, in the rural area, especially from the villages, these Britishers used to recruit the soldiers forcefully. Like, let's say you are uh, walking around in your village comfortably and all of a sudden the Britishers come and they take you away and all at the next moment you are in the battlefield holding a gun. How weird and absurd would that be? Isn't it? It's very normal. So people were forcefully recruited in the armies without their will and against their will, you can say that, so, that, that created the anger among the people. During 1918 and 19 and 1920 and 21, crops failed in different parts of India. Since there was shortage of food, the food prices became very high. Added to this, there was an influenza epidemic that spread in the different parts of the country. So, if you see, if you have a look at the census of 1921, around about 12 to 13 million people died in the country. And all these hardships that the people were facing made them all to go all the more hostile towards the Britishers, right? And this is what made the Indian people commonly unite against the Britishers. They might have their own demands, they might have their own needs and wishes, but they were very much against the common enemy that is the British. Right now. So, at this moment of turmoil, we see that Gandhi returned back to India. Okay, we see that the Gandhi returned back to India. Now, Gandhi, we know that uh, was a leader, there was a political leader who was very famous in South Africa for fighting against the apartheid rule there. Because what happened, the government in South Africa, it discriminated the people on the basis of skin color. That means the black people were not allowed any rights. They were not even to board the common transportation. You must remember that incident. You remember that once Gandhi was traveling in a first class in South Africa and he was just thrown out of the train because his color was dark. He was a brown munda. That's the reason, Bache, because he was thrown out of the train. So, uh, just for the pun. So, basically what happened here. So, Gandhi, we all know that for, used the novel method of Satyagraha and fought against the South African government, right? Now, it's very, very simple, Bache. Now, okay, so it's very, very simple. So, what do we understand? So, Satyagraha was a novel method of fighting. 
सो बेसिकली इट वॉज अ नॉन अग्रेसिव मेथड सत्याग्रह से डाट इफ समन हिट्स यू लाइट ऑन दिस चीक यू शुड ऑल्सो शो द अदर चीक अराउंड and you should call the person come on fulfill your satisfaction okay come on hit me on the other cheek as well right so basically satyagraha believed in non violence you have to request to the oppressor the guy who is oppressing you torturing you there will be a limit to everything right there will be extent of everything so you have to request to the soul of the oppressor you have to ask him to you know listen to your needs and the time will come when the a uh, person will understand so satyagraha is more of a non violent approach however it is not passive resistance it's an active resistance it insisted on truth it's a moral force okay so gandhi returned back to india in january 1915 okay so when gandhi returned back he first tried to understand the politics of india because politics of india was moving at a very dynamic pace you know so basically gandhi organized three satyagraha movements in its initial phase one was in champaran the other was in kheda district and the ahmedabad so champaran movement was in 1917 kheda in 1918 and again the ahmedabad strike in 1918 now there is a uh, mistake with respect to the kheda movements dated ncrt in ncrt it's giving 1917 but that's not correct champaran took place in 1917 kheda in 1918 ahmedabad in 1918 now let's try to understand what these movements were all about see so basically what happened in champaran it's a place in bihar so all everyone anyone joining from bihar give me a thumbs up so it's a place in bihar it's a district champaran is a place in bihar so what happened here there was a plantation system indigo plantation system now indigo is a crop from which we prepare a blue color dye a blue color which is used to further color the clothes okay now this indigo had a huge demand in the international market and the britishers were smart so they used to get this indigo planted in indian farms in champaran and the system what's called as teen kathiya system that means uh, on the three parts of land a farmer will have to grow indigo okay the problem is these european planters they used to buy the indigo from the farmers at a very low cost and used to sell it at a very high cost in the international market making huge profits but what happened germany it invented an artificial color which was much cheaper and affordable as compared to indigo so as a result in the international market the demand for indigo fell now when the demand fell the european planters started facing losses now how to recover these losses so they started forcing the indian farmers to pay more revenue to pour more to pay more rent okay and this was the major cause of the farmers in champaran okay for the trouble so basically there was a farmer called rajkumar shukla he approached gandhi and requested him to visit champaran and do a satyagraha in support of the indigo plantation farmers Gandhi went to Champaran Gandhi understood the entire situation okay so and finally he started a satyagraha that ultimately ended in the favor of the indigo planters and this teen kathiya system was finally abolished okay so that was one of the prior victories of Gandhi in India let's talk about kheda and uh, this thing Ahmedabad so in kheda what happened due to adverse climatic conditions the crops failed in different parts of gujarat okay so there was a crop failure okay so as a result the farmers were not able to pay the high rents as demanded by the british government so they wanted that these rents should be remitted off for the particular season and since britishers were not allow, ready to you know just remit the rent remit matlab rent maaf karna right to remit the rent so as a result they requested gandhi and finally gandhi you uh, know along with the local leaders started a satyagraha it finally ended in the favor of the farmers and the rent was remitted off now if we talk about the ahmedabad cotton mill strike now what is this ahmedabad mill strike so basically what happened in the region of gujarat there was a disease called plague spread by the rats okay and the mouse so that was uh, very much in prevalence okay so what happened here so during the time of plague when this epidemic was um, uh, entirely affecting the entire gujarat state so the mill owners we know that ahmedabad is known for the cotton textiles you know so the mill owners in order to attract the workers they announced a bonus they said that if you come for work we'll give you extra money okay so once this plague subsided they took back the bonus now since they were already warriors and the prices of the commodities were very high in the markets so these farmers they, sorry these workers they started demanding a hike and increase in their daily wages so they said that increase our daily wages by 50% then only we will come to work now this was very much obviously the cotton mill owners were not ready to stake this much amount so they said that we will increase your wages only by 20% so since there were no conclusive grounds so ultimately what happened ultimately what happened these uh, these workers they went on strike now to solve this issue gandhi was called 
So Gandhi understood the issue. Gandhi again, he himself went on strike. Finally, the result was that the wages were increased by 35% for the workers. So these were three successful movements, three successful movements that Gandhi organized in the initial phases of the Indian national movement, his contribution in India. Now, let's move further. Let's talk about the Rowlett Act. Okay, so what happened here, Bacho? The nationalist activities were uh, continuously increasing in the India, right? Now, the British government was very much disturbed and very much afraid out of, uh, because of these nationalist activities. So, what was happened? There was a there was a committee formed, okay? It was called a sedition committee. So, the task of this community was to suggest what can be done to control these nationalist activities, okay? And the person who was heading this committee was Justice Sidney Rowlett. So, this committee was also called as the Rowlett Commission. Now, they suggested few reforms which were ultimately implemented in the form of Rowlett Act. So, this act was passed by the Imperial Legislative Council despite the opposition of the Indian members and this act gave enormous powers to the police to arrest anyone protesting against the Britishers and put them behind the prison or put them in jail for an, a period of two years, right? Now, the worst part about this act was once you are arrested by the police, you cannot approach any court to file your case. You cannot be presented before the magistrate or the judge. You cannot hire a lawyer for yourself. Neither you can appeal anywhere for your case. So that is why it is also called as the Black Act or popularly called as the No Appeal, No Vakil or No Dalil. So this was called as the Rowlett Act of 1919. Now the point is, Gandhi decided to launch a Rowlett Satyagraha that will begin with the that will begin with the Hartal on 6th of April. Okay, so Raul, Gandhi decided to launch a Satyagraha against this particular act, also called as the Rowlett Satyagraha. Okay, so that used to be, that was supposed to begin with the Hartal. Hartal is a strike on 6th of April. So we see that rallies were organized in the different parts of the country. People became violent also. They started clashing with the police. Now, Britishers were very much disturbed. Britishers were very much afraid. They were scared that the lines of communication like the railways, like the telegraph services, they might be affected, right? So, they decided to use physical force upon the protesters and they ordered the police to beat the protesters with lati or whatever, uh, uh, you know, weapon they would find suitable, right? So, what happened, Bacho? Around Punjab, the conditions were very much serious. Around Punjab, the conditions were very much serious. And the local leaders of Punjab were picked up by the British police and taken to an unknown place. So, the followers of the leaders, they were very much angry. Now, they started protesting against the Britishers. Okay, so you remember that word dire? So, basically, there are two dires in the scene. Let me uh, clear this for you. So, what happened here is, the governor of Punjab in those times was Sir Michael Francis O. Doyer. Okay, so the lieutenant governor of Punjab in those times, were Sir Michael Francis O. Doyer, D W Y E R. So he imposed martial law in the area. Now, according to the martial law, four or more than four people were not allowed to gather at a particular place. That means definitely you cannot protest, you cannot take out processions. So that was the idea behind the martial law. And the command to maintain peace and order was given to Brigadier General Reginald Edward Harry Dyer. So popularly called as General Dyer. Right, so he was given the command to maintain the peace and order. Now, what this guy did was very much brutal. Let me tell you what he did. So, on 13th April of 1919, Jalayawala Bagh. Jalayawala Bagh, it's like a ground. It's a community ground, a public ground where the people had gathered. So, if you had ever visited the Golden Temple or Sri Harmandir Sahab Gurdwara, you must have come across this Jalayawala Bagh in the complex of the Gurdwara itself. It's a, it's a, it's a ground, it's an open ground which used to have only single entry and exit. That means you have only one point through which you can go into the bag or the ground and you can come out of that, right? So this general Dyer along with his soldiers, he went to that Jalayawala Bagh. He blocked the entry and exit and start, uh, ordered his soldiers to open fire upon the people. Some people had come from outside Punjab. They were unaware about the martial law. Some were celebrating the Baisakhi festival. Some were half gathered to protest against the Britishers. So what we see here, guys, as a new... So general Dyer, he opened fire upon the peaceful crowd. And as a result, people died in the thousands, right? So as the news spread, violent, you know, violent attacks started, you know, people started clashing with the police. They started attacking the government buildings. The Britishers also responded back using the physical force. The Satyagrahis were captured. They were forced to make, uh, you know, rub their nose, or nose on the ground. The villages around Punjab were bombed. Can you imagine that? So the people were the worst who suffered a lot. 
And now you must be thinking, what did the national leaders do? I'll give an example. Gandhi returned by his Kaisare Hind title. The few more leaders who criticized did a Kali Ninda, but could not do much about it, right? So, you see that Gandhi called up the Rowlet Satyagre as the violent star, violence started spreading. So, Gandhi was again against non-violence. Uh, he was against the violence. He supported non-violence. Since Rowlet Satyagre got very much violent, especially after the Jalayawala Bagh, so Gandhi decided to call up this Rowlet Satyagre. Now, Gandhi believed that if you want to like uh, protest against the British, it's very important you have to come together, you have to bring together Hindus and Muslims, right? So, if you can bring together Hindus and Muslims, you will be able to perform a much wider and a much stronger event against the British. Now, if you uh, analyze the results of the World War I, we see that Ottoman Turkey, Ottoman Turkey, which was fighting against the British, they lost the war. Now, it is interesting to note that the Sultan or the ruler of this Ottoman Turkey was called as Khalifa. Now, this Khalifa was not only the ruler of Turkey, but also the spiritual guru or the spiritual head of Islam, the people who follow the Islam religion, the Muslims. And after the defeat of the Turkey, Britishers were imposing a treaty on this ruler, uh, okay, taking away all his powers. Now, this enraged the Muslims throughout the world and movements in support of that Khalifa started throughout the world including India and these movements were called as the Khilafat movement. Organized in India by Shaukat Ali Muhammad Ali, right, a Khilafat committee was formed in Bombay in March 1919 to defend the Khalifa's powers. Now, Gandhi thought this as an opportunity to bring together the multiple folds of Hindus and Muslims against a common enemy that is the British. So, with this proposal, he went to the Indian National Congress. Again, Indian National Congress, many people were not very much reluctant to, you know, much, very much interested in going for another struggle or another Satyagraha movement because most of them wanted to participate in the council elections. Okay. So, what happened? There were two sessions of the Congress, the Calcutta session of September 1920 and the December session of Nagpur 1920, where finally Gandhi convinced the Indian National Congress leaders to start a non-cooperation program in support of the Khilafat movement and there we have the non-cooperation Khilafat. Okay, if you talk about Gandhi had written a book called as Hind Swaraj. So, in Hind Swaraj, Gandhi described that India may, that he said that in India, the Britishers are able to successfully, uh, you know, establish an empire because we cooperated. So, if you refuse to cooperate, if you refuse to obey them, definitely their, uh, the British empire in India would collapse and Swaraj will come, right? So, that is what Gandhi's views are about. Okay, let's talk about, now the question is very simple, why non-cooperation? So, what I said that in his book 1909, Hind Swaraj, Mahatma Gandhi declared that rule British rule established in India with the cooperation of the Indians. In December 1920, Congress session of Nagpur, the non-cooperation program was adopted. Now, what happened guys? Gandhi ji proposed that the movement should unfold in the three stages. Number one, the people will start surrendering their titles. Earlier, what happened, the government awarded certain titles for certain achievements, okay, to make the Indians happy as well. Okay, so basically, number one, you will surrender back all the titles. Second, you will boycott all the government services like civil services, army, police, courts, legislative councils, schools, foreign goods. And in case the government re responded back with a physical force, if the government responded back with a brutal repression, we will launch a full civil disobedience campaign. So, this is the idea of launching, this was how the non-cooperation movement has to be planned. Right, dosto? Chalo. So, let me ask you a question here. So, a lot of things we have done. Let me have you a question. Let me have a question here. Okay. So, you must be waiting for a poll here. Okay. Let me have a question here. Gandhi organized Satyagraha in Ahmedabad in Ahmedabad in support of Dash Indigo Farmers Poor Peasants Cotton mill workers, option D, Congress leaders, Dash, 
done so we have four options out here guys and you need to just answer them so i'll release the polls if the answer is very very simple okay the process is very simple i'll release the polls and you have to just tell me the correct questions or just correct options okay so here the poll release and i can see a lot of people okay a lot of people i can see here i can see lots and lots of people my dear bachcho okay so people are very superb here amazing okay very nice very very nice are very very nice very very nice bachcho very very nice okay so i can see lots and lots of people out here okay very nice bachcha party very very nice okay superb amazing amazing done guys question is done finished okay let's move further okay so indigo farmers poor peasants cotton mill workers congress leaders we know that we have studied that gandhi did a satyagraha and support of the cotton mill workers any option number c is absolutely correct answers okay so we have 100% people give me correct answer that's amazing yaar yeah? anmol pvs vuh doni sturdy harshit riz hi riz okay riz se rista okay adi tesh pratap kuvar very nice guys very very nice superb okay so let's move a little bit further so what we saw that this is how the non cooperation program was adopted now there is a question that there were different strands within the movement strands means the this entire non cooperation movement uh, was you know adopted in different ways in the different parts of the country we'll uh, basically talk about three important ones we'll talk about the non cooperation movement in towns we'll talk about the same in the country side we'll talk about the same in the plantations is that fair enough okay now so basically the non cooperation movement belong around, around somewhere around january 1921 and different social groups participated in this uh, everyone had their own agenda everyone had their own wish okay so all responded to the call of swaraj but the meaning of swaraj was different for the different people now this question is asked a lot of times in the board examinations that the meaning of swaraj was different for different people explain with reference to the people in the towns or in the countryside or in the plantations so they will ask you any of the aspects now let's talk about the movement of the towns definitely the most educated guys were there in the towns so it started with the participation of the middle classes students teachers lawyers doctors they all gave up our jobs they all gave up their government jobs and they started joining the movements council elections were boycotted foreign goods were boycotted the liquor shops were picketed that means their entrances were blocked okay and the best part the point is very simple but so there was only one party that did not participate that did not boycott the elections that was except justice party okay except the justice party of madras because justice party was a party of dalits who was again not in the favor of the congress the reason is congress never came up to support the cause of dalits right they never came up they never fought for their rights so very simple the justice party was not at all interested in any movement organized by the indian national congress right so as a result the justice party did not participate now what happened further let's try understanding so we see that the movement started very well in the towns but again it led to a failure what were the causes of the failure number 1 the movement failed in towns number 1 gandhi asked people to use khadi now khadi is still a very expensive cloth khadi is a very expensive fabric guys if you want to buy or something of khadi it's expensive so gandhi asked people to wear khadi but khadi was expensive second important point the indian people they left the british institutions but the alternative indian institutions were very slow to come up so as a result you can sustain one or two days without food or without normal jobs or without money but you can't survive for the entire life so had there been some indian institutions where these people could be shifted it have been a more effective movement but the point is since there were no uh, indian institutions or alternative indian, institu indian institutions were very slow to come up so people had no where but to return back to the british ones okay so this is the reason why the movement failed now rebellion in the countryside so the term countryside refers to bachcho the village okay the village area so that is basically what countryside means so if we see the countryside we have two aspects number one the peasant movement in avadh and the second one is the tribal movement in andhra pradesh if you see that the peasants and tribals they had their own understanding of swaraj and if you see that both of their movements it turned violent for example in avadh if you see the peasants were led by baba ramchand against the landlords and talukdars who made the peasants do begar mazduri that is free of cost labor and also continuously thrown them or threw them out of their lands so even though these poor farmers they paid the rent for their land 
but still they had no security of tenure that means any time they could be asked to leave the lands also there are times they were forced to perform free labor so such type of landlords were socially boycotted by organizing nai and dhobi bands right so we see that in 1920 an avad kisan sabha was set up that was headed by jawaharlal nehru and baba ramchand however this movement in avad it turned violent so congress could never align this movement along with the non cooperation now we see one more uh, one more example of tribal movement in andhra pradesh so if you remember when british government captured india you know when they established their rule in india they implemented certain forest laws now this forest laws or forest act actually deprived the local people from accessing the forest products like if you talk about the adivasi community they were very much dependent upon the forest products for their life needs okay but britishers were very cunning they wanted to get all the good quality of timber that is wood from the forest all the forest products for themselves so they started putting certain restrictions on the forest or you can simply say on the movement of indian people into the forest so as a result when uh, britishers started forcing the people in andhra pradesh the guda mills of andhra pradesh to contribute begar for building of roads the people revolted and the leader was a very interesting personality aluri sitaram raju so he led the guerrilla warfare movement in the gudam hills of andhra pradesh okay so the rebels they attacked the police stations if you talk about aluri sitaram raju is a very interesting figure the question may be asked from this particular point so aluri sitaram raju called himself as an incarnation of god he said that i am a form of god in fact i am god incarnated as human i have come to protect you to lead you he said that he had super powers he had said that i can uh, see the future i can make astrological predictions i can heal people even bullet shots i can survive right so how were he was captured by the britishers and killed in 1924 after which the guerrilla movement in the uh, andhra pradesh subsided right subsided means it became very much uh, you can say that lukewarm in presence or you can say that it reduced a lot or completely you can say that it subsided okay so this is how the gorilla movement in andhra pradesh ended now the last pointer the last strand that is okay so let me tell you one more thing okay so the last strand the last strand is the swaraj in the plantations we'll talk about that also okay so we talk about Okay, so just pay attention to all the boards, bacho. Okay, so we talk about the workers working the plantations of Assam. So they were basically restricted by an act. So this act was Inland Immigration Act of eighteen fifty nine. Inland Immigration Act of eighteen fifty nine. Inland Immigration Act of 1859. Now, according to this act, these plantation workers were not allowed to leave the plantations and go back to their villages from the where they had come to work in the plantations. Now, the problem was when. Give me a moment here. It happens when you speak for a longer period of time continuously. The voice get a little bit strained. i guess everything is fine okay yeah so where were we so i was telling you bachcho that uh, according to this act that is inland immigration act of 1859 the plantation workers of assam they were not allowed to leave their plantations and go back to their villages okay so what happened when uh, this non cooperation movement spread so these people thought that now gandhi raj is coming and they will get a land in their own villages and they will be allowed to freely move in and out of the plantations as a result what they did was they defied the authorities and they started uh, removing out of the plantations in a hope to return back to their villages right however they were very unfortunate because what happened that there was railway strike the boats were not functioning as a result they could not find a means of transportation that could take them back to the villages unfortunately they were caught by the police they were beaten up again sent back to the plantations so what we see here is no doubt the non cooperation movement was not a very huge success 
it spread in the different parts of the country okay it impacted a lot of people but when the people were chanting the slogans of swatantra bharat they were going beyond their own locality and they were trying to identify themselves with an all india movement and that was the best part that was the best part about this entire struggle okay now a very uneventful thing happened in chauri chaura which actually forced gandhi to take back this non cooperation movement okay so what happened this happened actually in 4th feb on 4th of february 1922 chauri chaura is a place in gorakhpur a peaceful demonstration in a bazaar turned into a violent clash with the police when police fired upon the peaceful protesters okay so in return the protesters became very angry so they burned down the entire police station in which 22 policemen died so as gandhi saw the violent was the violence is spreading he just called off the non cooperation movement now it had some severe impacts also number one people in the congress were not very much happy with this because this movement had a lot of efforts second it was also in support of the khilafat you remember that gandhi started a non cooperation support of khilafat however the problem of the khilafat was not solved so the muslim leaders who had a hope of getting a solution and they felt like they are betrayed okay all of a sudden gandhi has stopped the movement and that is not very much justified so that discrimination between that hindus and muslim it started widening right so this is some some negative implication now okay so what happened now many leaders within the congress they wanted to participate in the elections like c r das and motilal nehru so they formed a swaraj party in 1923 within the congress and they felt that if you want to make some kind of reforms in the indian administration you have to be in the assemblies and suggest for the reform fight for the reforms okay rather than doing some kind of movement right however if you talk about the young leaders like jawahar lal nehru and subhash chandra bose now they were more or in favor of the complete independence okay now let's move further so this is a very nice question that is often asked in the three markers the factors that shaped the indian politics towards the late 1920s the number one is the worldwide economic depression if you see that during the time of 1928 to 1930 or 31 the entire world was uh, you can say that suffering from a great economic depression and to a larger extent the sector which was the worst hit that was agriculture sector so agriculture products especially the products in the international market the prices were declining and all those farmers who were involved in the international trade of aapke uh, like agriculture products so they were the worst hit okay so what happened after 1930 the agriculture prices completely collapsed as a result farmer were in turmoil apart from that simon commission so basically what happened the conservative party the tory government refers to the conservative party government in britain so basically what happened britain in britain what happened there it was a time of elections right in 1919 a proclamation was done that after 10 years we will be sending a royal commission to review the administrative changes in india however it was the time of elections and the conservative party did not want to lose elections in britain so it formed a royal commission okay under sir john simon and sent to india in order to look into the constitutional structure of india the commission arrived in india in 1928 however it was greeted with the sing- symbols and the slogans simon go back right so people greeted this simon commission with the black flag written simon go back the major reason behind this protest was there was no indian member in this entire commission now the indians asked the indians demanded that you are coming to make laws for our country and you haven't uh, recruited any indian member in your commission and that was the biggest pointer here okay now if you see that december 1929 now this is also very important event here okay in december 1929 in the lahore session of the congress which was presided by jawahar lal nehru the demand for purna swaraj became very dominant now the young leaders within the, within the congress were not satisfied at all with the dominion status they wanted complete independence they said that we will celebrate or observe 26th january 1930 as the independence day for the country however that was a very much hypothetical idea so that did not attract much of the uh, you can say that uh, uh, you know audience from the entire country but still we celebrate 26 january as a republic day remember okay we just celebrated this year in the beginning of the year so this is in order to give respect to that purna swaraj resolution that was taken in the lahore session of the congress okay so i hope this is clear my dear bachcho i hope this is clear my dear bachcho okay now let me ask a question to you let me ask a question to you okay so we already covered a lot part of the chapter i guess hai na so we already covered a lot part of the chapter now let me ask a good question to you okay so very simple it's a commission
दैट अराइव्ड इन इंडिया इन डैश ओके टू सजेस्ट एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव चेंजेस ओके आई गिव यू फोर ऑप्शन हेयर ओके लुक एट द क्वेश्चन केयरफुली बच्चों ओके डन सो वी हैव फोर ऑप्शन सो इट्स अ कमीशन दैट अराइव्ड इन इंडिया इन डैश टू सजेस्ट द एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव चेंजेस सो आई रिलीज द पोल्स फॉर यू थर्टी सेकेंड्स पोल्स हेयर एन एवी गो वेरी नाइस वेरी नाइस वेरी नाइस बच्चों वेरी वेरी नाइस रोहित एच सी आर टू बेटा बोर्ड एग्जाम्स आर देयर है ना यू आर स्टिल बिजी इन योर ओन अफेयर दैट्स वेरी बैड माई डियर ओ माई डियर ओके देवेंद्र राठौर बच्चे लेट मी गेट फ्री फ्रॉम द मारथन इट्स सपोज टू लॉन्च टूडे बाई बट टूडे इट सेल्फ सो लेट मी फ्री गेट फ्री फ्रॉम द मारथन देन ओनली आई बिल एबल टू लुक आउट इन टू समथिंग एल्स राइट I hope that makes it clear. That makes it clear, my dear. Okay, very simple, very very nice. Okay. Very nice. Done. Okay. So, बच्चों ने कर लिया क्वेश्चन. It's very amazing. Okay. So, the correct answer is option number D. That is Simon, nineteen twenty-eight. Done. Okay. So, Simon Commission, nineteen twenty-eight. Option number D. Seventy-two percent people have given me the correct answers. Diksha, Manuna, Ragi, we have Gamer King edits Priya, Ripka, Harshit, Athar, Vimal, Sriji, Adi, KV, Nikhil, K. Aditya Prakash. So we have lot of lot of okay. P. V. Shukla comedy. I'll I'll just check out your channel after the marathon ends. I'll also some need some you know moments of respite. So I'll surely check out your channel, my dear. Okay. So this is clear, my dear. This is clear. Okay. Now let's come to some very 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 amazing topic that is this is a five marker topic my dear students five mark topic that's a short short type of question ki why gandhi used salt as a symbol of resistance this is a five mark topic it's a very very important one okay so please make sure that you do very nicely okay now how many of you would love to eat your food without salt i'm not talking about the sweets obviously you can't have a salt in moti chur ka laddu hai na so very simple how many of you would love to have your food without salt without salt bina namak ke khana kitto ko acha lagta hai will it taste will it taste good without salt just imagine you are eating without salt will the will your food taste good will your food taste good no not me isn't it okay very nice Without salt, Kushi Singh sir. Without salt, nah, not possible. Not me. Not possible. Right? Exactly. 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 Yeah. Definitely. But so we cannot. Uh, we cannot eat it without salt. It's very difficult for us, isn't it? So this fact was known by the Britishers as well, guys. Britishers knew this that Indians cannot have their food without salt. We love food, isn't it? We love food a lot. How many of you love food? How many of you guys are very foody? You love food, sir. I need something to munch on. Well, I am feeling very hungry today, and very, very honest note, I am feeling very hungry today. Reason is I am very much, you know. Okay. So the point is, how many of you are very much foody? You love food a lot, sir. Sir, food is, you know, it's it's love, sir. Two rule of sir. Me, sir. Okay. Very nice. Without salt, impossible. Yes. So yeah. So I like to eat cats. Who is this, Harshit? You like to eat cats? Is it sure, sir? Samosa, khalo. Sure, I'll do this. This is a detailed lecture. Yeah, definitely. But say I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, <laughs> one student saying, sir, I cannot study without something in my hand, and that's a very cool thing. I, I always say whenever I, I do the recorded lectures, even, and then also I always say that get something, get, get hold of something, you know, get something to eat. That will keep you energized. That will keep you full, right, bacho? So just, 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 just. So this particular fact was very much, uh, you know, understood by the British also that you cannot, uh, you know, uh, do without salt. So you have to use salt in your food. So these guys are very cunning. 
एक नंबर चिंदी चोर आई कॉल देम राइट सो दिस इज द परफेक्ट टेन टू डिस्क्राइब दिस गाइस चिंदी चोर चिंदी चोर इज लाइक यू नो दे आर वेरी कनिंग पीपल सो दे इंपोज टैक्स ऑन द सॉल्ट दे इंपोज टैक्स ऑन द सॉल्ट दे सेट दैट ओके गाइस लाइक सॉल्ट अ लॉट कम ऑन पे टैक्स ऑन इट नाउ गांधी वाज वेरी मच एंग्री नो व्हाट इज दिस मैन ब्रो व्हाट द प्रॉब्लम ड्यूड सो व्हाट इज दिस गांधी वाज वेरी मच एंग्री नो एंड गांधी थॉट व्हाई नॉट make salt as a symbol of protest because salt is one thing that even the rich eats its and the poor eats you know so both of them they eat the salt alike so salt is very important even for the rich and the poor guy both of them will be eating the salt okay without salt you know life will be like you know very much you know poor right so let's try to understand this so basically uh, the britishers had a monopoly monopoly over manufacturing salt monopoly means only the britishers can manufacture the salt and also they put a tax on the salt okay so gandhi chose salt as the medium that could unite the nation as it was consumed by all the sections of the society now what did gandhi do so uh, the viceroy in those times were viceroy irwin okay so gandhi he wrote a letter he used to write a lot of letters he even wrote a letter to adolf hitler however hitler did not respond he was like jane do ऐसे, so he wrote a Hitler, he wrote a lot of letters to Hitler also. You must have seen that in chapter Nazism. You remember there were some letters published, my dear friend Hitler, this and that. Hitler was a ज़्यादा हवा आने थे भाई. ठीक है, so Hitler was in that case. Okay, so he wrote a lot of letters. So he wrote one letter to Viceroy Irwin also. Now Gandhi wanted to uh, basically collaborate the demands of the multiple classes so that an all India mass movement can be organized. Okay. So Gandhi roughly uh, he wrote ten to eleven demands which he wanted the Britishers to fulfil. However, Viceroy Irwin he did not pay any attention to these demands. He was simply like, okay, are fine. Gandhi, are more most of the time you are just writing the letters. Hey, come on, just remove the letter. We are least bothered with whatever you are demanding. Gandhi was like, come on, bro, you are taking me lightly. This is not done. Irwin, bro, you are taking me lightly, bro. I am asking you for certain demands. Believe me. If you don't fulfill my demands by 11 March, I will launch my Dandi March. Irwin was like, "Okay, fine, just go. Okay, just do whatever you want to do. No, I am least bothered." So Gandhi was like, "Bro, you are taking me lightly. That's not done. Okay. So if you don't accept my demands, I am going to launch a Dandi March." Irwin did as he wanted to. He did not accept the demands of Dandi. As a result, we see that Gandhi launched the Dandi March. So on March 12, 1930, Gandhi started the famous Dandi March from Sabarmati Ashram. to dandi that's a coastal town in gujarat and finally it was like uh, approximately 240 miles so gandhi covered the distance in 24 days okay 10 miles per day was very calculative you can say okay so he stopped in the different villages people used to come to him listen to him and lots and lots of people joined you know along with them in this march so finally on 6th april 6th april 1930 gandhi reached dandi it's a village in gujarat and he broke the salt by law by manufacturing by boiling the sea water and manufacturing the salt and thus began the civil disobedience movement now the civil disobedience movement was something that actually ruined the sleeps of the britishers because viceroy irwin was also not predicted that such a thing is going to happen now how is it different from non cooperation the people were asked not only to refuse to cooperate but also to break the colonial laws so people started boycotting the foreign goods they started not paying the taxes they breaking the forest laws okay so these were the things that people started doing that they started breaking the laws earlier they were refusing to cooperate now they started breaking the laws okay now british government is very simple british government is very simple okay british government is like the moment you protest against them they are like hey lathi nikal de daya so they are like that you know i have seen that daya of cid every one i mean cid is one show and its daya is very popular and that dialogue you know daya darwaza tod to britishers were like that ke lathi nikal de daya kamar tod so the moment you protest against the britishers they will be back with the same resorts okay they will be straight away ordering the police that you straight away use the brutal repression you beat the people the once you start putting beating the people automatically they will stop doing the protest so you won't imagine then 1 lakh satyagrahis were arrested 1 lakh satyagrahis were arrested even men and women were not even spared so that was the kind of brutality that the britishers showed okay so they followed a policy of brutal repression british government arrested all the leaders including gandhi and nehru so what happened because of the violence is spreading what did gandhi do gandhi called off the movement now that was a moy moy movement for all the people who were having high hopes because different classes of the people they joined the non uh, this thing civil disobedience with their own aspirations and hopes now it was a great setback for them you know 
सो दे वुड बी सिंगिंग एट दो टाइम्स मोए मोए है ना जस्ट इमेजिन द जाट्स एंड पार्टी दास वेड पार्टिसिपेटेड इन द सिविल डिसोबीडियंस दे हैड देयर ओन डिमांड्स the demands were not completed gandhi called up the movement so all those guys who have participated in the civil disobedience movement with a certain hope with a certain aspiration certain demands and when this movement was called off abruptly so they all had that moment mohe mohe hai na it's very very simple so they all had that moment called mohe mohe isn't it so the point is very simple ab gandhi also you know had a very much a dilemma so gandhi could not do much about it because there was so much violence spreading all the leaders were getting arrested okay satyagrahis were getting arrested so gandhi had no option but to call up the movement and this is what he did finally there was a gandhi irvin pact signed now this is a very important one okay so this is a very important one the gandhi irvin pact now what is gandhi irvin pact pact means an agreement let's suppose like me and the all my lovely viewers it's we had an agreement i can say that kunal and pw english viewers pact so in the same way gandhi and viceroy irvin they signed a pact on 5th march 1931 it's a very important question okay so according to this gandhi went to london to attend the second round table conference so round table conference basically it was a conference it's a meeting it had three sessions first and the third one were boycotted by congress but the second one was attended by gandhi okay and gandhi had its own swag that's that's very interesting to note let me tell you very interesting event here so gandhi went to london for round table conference in this with that costume you know what's the costume that dhoti you know wonderful dhoti stylish dhoti and since he was very fit you know oh abs were not visible that's a different part but he was very fit so he had one that shawl over his bare body he was you know very much confident bare body ekdam you know muscular the bare body and that dhoti so one of the journalist asked gandhi ki have you put on have you put on enough clothes to meet the king now, gandhi was very much you know savage so gandhi responded i guess the king has enough clothes for both of us interesting one so the media person asked gandhi you are dressed up like this wearing a dhoti just a shawl to cover your bare body do you feel that you are going to meet the king are you even dressed up according to the formation according to the occasion so gandhi was savage he was a savage bro he said that you know king has enough clothes for both of us so you know that was a kind of state okay so let's move further so basically the round table conference failed now the round table conference failed a round table conference failed gandhi returned back he said that again i will launch the civil disobedience so again launch the civil disobedience around 1932 but this time many people who had that moy moy moment in the first case they did not join so by 1934 the civil disobedience movement lost its momentum okay done it lost its momentum fine so this is how the gandhi irvin pact and the cdm ended now let's talk about now this itself is a question guys how the participants saw the civil disobedience movement this itself is a five mark question now this is going to be super amazing okay now let's talk about the first group that is rich peasants you can as it is write down these points in your answers you'll get the marks okay so let's talk about who are the people who participated in the civil disobedience movement number 1 the rich peasants the rich farmers okay for example the jats and patidars the rich peasants who can we call the jats jats of uttar pradesh and patidars of gujarat jats of uttar pradesh and patidars of gujarat okay so they were the rich peasant communities because of the agricultural depression their cash incomes declined okay so as a result they requested the british government to reduce the revenue which the british government refused so they joined the civil disobedience movement right so they did not rejoin the movement as their rates were not revised and they did not benefit out of the first phase of civil disobedience right second are the poor peasants now the poor peasants they wanted to the rent of the lands to be remitted now the point is most of the big zamindars or the friends of the congress so they were actually the funding material so you can say that congress received the funds from the big businessmen and the big zamindars if congress supported the poor peasants or the poor farmers then big zamindars will get offended how will congress get the funding now that's a big dilemma for congress so congress did not support such type of no rent campaigns right so congress was unwilling to support these campaigns because it was having a fear that it may upset the rich peasants and the landlords then the business classes see business class was more disturbed because you uh, what happened during the first world war this business class had made huge profits and now it wanted to expand its business but the problem is the colonial con uh, government that is the british government had put certain restrictions on the movement of the business goods and capitals now these guys they wanted to they wanted to uh, basically remove these restrictions 
and they wanted the protection against the foreign imported goods. So in order to organize their business interests, they formed Indian Industrial and Commercial Congress in 1920 and FICI. FICI is Federation of the Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industries in 1927. So these are the two organizations that the business classes formed in order to put forward their interests. Now let's talk about the women. Now Gandhi is a very interesting personality, I must say that. During the time of the movement, when people required large crowd, even Congress and Gandhi was very much interested in calling all the women together. You know, women are the Nari Shakti, they are the real pillars, they are the real flag bearers of this movement. But when it came to the social and political rights of the women, no one was interested. Gandhi called them to be good mothers, they will be good mothers. No one discussed about their political and social rights. So, the worst, you can say that, the worst sufferers of injustice and inequality were the women. So, they participated in all the movements, all the, manuf all the manufactured salt, they participated in all the marches, they picketed the foreign cloth. But in the end, in the end, what happened, Congress was not ready to support for the women's political and social rights. And that is how ironical it is. Okay, so there is a line in NCRT again. Where which shows that Congress and Gandhi both were not interested in supporting women's political and social rights. Okay, so this is how we see that the participants saw the movement. Now there is one more question that is limits of the civil disobedience movement. Okay, so limits of the civil disobedience. So what do we call limits? That means who did not participate? Again, five mark question. Okay, so limits of the civil disobedience. That means who did not participate? So, there were many people who did not participate in the civil disobedience movement. Number one, let's talk about the Dalits or the untouchables. Okay, so they did not actively participate in the movement. It's very simple because they were looking for the political solutions. They clearly knew, knew that, they clearly said, when it comes to the social and political rights of Dalits, Congress is nowhere to be seen. Congress is not at all supportive when it comes to the political and social rights of Dalits. Why? Because it may offend the upper caste Hindus. Right. Very simple as that. So this clearly said that when Congress is organizing an event, we will not be a part of it. We want political solutions. We want separate electorates. We want perfect seats in the parliament. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, he was a champion in fighting for the, you know, cause of the upliftment of Dalits. So B. R. Ambedkar was the leader of Dalits. He formed an association in 1930 called as the Depressed Class Association. Right. So when round, second round table conference happened, Gandhi and uh, Ambedkar, they both clashed with the question on the, over the question of separate electorates. See, basically, uh, Dr. Ambedkar, he wanted certain number of seats reserved in the assembly or the parliament. Okay, and these seats have to be on the basis of majority. Let me explain you how. So, let's suppose there is an area X, okay, and there are 100 people living. So, Ambedkar said that uh, there should be a guarantee given that out of those 100 people, only a Dalit member will stand for the election and the people who are going to vote for him should also be from the Dalit community only. Okay. So he wanted the person to standing in the election to be from the Dalit community as well as the person voting also from the Dalit community. Right. So that he can be very much assured that they are going to have some political power. Now Gandhi opposed this. Gandhi said that this way the country will get divided. This is not good. It will lead to separation. Okay. So as a result, finally, uh, uh, you can say an uh, Compromise was worked out in the form of Pune Pact of 1932 between Gandhi and Ambedkar. So that gave Dalits the reserved seats in provincial and central councils, but they were supposed to, supposed to be voted by a general electorate. That means Dalits will get reserved seats, but a Dalit candidate will be voted by, the voters will be from the general composition, yani a mix of all the categories and the candidate can be from a Dalit category, right? Even we know that, uh, even if you see in the today's scenario also, we have a provision of reserved constituencies in the constitution. Okay, where the constituencies are reserved for SCs and STs, where the and stand, candidate standing in the election belongs from this category. However, the people voting from him for him can be from the common category. Okay, now, if you talk about the leader of the Muslim League, that is Muhammad Ali Jinnah also wanted reserved seats for the Muslims in Central Assembly. But if you see that, the Congress was very much not aligned with this. In 1927, an all-party conference was called where M. R. Jaikar of Hindu Mahasabha objected to Jinnah's demands and that was the last way we can ever hope for a, you know, reconciliation between Muslim League and Congress. So, all the last hopes were shattered in 1927 and the gap between the Muslim and the Congress, they started widening. So, they were also not very much active participants in the civil disobedience movement, okay? So, these are few of the pointers of the limits of the civil disobedience. Done, Bacho? Now, 
the last topic of this chapter that is the sense of the collective belonging after which we will be coming over to the chapter that is making of the global world so it is very small because only few parts are coming so we will be very quickly you know uh, coming over with the chapter okay so the sense of the collective belonging now what is this this is a very important topic very very important topic right bachcho so basically what happened uh, the nationalist leaders they felt that if you want to create a nation if you want to you know unite the people it can be done along with the struggles that we are doing along with the movements with the world that we are doing we also require some kind of culture and emotions to connect the people okay so basically there are multiple ways through which this can be done number one the creation of popular images like if you remember uh, 1905 bengal was partitioned by lord curzon okay the main uh, idea behind this was to divide hindus and muslims however in response to this partition swadeshi and boycott movements started in the entire country and we see that the bankim chandra chatopadhyay or bankim chand chatterjee he created the first image of bharat mata and again the first image was painted by abanindranath tagore so this is how the bharat mata look okay okay so abanindranath tagore painted the first image of bharat mata apart from this bankim chandra chatterpadhyay also composed the song vande matram which can later be found in his novel anandmat and there was a movement that started in india to revive the indian folklore that is the local stories right in fact we see that rabindranath tagore he himself travel to the different parts of the country in order to collect these stories in south india we have natesha shastri who published a whole volume of uh, this thing that is the folklore of southern india apart from that if you see that during the swadeshi and boycott movements popular symbols also played a great role like if you, you see that bacho uh, people started carrying a, a tricolor flag in fact in 1921 gandhi also designed a swaraj flag it was tricolor red green and white had a spinning wheel in the center that uh, you know that uh, focused on the idea of self help so these types of symbols basically you know made the people all the more come closer and also instilled in them a feeling of patriotism and nationalism right last but not the least the reinterpretation of history now what happened in this basically we all know that our indian culture is very much old ancient and very much glorified right so in the previous times in the ancient times in the vedic ages in the indus valley civilizations we had great achievements in all the fields whether it is literature whether it is science whether it is engineering we all remember that we have done great achievements right but the point is when the britishers captured india they made us feel very much inferior they made us feel that we haven't accomplished anything over the years and this is something that needs to be changed so the nationalist leaders they ask the people to reinterpret the history to read the indian history again to again know that you know that we have done great wonders we have done great achievements in the past and once you start taking pride in your own history you will feel that we have been sub dominated by the britishers and we need to fight together collectively as a collective force against the british so these are the multiple ways in which people try to connect the indian society now this is a very interesting event that we see in indian history that is the 1942 quit india movement where gandhi gave the famous slogan of the do or die right so we remember that uh, august kranti maidan it's a ground in bombay where this uh, entire event was called out if you remember that crips mission was sent to india in order to secure indian support in the second world war however it failed and gandhi said that immediately the power should be transferred to the india and britishers should leave india immediately however that did not happen but quit india movement is a mass movement that saw the rise of many political leaders in the entire country right bachcho so this also ends your chapter that is that is nationalism in india right my dear pyare bachcho so let me ask you a question okay so this also ends your chapter nationalism in india so let me ask you a question bachcha wadi it's a nice question it's a good question okay here we go okay so the question is depressed class association was formed by dash in 1930 done okay so we have four options out here b r ambedkar 
मोहम्मद अली जिन्ना पेरियर रामास्वामी एंड बाबा फूले डन सो वी हैव फोर ऑप्शंस आउट हेयर गाइस सो आई रिलीज द पोल्स फॉर यू एंड लेट्स स्टार्ट थर्टी सेकेंड्स पोल्स ओके सुपर सुपर so depressed class association was formed by dash in 1934 options we have got very nice guys very very nice superb amazing okay very nice superb okay this someone is saying sir take my name sir take my name sir take my name who is this who is this utsav sir take my name okay very nice guys very very nice या बच्चे दिस इज नॉट रिकॉर्डेड दिस इज नॉट रिकॉर्डेड दिस इज एब्सोल्युटली लाइव जाते ओके हाय जॉर्ज वेरी नाइस बेटा वेरी वेरी नाइस ओके सो अच्छा दिस दिस इज आल्सो गोइंग लाइव ऑन पीडब्ल्यू कन्नड़ आई गेस है ना सो वी हैव लाइव ऑन मल्टीपल चैनल्स सो हाय फ्रॉम माय साइड सी बच्चे बिकॉज आई एम एबल टू सी द स्टार्ट ऑफ ओनली फ्यू चैनल्स सो दैट्स अ शॉर्ट कमिंग सो इफ आई हैड मिस्ड ग्रीटिंग यू सो इट्स अ ग्रेट हाई फ्रॉम माई साइड ओके एंड लॉट्स ऑफ लव टू यू ओके सो fine okay so uh, yeah so guys have done absolutely correct depressed class association was formed by dash 1930 so it's by b r ambedkar option number a is absolutely correct my dear bachcho 100% guys have given me the correct answer that really amazing bachcho you know savage pran devashish regia chandran priya akansha queen ishki okay i remember one student as ishki last year in the last marathons uh, i don't know whether it's the same student okay oh, ishki is here okay so let's 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 come to the next topic that is the making of the global world okay so bachcho the making of the global world okay very nice youtube venom hi okay yes jatin yes jatin 100 questions from science are also going on so we are doing a lot of things for you so that you guys score absolutely good marks in the examinations so finally we see that we have come to the making of global world and since we know that only 2 to 3 pages are coming from this chapter so we will be winding up with this chapter very easily okay so we'll be covering only those part and those topics that are coming in the board examinations so it's uh, the only two topics are coming that is uh, your pre modern world and second is one uh, is the uh, this thing conquest and decision trait right so only 2 to 3 pages of this chapter are coming so this absolutely scoring chapter so quickly we'll start with the making of the global world and then we'll come to the most awaited one that is the print culture in the modern world so once we are done with print culture in the modern world you'll see that geography will be you know will be cruising through geography at a good pace now let's talk about the pre modern world see if you have heard about this a term called globalization so basically globalization is nothing but the interlinking of the uh, world economies right it's a process by which the different countries are linked today it's a process by which we see that faster modes of communication transportation it's a process in which people have moved from one places to another in search of better jobs better opportunities for education right it's a process that connects the different countries of the world together so that is basically called as globalization so it's an economic system that has emerged in the last 50 years okay but the making of this global world has a long history it's of a trade of migration of people moving out in the search of work the movement of money that is capital right so we know that from ancient times the travelers the traders the priest the pilgrims pilgrims are the guys who go for religious tourism okay so they have traveled vast distances for different perspectives like for knowledge for opportunity okay for spiritual needs and sometimes also to escape the punishment or the persecution right so if you remember as early as 3000 bc there was a coastal trade active between indus valley civilization with the present day west asia so that itself shows that ki the kind of world we are living in it has taken time to develop such a kind of world right so it's a global world where we all are connected nowadays suppose you have a friend sitting in us or germany or switzerland you can easily connect with them over the social media right so this is because of the technology that again is a great player that's again is a great component that has that has helped to connect the different parts of the world done now so let's talk about silk routes now this question is very important this question is mostly asked in the two marks the silk routes are a good example of pre modern vibrant trade and the cultural exchanges now why do we call this let's try to understand so do you know what are the silk routes 
Silk routes were basically those routes over land and over sea, which were used by the traders for the trading of different articles. Especially the Chinese silk used to travel through these routes to the western countries and hence it got the name silk route. Okay, apart from that, the apart from this, the textile or the fabric from India, the spices from India also used to travel from India and China to Europe and the different parts of northern Africa. Right, so these are those routes. Okay, now if you see that in exchange for spices and textile from India, and we received precious metals like gold and silver that came from Europe to Asia. Apart from that, if you see that these routes are the ones over which the different people have traveled. And when these people traveled along with the uh, uh, training articles, they also shared their knowledge, their culture, their tradition, their feeding habits, right? In fact, if we talk about the religions like Buddhism, so they have also spread through these routes. Remember, King Ashok sent his daughter and son to preach, uh, you can say, Buddhism in Sri Lanka. So, these were the routes that were utilized through which the different things have expanded in the world, right? Now, there is one more question that is asked that food offers many examples of long distance cultural exchange. Explain. It's a two mark question again. So, let's take the example of food. So, how the food that was eaten by one particular community or in a certain region travel to the different parts of the world. Let's talk about your favorite pasta. Like for me, Alfredo pasta is my favorite. That is the white sauce pasta, right? So, we call the white sauce pasta as pasta Alfredo and the red sauce pasta as pasta Arabiata. Okay. So, well, pasta is somewhat made from, you know, at times it is made from wheat. It is made from... Uh, Wheat only, you know. So basically, pasta is something that we all love to eat, isn't it? White sauce pasta, red sauce pasta that you call. So pasta was basically introduced in Italy, you can say by the Arab traders. Now that's so interesting. So Arab traders, so whenever the new traders, whenever the traders, they, you know, uh, re, uh, went to some other country, some new places, they always carried their food along. So, wherever they went, they introduced their culture and food in those places. For example, the Arab traders introduced pasta, right? Let me write this down. So, Arab traders introduced pasta to Italy. Okay, apart from that, the noodles when they traveled west to western countries from China, their name was changed and it became spaghetti. Even if you today ask a spaghetti pasta, you will get noodles wrapped up in cream and sauces, right? So, our ancestors were not familiar with some common foods like potatoes, soya, groundnut, chilies, tomatoes, okay, until the discovery of America. So, America was discovered by Christopher Columbus and the real inhabitants of America, those are called as Red Indians, they are the guys who used to consume these products. So, when America was discovered and when America was discovered, so these products or these vegetables also started traveling to different parts of the world, right? Now, okay, so... One more point, okay, one more point I would like to add in this case, food travels, okay. So, at times what happens, okay, at times what happens, a food can make change of life and death and this stands very true in the case of Ireland's potato famine. So, what happened, let me tell you. You remember we studied in nationalism in Europe that Britain captured Ireland. Now, there was a problem with Britain. Britain's agriculture was not very much flourishing, okay. So, there was not very much agriculture products that being, were being produced in Britain. But Britain's population was increasing. So, ultimately, they had to manage the food. How will they manage the food? So, what they used to do was, they used to grow food, lot of food in Ireland and used to import it to Britain. But the point is, that food was comparatively costly. So, the poor farmers, the poor people of Ireland could not afford that food. So, they started planting potato. Potato is alu that we eat in my samosa, isn't it? So, alu. So, they started planting alu or potato and that potato became the very much common and popular food among the poor people of Ireland. So, what happened? Once that potato crop got destroyed by a fungal disease called potato blight. So, this blight is a disease in which the entire crop is affected and the Irish people got so much dependent on the potato that when this potato crop get destroyed, they started dying in large numbers because of starvation. They could not afford other crops. Potato was a simple and humble one. It's a very easy to afford. So when it destroyed, so many people, they died because of starvation. How bad is that? So many people, they left Ireland to other places in search of better opportunities. So this is how a crop can, you know, at times decide your fortune, at times decide your destiny. Right? Now, let's talk about, let's talk about a very interesting concept that is conquest, disease and trade. 
see what happened in the mid 16th century in the mid 16th century okay so let's try understanding so what happened in the mid 16th century it's often said that the world shrank greatly now what is the meaning of the world shrank greatly understand this point basically it means that the different parts of the world which were earlier not connected they started connecting very much okay now how is that possible see remember we talked about the ottoman empires how they controlled the entire european region now the turkey if you talk about turkey turkey is a very interesting place there's a water body there's a uh, you can say there's a part of sea or a part of strait that passes through uh, turkey it's called bosphorus sea so bosphorus is a kind of sea it's a water body that connects asia to europe now it's very interesting to know and the person who will have the control over that bosphorus will have the control over the trade as well okay so since ottoman empire was having the control over turkey over bosphorus so definitely it became difficult for the other western countries to pass through that right so they started looking for new routes new exploration started so they started looking for new sea routes okay and as a result we see that uh, two major countries were discovered by the european powers one is india by vasco da gama who landed on the coast of calicut near kerala in 1498 and the other one was america discovered by christopher columbus so once the sea routes were discovered many european powers were attracted by the wealth of these countries india was very wealthy you know india had a lot of wealth india had a lot of resources same way america also had a lot of resources so these countries these european powers started getting attracted to these india and america right so as a result lot of them started coming through the uh, sea in order to trade with india so earlier india was the only uh, you can say big player in the uh, asian market okay so because india's location if you see the geographical location it's very strategic so if you have to go from asia to europe you'll have to pass by india so as a result india was having a lot of trade opportunities okay but when the european guys they entered into the scene so what happened the entry of the europeans they directed some of this trade towards them so earlier india was the only big player who was in dealing in all these trades so when the europeans entered here they started carrying the trade towards their countries right apart from that america's vast lands and abundant crops and minerals they also made the european countries lot of rich because you see that the american people they were cut off from the entire world for so long time so they were not having power they were not modernized they were not advanced okay so it was very easy for these european powers to dominate over those innocent people right and this is what they did and they started exploiting the resources of america right so we see that by the mid 16th century by the mid 16th century the colonization of america by portugal and spain was underway so these two european powers they started to colonize america right and what they did let's try imagining okay so there is one special point that europe's most powerful weapon was not a military weapon that means they did not use any any gun or any missile or any tank to colonize america what they used was a biological warfare a biological weapon remember china china it spread a particular virus called as covid so there are many theories which still hint to the fact that it was a biological war that china wanted to do with the world in order to increase its domination however again conclusive evidences are still not present so better not to comment but still there are many 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 theories many researches that give a hint towards the same and owing to the nature the kind of country china is it's very much understood so if we talk about there was a smallpox kind of disease so this disease was like if you had this disease there will be blisters all over your body so there will be blisters all over your body fode kehte hain hindi mein isko hum okay and they were very painful and the people can die the american guys they were very much you know cut off from the entire world so far for so many years so they had no immunity to this particular disease as a result what happened these people the portuguese and the spanish guys they carried an infected person and they released this infected person in the american areas that caused the infection of smallpox to the local population and once the people died they used to clear the area and capture that right so if you see that till 18th century china and india were among the world's richest countries can you imagine india was called soni ki chidiya so there was a logic behind that india was that rich right but uh, okay so from 15th century china started to go into isolation china started to cut off its connections from the rest of the world and by 18th century we see that britishers also had started capturing over the indian resources so gradually what happened as india got colonized and china went into isolation it started to cut off its connections from the rest of the world so america or the europe now emerged as the center of the world trade right 
so this is the content that you need to study with respect to the making of global world the rest of the part of the chapter will be asked in the project work so this is the only content that is going to be asked in your board examinations i hope that's clear i hope that's clear my dear bachu now let's so i have a question for you so the question is the colonization of america was underway by mid 16th century by dash spain and britain spain and portugal spain and china spain and netherlands done so bachche this is the question four option you have got i'll release the polls here and here we go superb superb but when uh, basically when i'm teaching that it at times it gets difficult ha bachche always my blessings is with you with you my bachche ragu bilkul aashirwad hai bhai tumhare upar pura pura rinku what is your doubt my dear what is your doubt bachche hindi mein nahi hai beta ye channel hi english hai i have already told you before also hai na this marathon is not in hindi because channel itself is in english hai na hindi mein jo marathon hum log karte hain hindi english mix karke beta wo foundation channels pe hoti hai wo bahut jaldi aapke liye aane wali hai abhi theek hai to aaj wali jo marathon hai this is for all the students jo abhi bechare hamare uh, hindi nahi samajhte theek hai so this is for all the students so every student is important aap log ke liye to bahut sare resources hain but bahut sare bachche hain hamare jinke paas kuch nahi milta who want to study completely in english so this is for them okay खुशनुमा अली बेटा हिंदी वाला जो मैराथन होता है वो फाउंडेशन चैनल पीडब्ल्यू का फाउंडेशन चैनल है ना बच्चे वहां पे होती है ठीक है तो वो अभी स्टार्ट होगी तो वहां पे भी आप हिंदी इंग्लिश मिला के पढ़ सकते हो ठीक है उसमें हिंदी ज्यादा रहता है थोड़ा सा सो दिस इज अ चैनल जो कि प्योर इंग्लिश पे है एंड दैट इज वाई वी आर डूइंग इट इन प्योर इंग्लिश ठीक है तो वहां पर भी अभी आएगी तो आप वहां पर कर सकते हो ठीक है देवांश बेटा जितना तुम स्पैम कर रहे हो उतनी देर में अगर तुम डाउट लिख देते ना मैं खड़ा हुआ था तो देख ही लेता भाई इंस्टेड ऑफ स्पैनिंग वन थिंग कंटिन्यूसली यू कूड पोस्टेड योर डाउट राइट so colonization of america was underway by mid 16th century by dash so we already studied which were the countries that is spain and portugal so option number b is absolutely correct okay so 100% guys have given the correct answers okay chandran rekha aradhya diksha angel khushi very nice bachcho super yes my dear bachche all the students joining britain unified bachche britain british unification there is no certain date because britain बेसिकली वेन वी टॉक अबाउट यूनाइटेड किंगडम ऑफ ग्रेट ब्रिटेन ना देर वॉज नॉट अ कंट्री दैट वॉज यूनिफाइड जस्ट इमेजिन द फैक्ट ओके सो देर वर मल्टीपल आईलैंड दैट वर ज्वाइन टूगेदर टू फॉर्म दिस यूनियन दैट इज यूनाइटेड किंगडम ऑफ ग्रेट ब्रिटेन स्कॉटलैंड वॉज एडेड इन सेवनटीन जीरो सेवन आयरलैंड वॉज एडेड इन एटीन जीरो वन सो देर इज नो फिक्स डेट राइट सो दीज आर द मल्टीपल डेट्स आर देर अकॉर्डिंग टू द डिफरेंट आईलैंड द वे दे वर ज्वाइन इट कैप्ट ऑन चेंजिंग राइट सो आयरलैंड वॉज लास्ट ज्वाइन इन एटीन जीरो वन फाइन so that is why the case of britain is very different we have already covered this in the chapter nationalism in europe okay so my dear bachcho let's come to the okay the age of industrialization is not coming in your syllabus of uh, this thing board examinations 
So students watching from south can definitely join the class. That is why we have kept in a language that is comfortable with most of the students. Okay. So because there are many people who join from east parts of India, northeast parts of India, south, southern parts of India, right? So it's a session purely designed for all those students who find it difficult to understand Hindi. So they are more comfortable in their local language or English as a common language, right? So this is to help out all such students. So yes, you can join, bacho. So we have already covered most of the syllabus. We'll be, we are now come down to the last, last, last chapter of history that is print culture and the modern world. Because history is very vast, okay? History is very vast. It's very lengthy. So you can talk about these three to four chapters of history are equivalent to a lot many chapters from geography. So geography is comparatively, you know, it will like glide as fast as it can. Right. But history is little bit lengthy. Okay. Now we have come to the lengthiest chapter of the entire history syllabus and that is print culture and the modern world. So this chapter is lengthy because we have nine subtopics in this. However, I'll try to go very smoothly with this chapter. Okay. Now there's one problem. Let me get the AC on because there's a lot of heat inside the studios. So you can take a water break, Hana. You can take a water break, drink water and then let's start with print culture. Okay. AC on. Garmi or AC on. And uh, my kick was a color now. Okay, uh, so I just went to change my microphone because again the battery gets drained out. We have already been studying for so long hours. Okay, so I guess you must have, you know, had your water break and with this I am back. Bitta, this is not the doubt. Na. You have to type the doubt here. How does the tension between national pride and the push for European unity impact the effectiveness of collaborative efforts and decision making within the European Union? But see, my dear, uh, I guess the doubt is very much, uh, number one, first of all, not very much related to the syllabus because we don't have this topic. So I would also request you further to, you know, uh, help me out with your board because there, if you are from any particular state board, you know, so definitely the doubt will be very much different. Okay. So, if you talk about, but say, collaborative efforts, uh, now, uh, if I talk about in geopolitics terms, and I'll just clear a very simple thing. Number one, according to CBSC, <laughs> the doubt is not there, but still I'll clear for you. So, if I talk about in general geopolitical terms, if I talk about in normal geopolitical terms, you must have seen that in the recent times, there are many countries who have backed out from the European Union. Okay. They are many countries. Recently, we saw that. You have a few examples if you come across. So, there are many countries who backed out from the EU or the European Union. The reason is the internal tussles. Okay. The internal tussles. Now, if your question is the tension between the national pride and the push for European unity. So, if you talk about European Union is one such organization that aims for making the, you know, multiple things smooth across the different members, right? Let's suppose if you talk about uh, if certain country is a member of the European Union, then it's very smooth to use euros in there, right? All the, the different uh, kinds of implementations that will be done, that will be very common to all the member nations. But the point is key, this also takes back some or the other, you can say that, in, uh, you can say that individuality of a country or you can also say that at times these, uh, the decisions that are very uniform may hamper the individual policies of a country. As a result of that, you can see that there are some countries who have tried to pull out of the European Union. Okay. So, no doubt, again, this depends upon country to country, depending upon their, what is the current structure, okay, and what is the current needs of the country. So, somewhere or the other, if you see that, the decision making will get hampered, no doubt about that, because EU works in a collaborative manner, EU works in a way that, uh, you can, it can frame more uniform laws for the entire member nations. So, definitely, if there is a rift between EU and one of the member nations, the decision making will be impacted, but again, 
individuality is also something that needs to be respected, right? So, as a result, you see that uh, if we say that in the case of Britain only, there were feud with respect to the EUs, right? There were few more countries who had some relations, you know, not in very good synchronizations with the EU. So, again, it depends with country to country depending upon their conditions also that how it goes on well, right? So, definitely it hampers the, it hampers the overall process within an organization, but again, it's also a mark of individuality you can say for the particular nation right so with respect to geopolitics you can understand in this way okay so i hope this makes it clear i hope this gets you a little bit of answer okay so again again i said that this is with respect to the geopolitics the type of political situations that are happening in the different worlds okay chali Priya Bita, already I have explained British unification in detail in chapter 1 when I was teaching. So, a humble request, you can just go back there and you can just watch the video. I have already told this. So, it is very simple uh, and that I have explained in proper detail. So, you, know, you can just little bit go back and understand the same thing if you have joined late, right? Or once the chapter ends, then also you can uh, like move ahead. Okay. Now, people are saying that here comes the worst chapter. But say, this is not the worst chapter. This is the lengthiest chapter. It's the only difference that this is the lengthiest chapter, not the worst chapter. Okay. Uh, people have started asking, sir, British unification. The, see, I have always, always told you that the unification of Britain is very different. Reason is why. I'll tell you why. So, basically, when you talk about countries like Britain, so, they were not basically one united country. They were like islands. They are called as British Isles. There was England. Okay, the people spoke English language. They had their culture. Then there was Scotland. People spoke Scottish language. They had their own culture. Then there was Ireland. People spoke Irish language. They had their own culture. There was Wales. So, these were like multiple groups of islands, you can say. Out of this, the most powerful was England. Okay, because of the trade, it had got a lot of money, a lot of power. So, England decided to form a combined kingdom, uniting all these islands together. Okay, that was against their wish. Okay, so number one, the English parliament, it first of all took the power from the monarchy, okay, into his, their hands. Then it made an act or an agreement with Scotland called as Act of Union in 1707, which combined Scotland with England. And that led to the formation of United Kingdom of Great Britain. Now, further they moved towards Ireland. Now, in Ireland, there was a lot of problem because Ireland was divided into two Christian groups, Catholics and Protestants. And if you talk about England, they were mostly the guys who followed Protestants. Okay, so they supported the Protestant group in Ireland. As a result, the Catholics got defeated. And Ireland also was forcefully joined into the United Kingdom in 1801. And this is how we can say that the kingdom got expanded. Over the next period of years, there were many more smaller islands or smaller states that were incorporated into this United Kingdom. But the two major events were number one act of union and the second one is this Irish incorporation. Okay. And after that, English people, they started forcing their dominance on both of them. Like for example, promoting the English language, only talking about their culture. So these were few of the things that we can note in the British unification. I hope this makes it clear. I hope this makes it clear, right? Now, let's start with the very, very, very awaited chapter. Uh, people call it to be the worst chapter, okay? Or the chapter that is very lengthy with respect to history. How long will the class go, guys? So, almost I am going to end the uh, history wala part. So, after that, definitely we have the geography which is not that much lengthy compared to history. That will go much faster, okay? So, let's start about, let's start the chapter print culture and the modern world okay okay but important topics in history and geography samir i have already will be covering that in guaranteed pass wala so batch aapka rahe bhi free of cost so we'll be covering in that okay so uh, very simple i am teaching in a flow bache so for all the lovely people so that you revise the entire syllabus in one shot class so, humble request, request to please focus on the class beta. If I'll stop this teaching and I'll start doing something else, that will be a distraction for everyone. Right? Okay. So, let's move further. 
so we know that print has become a very important part of our modern society that's very uh, easy isn't it so we have lot of books we are surrounded by lot of books today we have digital books we have e books and apart from that if you see we have our ncert kitabe yani ncert books right so there are multiple books that we are all surrounded by so can you imagine this world before the invention of printing press no doubt books existed even before the invention of printing press but they were very much uh, fragile very weak you can say and very you know difficult to handle so that was the biggest problem with those particular books okay now let's talk about further so before the invention of the printing press the writing of the books was done manually you can say that there were people who had very beautiful writing they did calligraphy they beautifully copied the text so calligraphy is what the beautiful art of beautiful and stylish writing so calligraphy was very much common people used to write and copy the books in the beautiful handwriting right so hand printing if you talk about the earliest kind of print technology developed in three nations that is china japan and korea china is said to be the pioneer of the printing technology right we also know that the paper was also invented in china okay so these are two important uh, things to note down number one the earliest kind of print technology was developed in china japan and korea and the second is the paper was also developed in china okay now let's talk about so early earliest print technology was developed in china japan and korea okay now what happened what was the kind of printing technology in china in china we used to print uh, used to use the woodblock printing technology now what is this woodblock printing technology so have you ever seen that mehendri designs i mean girls can relate that better so whenever we have festivities in india girls they love to put mehendi on their hands isn't it on their hands and palms so have you seen that at times when you go to that mehendi wale bhaiya he has a wood block a block uh, thing carved out of stone right and uh, that there are some designs made into that wood block he dips that wood block into mehndi and then pushes on your hand isn't it so similar kind of technology you can imagine in the case of china so there were wood blocks that were you know engraved with the letters of the chinese alphabet and then they were dipped were in ink and then they were pressed across the sheets of the paper since sheets were very thin very light sheets of paper were there so both the sides could not be printed okay so what they used to do was print on the one side and they used to attach five or six sheets of paper together and hence this type of book was called as the accordion book okay now there is a very important question that you uh, if you talk about china now there is a very very important question with respect to china in china it is said that the imperial state that is the government of china was for a very long period of time the producer of the printed material now we all must have heard about we all must have heard about uh, the ias ips exams in india okay you remember bachcho there is a dialogue in one of the web series in india uh, i don't remember that web series in which we have this character called munna bhaiya he says that bhaiya padhai padhai karo ias ias bano so this ias or the civil services exams in india is done to recruit the civil servants isn't it right so in china also they had such a kind of system in order to recruit the civil servants for this an exam was organized now definitely we have to appear for exam you'll have to prepare for the exam so books were produced in large numbers and the entire cost of producing the books were borne by the chinese government okay so that is why we say that for a long period of time the chinese authority was a great producer of the printed material now what happened gradually in 17th century urban culture started blooming in china that means urbanization started in china and people now started using printed books for various other purposes for example the merchants and traders they used to record their trade information people used to study books in the free time it became a leisure activity like women were studying about different different you can say that topics even some rich women they had a lot of time they started printing about their lives so there was a multitude of literature you can say available in the chinese markets now in late 19th century when the western powers started establishing their trading post in china they started coming to china they brought along with themselves a lot of modern technology okay so when these european powers they came to china in 19th century they also brought with them the latest technology the latest printing technology okay and we see that shanghai there is a city in china called as shanghai so that became the center of the new print culture why because there are a lot of western style schools that were opened in china or oh, especially in shanghai and since in schools there will be students and students will be requiring the books so books were printed in large numbers as a result we say that shanghai became the hub of the new print culture now let's travel to japan if you talk about japan around 768 to 770 ad the buddhist missionaries who are the buddhist missionaries the people who are preaching and promoting buddhism so the buddhist missionaries introduced the 
technology of printing from China into Japan. The Buddhist Diamond Sutra was the oldest printed book that was printed back in AD 868, right? And from then on, interesting practices started to develop in Japan, right? Now, so what happened? So, who brought the print in Japan? The Buddhist missionaries brought along with them from China. The oldest printed Japanese book was the Diamond Sutra. If you talk about Japan, the entire libraries were full of the multiple kinds of articles and books. In Japan, there was an interesting culture you, uh, that is to be noted. And that was the printing of the different kind of images. So, when the Japanese guys, they learned to print the woodblock printing, they used it to print different kind of images, okay, different kind of pictures. And you can see that even the urban culture of China was very well presented in the paintings, right? So, in fact, there is a very wonderful art form called ukiyo that was also developed in Japan, right? So, ukiyo was developed in Japan. So, multiple uh, topics you can say were there in the printed books of Japan. So, this is how we can say that the print flourished in Japan. Now, let's come to the topic that how did the print reach Europe? Now, that is interesting to know. How did the print reach Europe? See what happened in 11th century. The Chinese paper reached Europe through the silk routes, the same route through which the Chinese silk and the other materials used to reach Europe. Okay, so what happened in 1295, Marco Polo, he was a great explorer. So he had lived for several years in China. So he returned back to Italy from China and he brought along with himself the knowledge to publish the books. That is the woodblock printing technology. So who was Marco Polo? He was an Italian explorer who had lived in China for long years. He learned the art of printing and when he came back to Italy, he brought along with himself the great knowledge. Now, Italians started producing book books with the help of wood blocks. Soon, the technology started spreading to the other parts of Europe as well. Now, as the demands of the books started increasing, the booksellers all over the Europe, they started to export the books. Okay, definitely, it's very much uh, clear, but if you are a bookseller, right, if you are someone who is, you know, selling the books, then it's very simple that you will like to earn the profits, isn't it? Everyone likes to earn the profits. Now, how will you earn the profits? By selling more. So, as the demand in Europe increased, these booksellers, they started selling the books, not only in their country, but also in the other countries, in order to make huge profits. Now, the point is, before the coming of the print, most of the books are manually written. That is, they were called as handwritten manuscripts. But the problem was, these manuscripts were not easy to produce. Second is, they could not in, uh, fulfill the ever-increasing demand. Why? What was the reason? The question comes here, the limitations of manuscripts. Number one, the copying. Copying from a main book was a very expensive and a time-taking process. Also, it was a very hard-working process. Okay. Second, the manuscripts were very fragile. They were very weak, very awkward to handle. It was very difficult to carry the manuscripts and move around. Now, what happened? In 1430s, so basically, what we learned from here was that demand was increasing continuously in Europe. The manuscripts, no doubt their production was increased, but still these manuscripts could not fulfill the growing demand. So, definitely there was a new need of a much faster technology to fulfill the ever-growing demand of the books. And here comes the breakthrough. Since 1430, there was a man called as Johannes Gutenberg. So, he developed the world's first printing press in Strasbourg, Germany. So, this guy Gutenberg was an interesting personality. If you talk about, this person had, uh, you know, belonged from a good family. His father was again a businessman and trader. And also, he had big agricultural estate. That means, bada sa khet ta iske pas, right? And during his childhood, he had seen wine and olive presses. So, basically, olive is a fruit that you see on your pastas and pizzas. You remember that? The green color one or the black color one. Okay. And also, we use the oil of the olive, the olive oil, the very healthy one. So, if you see that, he had seen that how there were machineries to take out the extract, the oil from these olives or the, uh, to make the wine. So, he come and when he grew up, okay. So, when he grew up, so when you grew up, he became a great goldsmith. Goldsmith is a jeweler who is very much expert in making jewelry. So, what he does this. What he did, he combined both the knowledge, that is his knowledge of creating the jewellery and the knowledge of the olive and the wine presses, okay. And combining this knowledge, he created the world's first printing press. So, by 1448, Gutenberg printed, Gutenberg perfected his system, like Gutenberg improved his printing press. The first book that he printed was the Bible. So, can you imagine 180 copies of Bible produced in three years? You must be astonished. You must be thinking, sir, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. In three years, just 180 copies of the Bible. However, if you talk about the standards of those times, it was a faster rate of production. Okay. Now, so between 1450 and 1550, the printing presses were set up in most parts of the Europe. 
and gradually the printing of the book started to flourish okay now there's one point that is very much noticeable in this case see what happened here is the printed book especially if we talk about the bible the book that was printed by gutenberg's printing press was very much similar to the one written by hand so there's a question that comes at times did the printed books replace the manual labor the answer is no i'll tell you why if you have a careful look at the gutenberg's bible you will come to realize that his printed bible looks very much similar to the one written by hand even in gutenberg's bible there were spaces left for decorations and designs that were done manually that is by hand so you have the option to choose for the rich people they had the option to choose their school of painting as well as as well as the kind of designs they would like to have in their uh, this thing they would like to have in their uh, books right okay done so let's move further bachcho fada bach se okay so as we see that as we see that with the help of the printing press okay as the printing press is started to flourish is started to grow so with the help of the printing press what happened the book also were produced in the large numbers in the huge numbers right and we see that by the end of 16th century roughly roughly 200 million books were available in the market now so this shift that came from the hand printing to mechanical printing brought about the print revolution so why this called as a print revolution number one the technology change second important point bachcho the revolution had a great impact on the minds of the people when people started reading the books they became more open minded okay they became uh, more aware about the surroundings and we also see that it also led to several revolutions in the country okay now let's talk about a new reading public now that's very very interesting part to discuss okay a new reading public now what happened when people had the access to books it created a new culture of reading people started reading books now earlier the people who could not afford books see before the print revolution what happened the books could only be afforded by the rich guys who had money but after after the printed books what happened the books can be afforded by all those people who were able to read and write who were literate earlier what happened because the books were so costly that is why even the people who were literate cannot afford the book but after the print revolution the books became cheaper because they were produced in large numbers so people who now who earlier just used to listen to the books now started reading the books now even the book sellers or the book publishers were very much interested in promoting their books but there was a big problem now the problem was the literacy rates of the european countries still there were many countries who were not that much literate so publishers stay, took out a you know middle route so what they did was they had a plan so they decided why not to publish those stories into the books that are already very popular and this is what they did they started publishing those stories those folk tales those poetries into their books along with the images that people already knew and as a result they made good profits so people those who are not able to read the book they now started to listen to the books so this is how the oral and the printed culture got intermingled right now okay so printers began publishing popular ballads and folk tales okay now let's talk about the print and the dissents now what happened it is a very interesting uh, this thing okay so this is a very interesting point okay so there is again a very interesting point called as religious debates okay so i told you that the people who read the book they became aware about their rights now there is a big problem remember we started in the starting of the nationalism in europe chapter ki there was a big problem in europe and the problem was the church authority the people of the church especially the higher officials they were very much powerful and they used to charge money for literally everything every ritual that you are going to do they used to charge money for the same now what happened here was what happened here was uh that the church started getting corrupted okay the people of the church the officials of the church since they started getting money so they started leading uh, leading a life of luxury and at the cost of the common people so there was a guy called martin luther he was a religious reformer as well as a priest he was in germany he was studying about uh, the uh, christian uh, religion right so he found that the roman catholic church the catholic community within christianity was very much corrupt especially the higher officials so he started criticizing them and in order to criticize them he started publishing some research papers he published 95 theses criticizing the practices of the roman catholic 
church right now understand the point so what he did there was a church called uh, there's a place called wittenberg so there was a church there and especially the place where he was studying about christianity so he went there and pasted a copy of all his papers on the church door and asked the church authorities to debate him right asked the church authorities to debate him he also published the new translations of the bibles different chapters and the parts and when the people read them the people got provoked and that also led to the beginning of the protestant reformation movement so it's a movement which started to reform the corrupt practices of the christianity or the roman catholic church right so martin luther's writings are called to be one of the leading pioneers of the protestant reformation movement okay now so what we saw here is when people started reading the books their mind opened they opened up to new possibilities they opened up to new dimensions and they started questioning everything now they started to dissent dissent means when you don't agree with the established beliefs earlier the church used to fool people in the name of religion and people were very much illiterate they had no option but to accept the teachings and the beliefs of the church when people started getting educated when people started reading books they had their own views and ideas and this is very much prevalent in the case of menosho so let's try understanding by this example so menosho was a guy who used to work in the mill in italy he was a miller in italy so he started reading the books that is available in his locality so what he did see if you talk about bible so there is a chapter in bible called as genesis that talks about the creation of the world okay how this universe how this world was created by god what did the god do so when menosho read the bible when menosho read the books available in his uh, locality he formed a view of the creation of god that actually angered the roman catholic church that means he interpreted the message of bible he understood the message of bible in his own way and it was such a way that the church authorities got very much angry in those times if you go against the church then there was a proper court to punish you that is called as inquisition okay so if you went against the practices of the church so there was a proper court to punish you in those times okay and that was called as inquisition so this guy menosho was called up in inquisition and ultimately he was finally executed or killed so after that from 1558 the church began to maintain a complete list of all the books that spoke against the church right bachcho now let's move on further okay Fair enough. So this was the Martin Luther one part. So we have already discussed this. So Martin Luther also said that print is the ultimate of gift of God and the greatest one. This question also comes for one marks at times. Okay, so this is very important one, right? So we already discussed this parts. Let's move further. Now the reading mania. This is something that is very interesting to note, right? The reading mania. Now mania refers to some kind of craze. When you are crazy for some particular thing, that is called as mania. Okay. Now what happened? by the end of the 18th century in some parts of the europe the literacy rates increased and what was the reason behind this the reason is very simple the different sub groups in the christianity they started opening schools in the villages okay and as a result there were many farmers and artisans who started getting literate so as a result literacy rates in europe increased in many parts so what happened they start the people when they became literate they started demanding more and more books for example in england penny chaps books were carried by the peddlers known as chapmen now who are the peddlers peddlers are the guys who you know go into localities and sell some things out you must have seen some kind of people coming into a locality to sell multiple things like there are people who sell sabji okay sabji le lo sabji walas right the people who sell groceries have you heard them in your localities in your areas in your colonies they come in the morning aloo hai baigan hai tinda hai mooli hai gajar bhi hai halwa bana lo right so jhadu le lo jadu phool jadu you must have seen that these kinds of people they come in your locality they sell some things so these are called as peddlers right so people who sold the penny chap books they were called as the chapmen and they were called penny chap books because they were sold like a very at a very cheap cost just for a penny just like 1 rupees okay so in france again they were uh, some cheap quality books being sold that is called as bibliothèque bleu now this bibliothèque bleu they were low priced books at a very low cost and they were printed on a poor quality paper and covered with a low quality blue cover that is why they are called as bibliothèque bleu apart from that we see that there are multiple other types of literature that was pouring into the european society like the almanacs or the ritual calendars there are folk tales being published 
ballet is being published right so multiple kind of literature was pouring into the european society apart from that the ideas of the famous thinkers were being published the scientific discoveries of isaac newton were being published right the ideas of philosophers being published newspapers and journals carried the uh, common information from place to place so we see that the variety of print culture was not available now available in the european markets as well as the european society so these all kind of literature it actually helped in shaping the ideas and the minds of the people and making them to question each and everything without blindly accepting all the beliefs i hope this makes it clear bachcho now so this is a very interesting uh, you know this is a very interesting point here tremble therefore tyrants of the world tremble before the virtual writer now there was a french novelist called as louis sebastien mercier this guy was a true appreciator of the print culture he very much enjoyed reading the books so by mid 18th century there was a common conviction that books are a means to spread progress people started believing that if you start reading the books you will learn a lot of things you will gain a lot of knowledge and also that will help to bring about positive changes to the world for example louis sebastien mercier he was a french novelist he declared that print is the most powerful engine of progress if you want to pro make progress if you want to grow in the society then printed books are the perfect ones mercier said that tremble therefore tyrants of the world tremble before the virtual writer now what did mercier say so he believed that the people who will read the books they will understand that the current governments of the rulers are not good they are not giving them rights so definitely people will start revolting against such rulers and this will finally end the despotism despotism refers to a rule where the ruler is not at all worried about the demands of the people where the ruler is very much powerful so that kind of rule is called as despotic rule okay so mercy believe that people when they will read the books they will get enriched they will learn they will have knowledge and they will fight for their rights and finally their despotic rule will end so that's why he says that tremble therefore tyrants of the world tremble before the virtual writer done okay now let's there's a very very good question for five markers or three markers that print created the conditions within which the french revolution occurred the question is many historians say that it is because of the printed books that people in france got a lot of inspiration and they turned away against their own king or the royalty so there is a very important line that print culture created the conditions within which the french revolution occurred and that is a perfect line i'll tell you why number 1 print popularized the ideas of the enlightenment thinkers enlightenment thinkers like jean jacques rousseau charles montes they started publishing their books in which they criticized the monarchy they criticized the social order of france and then they also made the people aware the common people aware about their rights so this instilled in the minds of the common people a, a spirit of questioning a spirit of questioning and a power of questioning the authorities earlier they used to blindly follow whatever the king used to say but now they started questioning the authorities now by if you see that print created a culture of dialogue and debate the people who were earlier not ready to you know they were very much afraid to discuss anything they were very much afraid to go against the rulers against the kings now they got the courage to protest they got the courage to fight so they got the courage to discuss and debate the political matters so this is what the print created by 1780s we see that the entire french society was filled with a literature that mocked the royalty that means there are multiple pictures and cartoons being released in the french markets that made fun of the uh, you know french monarchy it showed that the french monarchy and the nobility is enjoying their life and the common people are suffering here the common people are suffering here and this is what made the people of france all the more hostile towards the french monarchy and the nobility so people started feeling hatred towards the king right now however if we see that bachcho all the kinds of uh, printed material was available in the market if there were the ideas of philosophers and thinkers there were also books being printed by the church and the different authorities to make their image clean so people had the option of reading both the types of literature so they accepted few they rejected few but all the more print culture opened the possibility of thinking debating and discussing right so these are the pointers you can mention in this particular question now that's a beautiful question here bachcho now Let's talk about the 19th century, and then we'll come to India and the world of print. Okay, so this question, chapter is also going to finish pretty cool. Okay, so let's come to the 19th century, right? So here we'll discuss about three important pointers. If you want to do some yoga, you can do. Like my neck is paining right now at the moment, so I'll do some yoga like this, like this, and it's all good to go. Okay, so the 19th century, guys, the 19th century. Now, what does this tell? 
So here we'll read about the importance of the printed books with respect to the children, women and workers. Okay. Now, so what happened? Children, uh, when primary education became compulsory in most of the European countries, then children became the important readers. Likewise, you are the children. You are an important readers. Now, that is a different point that you don't reopen your NCRT books throughout the year. And then towards the last, you are waiting for some shortcut solutions. Oh, that's a, you know, plight of every student life. I can relate to it, right? We don't open our books throughout the years. We are like, okay, bro, bro let's chill. It's still a lot of days are left in the exams. Then again, let's chill. And when finally the exam is overhead, you'll be like, sir, tell me something where to study, sir. Shortcut, sir. Sir, most important question, sir. Sir, which topics are going to be asked in the exam, sir? Sir, can you get the CBSE paper for us? <laughs> I've even seen these type of comments here. It's lovely, it's cute, but no doubt, but it's scary at the same time. Because again, throughout the year, no, no, there's a big year. And we all are lazy guys. We agree with this. And we all are lazy people. So every student can relate this. Even when I was a student, somewhere or the other, I can also relate to you. Isn't it? It's very, very common. Right? Let's move further. Yes. But I have already discussed that question, Ayush. If you are paying attention to the session, you would have already gone through this. Okay. Okay. But uh, both the sessions are good. Morning session is also good. Top 100 is also good. Top 100, we have tried to prepare for the most expected question. Morning session is with the revision for the PYQ. You can refer to both. You can see both in uh, the speed you wish. 1x or 2x. Okay. So, uh, let me ask you a question. Yaar. Uh, now, coffee time ho gaya. I haven't asked you a question. So, let me ask you a question from this chapter. Okay. Let's have a question. Let's have a poll. My dear bachcho, let's have a poll. Okay. So, the poll is simple. From Dash, the church maintained an index of, index means list, an index of prohibited books. Four options. Fourteen fifty eight, fifteen fifty eight, sixteen fifty eight, seventeen fifty eight. So four options we guys have got. Okay, so you have to just tell me that from dash the church started to maintain a Index. Index means a list of prohibited books. Done? Very nice, guys. Very, very nice. Deepak is saying, hi, sir. Am I late? But the European countries, entire Europe will not conquer America, my dear Priyanshu. So, Spanish and uh, Spain and Portugal, it conquered America. So, we already discussed in making of global world. You can check out from that. Europe is a continent, my dear. It will have multiple countries. Okay. Beta Krishna, Hindi wala channel nahi hai bache. Hindi wala jo Hindi English mix channel chalta hai. Matlab jo class chalta hai, wo chalta hai PW Foundation channel pe. To us pe abhi hum log marathon karenge. This is for all the students who don't understand Hindi. Jinka Hindi nahi samaj aavat hai. To unka liye hum angreji mein jo hai yaha bataavat hai. Thik hai? So that is the channel that is PW English. Is mein hum u bachcha log ko bhi padha rahe hai jinka Hindi thoda kamzor hai. ठीक है तो जिनको इंग्लिश ज्यादा अच्छे समझ में आता है हम लोग उनके लिए वाला मैराथन कर रहे हैं तो आप हिंदी वाले बच्चों के लिए भी भैया मैराथन अभी आएगा बच्चे है ना तो उसमें भी हम लोग मैराथन करेंगे वहां पे एकदम बढ़िया से राइट समझे बालक प्यारे बालक ओके सो क्वेश्चंस वेरी सिंपल ऑप्शन नंबर बी इज करेक्ट दैट इज 1558 एंड हियर वी गो 91% गाइस हैव गिवन द करेक्ट आंसर क्रिको फ्लिक्स विमल शर्मा रेगी आर चंद्रन ओके श्रीयांशी रेणुका शायानी very nice, Diksha, Warrior, Kanishk, Priya and we have Sia with us. Very nice, but very, very nice. You guys are doing amazing, super. Okay. Now, let's quickly talk about the 19th century. Let's talk about the 19th century. Okay. Hi, Anurag. Okay. Now, so what happened? In 1857, in France, a children's press was started that started publishing literature purely for the children. Okay. 
then apart from that we see that they were uh, green brothers so green brothers okay they published a collection of the fairy tales in 1812 so remember them green brothers they published a collection of the fairy tales in 1812 for the children apart from that women also became the important readers as well as writers okay penny magazines were started especially for the women to teach them proper behavior how to manage the household in fact in fact if we see that in 19th century so there were many famous women novelists as well for example george eliot jane austen brown sisters so they started highlighting women in a more positive way right in 19th century lending libraries or the public libraries in england started and they became a very fine medium for educating the white collar workers that means the guys who are working in the offices for the different workers working in the factories and the middle class people right so we see that whenever these guys got time off from their offices they started to use that time for self educating and self improvement so there were public libraries which were set up where they can go and completely educate themselves by reading the different books okay further innovations so if we see that by mid 19th century there was a guy called richard m ho he perfected the power driven cylindrical presses that was used to publish the newspapers then further in late 19th century colored printing started so there was a press printing press called as colored printing press or offset press that published lagbhag uh, you can say that six colors at one point of time okay by 20th century the printing presses operated by electricity also started to enter the european markets now so we see that as the print culture you know bloomed as the printed books bloomed as more and more people started reading the books so we see that the production of the books also increased the printing technology also increased as well as we see that the amount of innovations okay they started coming into the markets okay during the time of the great depression the publishers were very smart first they had a fear that the people may stop buying the books because of the lack of money so what they did was you whenever you purchase a book you must have seen that a good book a costly book is a hard cover over it okay so whereas a very cheap book will have a paper cover over it so what they did was they replaced the hard cover with a paper cover and so that people can easily afford such kind of books and they may also not face the losses okay done so with this the european part comes to an end and we'll come to the next part of the topic that is the india and the world of print so this is a very small chapter left so i have tried to bring mind maps so that we can cover the entire sst syllabus through these small pointers but in detail right so i am already explaining you so listen to the explanation the short notes i have made it uh, for you so that you can refer to them easily revise through them right now india and the world of print see if you talk about india for india literature was not a new thing because in india manuscripts have been into practice you know since ancient times so since ancient times literature was being written into the manuscripts that is the handwritten books okay so they were in various language like for example sanskrit arabic persian and the local languages okay so in india the manuscripts were either written on the handmade paper or on the palm leaves the palm leaves are the big leaves right if you talk about in india there is a very interesting practice in bengal uh, there was an entire education system and we say that the bengali students they got uh, their education without even touching a single book because you know what happened their teachers they used to dictate out the text they used to write, write it down in their copy or the this thing manuscripts and this is how those students got literate so that was an interesting system prevalent, prevalent in bengal now let's talk about printing press come to india in mid 16th century the first printing press was introduced by the portuguese missionaries so they were those people from portugal who had come to india to preach or tell about christianity so they landed in goa and they brought themselves with themselves the latest printing technology okay so portuguese were the first one to introduce the printing press in 1674 about 50 books were printed in konkani and kannada languages in cochin the catholic priest they printed the first tamil book they also printed the first malayalam book by 1710 the dutch people the people from the netherlands the protestant missionaries they printed 32 books in the tamil language in from 1780 there was a british person called as james augustus hickey he started editing a commercial newspaper called bengal gazette in which he published the commercial advertisements as well as he criticized the different gossips of the english east india company right now however in those times the governor general was lord warren hastings he called this guy called james augustus hickey because this person was publishing the gossip of the officers of the east india company into his paper and that was very much derogatory for them 
so that made them a laughing stock of the town and also gave an opportunity to their criticizers sitting back in England. So that is the reason he was called and you know, you can say that punished by Warren Hastings. Now there was again a very close friend of uh, this thing, Ram Mohan Roy, Raja Ram Mohan Roy called his Gangadhar Bhattacharya. He also brought out a weekly newspaper named Bengal Gazette, right? Now, so this was a time period when intense debates were uh, being carried out in the entire Indian, uh, you can say that scenario, over the different religious and political matters. And when the printed books became available in the Indian markets, it gave the opportunity to the religious reformers in India to publish their thoughts in the books and spread it across the people. Now, from early 19th century, there were intense debates on the religious issues. Now, for example, the different groups, okay, they now got the opportunity to write with respect to the various religious matters. For example, Sati system, some were, some people were in favor of Sati system, some were against it. Then we can talk about idol worship, the worship of the statues. Then talking about following the uh, following of single God or one God, belief in one God. So there were multiple religious issues that were being discussed in the Indian society. Now, for example, in 1821, Raja Ram on Roy published Sambad Kaumudi. Okay, so Sambad Kaumudi basically was a book which highlighted the problems of the Hindu widows, means the females whose husbands have now died and most of them they had to face the sati pratha the sati system in which the women was asked to sit on the burning uh, pyre of the uh, or burning body of the husband and you know to commit a suicide and that was a very wrong practice right so however some people advocated for this practice while some opposed it so raja ram Mohan roy had uh, discussed the problems of the widows in sambat comedy to oppose his ideas hindu mahasabha started samachar chandrika in the same year, there were two Persian newspapers that came, that is Shamshule Akbar and Jame Jahanama. Apart from that, a Gujarati newspaper, Bombay Samachar, was also published in the same year, right? Now, in 1810, we see that the first printed edition of Ram Charit Manas by Tulsi Darji was published in Calcutta. So, what we see that there was a variety of religious books, a variety of books uh, uh, based on the discussion on the religious and political matters that was now available in the Indian markets. Done. Now, so if you see that as the Indian market was growing, as the people in India were becoming more and more interested in reading books, so we see that the variety of literature also got diversified in India. Now, people earlier were very much interested in the religious texts, in the religious books or the political books, but also there were people who wanted to see their life history and experiences in the book. Remember, we talked about novelist in Europe. So, novel is a type of literature where which is based on the life of a common person. Okay, relating to their experiences, basically some, something that happens in your day-to-day -day life. So, that experience is stored in a novel. Now, if you talk about novel, a literary form which developed in Europe, so when it reached India, it adopted to the Indian styles. It started telling about the Indian stories and people could very much relate themselves to the novels, right? Apart from that, uh, other literature like short stories, essays about social political matters, they also became very much popular in India. Okay, then we see that as this culture of printing increased, so people started printing certain images, okay, certain images and pictures. Like Raja Ravi Verma produced lot of images for mass circulation. Apart from that, calendars started coming in the markets, posters started coming in the markets. Now, these were easy mediums even for the poor people to take, to buy and decorate their houses. Have you seen calendars on which dates are mentioned? Nowadays, we use virtual calendars, isn't it? So, but earlier we got the printed calendars in which dates are mentioned. Even if you to go today in the small towns of the country, even today this calendar culture is very common. You might have seen calendars hanging in the shops, hanging in their own houses. So, they became a cheap medium for even the poor people to decorate their houses. Okay, so such kind of visual culture was very much popular in India. Now, so moving further, if you talk about the case of women and print. So, let's have a, let's, uh, let's try to understand what kind of impact the print technology or the print culture had in case of Indian women, in case of Indian poor people and in case of the workers. Okay, so if we talk about liberal husbands who had a wide, you can say that who were quite uh, open to, you know, modern thinking, though they started educating their women at their home. Some conservative Hindus believe that if a girl gets educated, she will get widowed, her husband will die. Even some conservative Muslims also felt that if a girl is educated, then what is going to happen? She will get corrupted by using Urdu, by reading Urdu romantic novels. So, there were conservative Hindus and Muslim families that were not at all in favor of women education. However, if you see that, we have few examples where the women defied the society's norms and got themselves educated. 
as there is a case of a Muslim woman who wanted to learn Urdu, but her family was forcing her to learn Arabic. Okay, then we have the case of Ras Sundari Devi. She was a young girl married in Bengal who learnt to read and write in the secrecy of her kitchen. Secretly, where the kitchen is there, where she used to cook food. She used to educate herself as well. She has written an autobiography named uh, Amar Jeevan that was published in 1876. So, this is again important. Kalash Vashni Devi, another Bengali woman wrote about the women's experience in their houses. How much hard labor the women have to perform. How they are restrained within their own houses. So, all the experiences of women uh, is being represented by Kalash Vashni Devi in her books. Apart from that, we see Tara Bhai Shinde and Pandita Rama Bhai. They wrote about the miserable life of the upper caste Hindu women. Especially the widows whose husbands have died. What are the kinds of pain they have to go through? What are the kinds of things they have to suffer? So, that is very well presented by Tara Bhai Shinde and Pandita Rama Bhai. We talk about Hindi literature. Hindi literature also become, started becoming popular from 1870s. Most of this literature was uh, for the you know education of the women, talking about their different matters, discussing their different problems. Right in Punjabs also the books were published for women. For example, Ram Chadda, there was a person he published a book called Istri Dharam Vichar, in which he uh, basically taught the women how to be obedient wives. Okay, so Ram Chadda's book Istri Dharam Vichar was moreover focused on women telling uh, telling women how to become obedient wives, how to follow your husband's command. So, similarly, similar kind of theme was also published by Khalsa Tract. So, these were the multiple kinds of books we see that were published in the Indian markets. In Bengal, if you talk about, there was a, a place called as Batla. Okay, it's in central Calcutta. So, there was a place called as Batla. So, this entire region was developed for the publishing of the books only. You won't believe guys, even those books that were very much scandalous, the books that were very much, you know, obscene, vulgar books that had vulgar content, that nowadays people search on the Google and uh, you know websites. So that kind of vulgar content was also available in Batla market. Okay. So this is the kind of Indian print we can talk about. Okay. Now let's talk about how did the print uh, impact the poor people. Now if you talk about in 19th century, the cheap books were cheap and small books were easily available in the markets. For example, if you talk about Madras, in Madras, uh, the small books, cheap books, affordable books were sol sold in the different parts of the market. So, people who are coming to the markets can buy these books, right? Now, apart from that, from the late 19th century, a lot of people started writing about caste discrimination. For example, Jyotiba Phule, she was a, uh, he is a very famous Maratha pioneer who uh, supported the low caste protest movements. So, he has written about his, the caste discrimination in his book, Gulam Giri, published in 1871. Apart from this, B.R. Ambedkar, Bache B.R. Ambedkar and E.V. Ramaswamy Naikar, right, whom we also called as Periyar Ramaswamy. So, they have also openly criticized in their literature about the injustices of the caste system, that how caste system is bad and how the people are suffering because of that. In fact, if we talk about the mill workers also started writing about their experiences. Like, for example, Kashi Baba. He was a mill worker working in a mill of Kanpur. He wrote about the caste and the class discrimination in his book called as Chote or Bade Ka Sawal. Right. Especially he talked about the difference between upper class and lower class people. The one in working in the factories. The kind of experiences they are having. Right. So, there was another mill worker who wrote under the name of Sudarshan Chakra. Right. So, he wrote many poems. So, all these poems were compiled in a combined work called as Sachi Kavitaen. In fact, if you see that by 1930s, even the uh, cotton mill workers of Bangalore also set up the libraries for educating themselves. Earlier, the same thing was done by the Bombay mill workers. So, they had opened up these libraries to educate themselves. Now, you must be wondering that where did they get the fund from? Where did they get the money from? So, basically, these types of public libraries were generally set up by the rich people because it was a way for them to show their richness, to show their kindness, you know. To make them to make the people feel that yeah they are doing a, some great job for the society so it was a way for them to earn the respect but it benefited the workers and the poor people a lot to educate themselves to benefit themselves right now let's talk about the last topic of this chapter that is print and the censorship see it's very easy to understand it's a very important topic as well because we have the question from vernacular press act okay now so, before 1798, the British government under East India Company was not interested in looking into the Indian newspapers or Indian books. Okay, because it was more bothered with the Britishers who were uh, basically publishing against East India Company, like James Augusta Siki. Because what happened if these books got viral in England, then people will get chance to criticize East India Company. So, that is why moreover the control was on British publishers, not on the Indian ones. 
However, in 1820, the Calcutta Supreme Court it passed a law that controlled the freedom of the press. Now, after that, we see that in 1835, when William Bentick became the Governor General of country, okay, then he removed these restrictions. And further, Thomas Macaulay also started some rules and regulations that restored back the freedom of the press and the media. Okay, but there were turn of events again. In 1857, we all know that there was a great revolt against the British that shook the British Empire. Okay, so this is one of the causes why the Britishers' attitude towards the freedom of press change. Britishers started to realize that there are many newspapers in the local languages that are criticizing the British and their rule. And if they are not stopped, then the people will again rise in revolt against the British. So what they did was they introduced an act in 1878 called as the Vernacular Press Act. Okay, so this was modeled on the Irish press laws. So what was this Vernacular Press Act? Vernacular means the local language. Every person has a local language. Someone, some might be speaking Kannada language, some might be speaking Tamil, some might be speaking Malayalam, some might be speaking Hindi. So everyone has its local languages, right? And if you want to connect to someone, it's better to speak in the local language, isn't it? So this was the case here. So what did the Britishers do? They now started monitoring all the reports being published in the local newspapers. They made it sure that none of the reports are against the British empires. If they found such reports being published, First, they warned the newspaper to not do the uh, same again. If the newspaper did not listen, then that was banned. And apart from that, all their machinery was also captured by the Britishers. So, this was basically the Britishers Vernacular Press Act. Right. However, even after this, we see that a lot of newspapers, nationalist newspapers started growing in the entire country. Take the example of Bal Gangadhar Tilak. There, there were two newspapers that he brought out. One is Maratha and one is Kesari. So, basically, when the after the... When revolutionaries in Punjab were very badly treated by the Britishers, he wrote about this in his paper Maratha and Kesari. And uh, as a result, there was widespread protest in the different parts of the country. He was also arrested for this in 1908. But we see that, Bacho, with this, what do we understand? We understand a great history of the books, how these books, you know, they promoted and they motivated the people to come into revolution. How these books made the people aware about the different injustices that were happening to them. How do you, how these books basically taught the people to fight their rights. And this is what is print culture in the modern world all about. Okay. Now. So let's have a question here. Vernacular Press Act was modeled on or yeah, based on dash. British press laws Irish press laws African press laws, option D, none of these. Okay, so we have four options, guys. I'll release the polls for you, and we have four options. And here we go. So, Vernacular Press Act was modeled on Dash, British press laws, Irish press laws, African press laws, and none of these. Okay, done. Better GMT. Hindi mein class nahi hai. The reason is ka, the chapter again, the channel and the platform is PW English. So, again, this is for all the students who Hindi samaj nahi aata. Aapke Hindi wala jo marathon aega bita wo foundation channel pe aata hai. Vahaan pe join kar sakte hai. Chik hai? Sure, Noor, if still you study, then you can do it. Okay. Fine. Vernacular Press Act was modeled on Dash, British Press Laws, Irish Press Laws, African Press Laws, yeah, none of these. So, option B is very simple, that is Irish Press Laws. Option number B is correct. So, here we go, 87.88% percent bachche yahan pe sahi keh rahe hai, that's, they are saying correct. Vimal, Webhav, Toast Coat, Anime, Anime, Ankul Ajaya, we have Shreyanshi, Surpreet, Ishantika, Akhilesh and Itsakshi. Okay, so a lot, a lot of people here. 
सो बच्चो देर वॉज वन पर्सन वॉज आसिंग मी सर सिलेबस आज सारा हो जाएगा क्या बच्चे बिल्कुल हो जाएगा है ना सो इफ आई प्रोमिस यू समथिंग दैट आई बी कवरिंग द सिलेबस दैट मीन्स आई विल बी कवरिंग द सिलेबस ओके सो बच्चा बाडी वी हैव ऑलरेडी कवर्ड द हिस्ट्री वाला पार्ट ओके देन वी हैव टू डू जोग्राफी देन वी हैव पोलिटिकल साइंस वी हैव इकोनॉमिक्स सो लॉट्स एंड लॉट्स एंड लॉट्स एंड लॉट्स ऑफ थिंग्स आर लेफ्ट ओके ओ भाई ओके सो many of the students they are studying since uh, like since afternoon so many of them must be tired as well okay so what what shall we do is let's take a 10 minutes break okay let's take a 10 minutes break because we have three more subjects to do and i don't want you guys to be absolutely exhausted so if you want to go to uh, go to washroom just go and check out the washroom like you can just go there want to eat something refuel yourself you can refuel yourself so i am giving you 10 minutes break here after 10 minutes we'll continue back and again we'll start with the geography fair enough fair enough okay bhai aradhya so sorry my dear dil se sorry bachche hi aradhya ha bachche that's batla in bengal Bengal, you can say the Central Calcutta area. Okay. Ayan Kamal, bache the entire session is in English only, my dear. Okay, so we are already doing in English. How do you join? If you have joined just recently, my dear, bache. So the entire lecture we are doing in English only, my dear. I just uh, spoke Hindi to tell those people, those who were not aware that this is a pure English session. Okay. so let's take a quick uh, 10 minutes break so i'll give you 10 minutes break here okay and after 10 minutes let's come back to the platform and we'll start with the geography so definitely it's a huge syllabus it's a huge syllabus so it will take time okay but i'll make sure that we cover the entire syllabus in this one shot marathon itself okay so let's take 10 minutes break here and after 10 minutes we will start again so it's a 10 minutes break ठीक है, so whatever you want to do, you want to have a quick chit chat, you want to listen to a song, you want to eat something, it's hundred percent up to you. It's a ten minute break. After that, we'll again come back in the same platform. ठीक है, sure, fine बच्चों, fine बच्चा बाड़ी, okay, चलो. ओके okay. चलो बच्चों सो लेट्स स्टार्ट लेट्स मीट आफ्टर टेन मिनट्स विल कंटिन्यू विद द ज्योग्राफी देन ओके
चलो सो भाई आ जाओ वापस जल्दी से देखो एक मिनट एक्स्ट्रा ही दे दिया तुम लोग को सो आ जाओ फटाफट से खा लिया कुछ खाना पीना खा लिया मैं प्यारे प्यारे बच्चों के सेशन कोई देख रहा था यहाँ पे और बहुत 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 सारे अच्छे अच्छे बच्चे मेरे को दिखे यहाँ पे बहुत सारे प्यारे बच्चे दिखे चलिए तो भाई लोग चलो बच्चा बाड़ी स्टार्ट करते हैं दोबारा से आ जाओ जल्दी वापस आ जाओ बड़ा बच्चे भाई बहुत काम बाकी है बहुत काम बाकी है बहुत सारा काम करना है बहुत सारी पढ़ाई करनी है बहुत सारी पढ़ाई हम कर चुके हैं और अब स्टार्ट करेंगे हम लोग ज्योग्राफी के साथ ठीक है बात समझ में आ गया यहां तक तो अब स्टार्ट करेंगे हम लोग कहां पे ज्योग्राफी के साथ तो जल्दी से आ जाओ फटाफट से आ जाओ तो मैं बच्चों के कई सारे प्यारे प्यारे कमेंट्स भी देख रहा था चलिए ओके सर ये कौन सा सीरीज है बच्चे दिस इज बेसिकली लाइक इट्स अ मैराथन गोइंग ऑन कंप्लीट सोशल साइंस मैराथन ऑन द चैनल पीडब्ल्यू इंग्लिश फॉर ऑल दो स्टूडेंट्स हु आर नॉट एबल टू अंडरस्टैंड हिंदी ओके सो जो बच्चे हिंदी नहीं पढ़ पाते समझ पाते ऐसे हमारे सारे बच्चों के लिए जो है प्योर इंग्लिश के अंदर दिस मैराथन इज गोइंग ऑन सो आई एम टीचिंग कंप्लीट एज एस टी कंप्लीट सोशल साइंस इन प्योर इंग्लिश बिकॉज दिस इज पी डब्ल्यू इंग्लिश अ चैनल मेड फॉर ऑल दो स्टूडेंट्स हु आर मोर कंफर्टेबल इन इंग्लिश लैंग्वेज दैन इन एनी अदर ओके सो आई होप एम आई मेक माई सेल्फ क्लियर ओके श्योर है फाइन श्योर है ओके जय श्री राम भाई डन ओके ना सो लेट्स बिगिन फास्ट बच्चे लेट्स बिगिन फास्ट है ना बिकॉज ऑलरेडी वी हैव ऑलरेडी ओके हाय देवेश आप कहां पर हो भी बच्चे आई एम इन द स्टूडियोज फ्रॉम वेयर आई टेक योर क्लासेस सो लेट्स बिगिन विथ समथिंग दैट इज कॉल्ड रिसोर्स एंड डेवलपमेंट ओके सो इन वेरी 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 सिंपल टर्म्स बच्चों वी ऑल नो दैट कि समथिंग दैट इज एबल टू सैटिस्फाई आर डिमांड्स आर नीड्स इज कॉल्ड एज एन रिसोर्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ आई एम फीलिंग थर्स्टी राइट इफ आई एम फीलिंग थर्स्टी आई कैन यूज द बॉटल विच इज देयर इन दिस बॉटल आई कैन यूज द बॉटल इज एंड इट so the water which is there in this particular bottle okay that will quench my thirst it's very simple that will quench my thirst so i can call this as a resource so when we talk about our environment there are multiple resources in our environment that we use to satisfy the human needs okay so this chapter is going to talk about all these resources we'll be talking about the types of soil we will be talking about the different kinds of uh, erosions so there is a whole lot to this chapter but again we will be cruising at a fair speed so that teach, uh, the students should understand also and also we can we are we are able to complete the syllabus as well okay now so let's start with the chapter that is resources and development now in simple terms what are resources resources is anything that is available in the environment that can be utilized to satisfy the human needs provided we should have the technology to access it again it should be economically feasible that means it should be affordable and third is it should be culturally acceptable that means it should benefit everyone it should not be the case that it is benefiting only a few people and harming the other people so it's very important to understand that resource is anything that is available in the environment that can be utilized to satisfy the human needs provided we should have the technology to access it it should be affordable very much feasible that means it should not be the case in order to extract a resource you have to pay a lot of amount because in that case it will not benefit anyone so it should be economically affordable feasible and culturally acceptable right so when we talk about the classification of resources we classify them on multiple basis number one for example on the basis of origin we classify them five them as biotic and abiotic biotic means the ones that have life like plants and animals and abiotic means the non living resources like solar power wind power right on the basis of exhaustibility we define them into renewable and non renewable renewable means the resources which can be recharged which if exhausted are easy to renew for example solar power water is a renewable resource right and non renewable are the resources which once exhausted or finished it will take lot of time to again regenerate them example the fossil fuels like coal and petroleum right on the basis of ownership we divide into individual community national international individual means the private resources like uh, you might be having your own house your own car that belongs to you isn't it okay and we talk about uh, community that means resources that belong to a group of people for example the public parks that belong to your locality all the burial grounds where people they you know they bury their dead bodies so these are community resources national technically everything that is available in the nation is, is a part of national resource right 
if you talk about international now there are some resources that are controlled by the international organizations and if you have to take out these resources you will have to take their permissions right for example india has got the permission to take out manganese from the indian ocean right okay now on the basis of status of development we have potential developed stock and reserves potential means they refers to the those resources that have the ability to be developed in huge quantities but so far we have not checked their quality and quantity that is why we are using them in limited amounts okay for example the parts of rajasthan gujarat they have great potential for development of solar and uh, solar and wind power right when we talk about developed resources basically those resources that we are already using their quality and quantity everything is identified right then if we talk about stock and reserves so basically uh, stock is something that we don't have the technology to use let's talk about uh, we know that water is a combination of hydrogen and oxygen if you can break down water into two separate gases then both can be used to produce energy but so far we don't have that advanced technology as a result we are not using it so that is an example of stock reserves are basically those resources that can be utilized with the help of existing technology but we are using them in very limited amounts the reason is we are trying to save them for our future generations example the case of hydroelectricity right India's 22 percent of power needs are met by hydroelectricity. So we have the technology, we have the hydropower plants, but we are using the hydroelectricity in very limited amount so that we can save it for the future coming generations, right? So these are few of the examples. Now let's move further. Now develop. Now we see that the resources are very important for human survival because if you need to have a good life, so we need to have resources, right? But the problem is because of our indiscriminate usage, some major problems have arisen. For example, you what happened, the people who are more powerful, they have more access to the resources, right? So because of accumulation of resources in few hands, it has divided the society. The guys, those who have the resources, they are rich people and those who don't have, they are poor people, right? Apart from that, some global ecological problems have emerged like the global warming, right? Like for example, ozone layer depletion, some environmental problems. So these are the various problems that have arisen because of indiscriminate or the irregulated use of resources. Now. So what is the solution? Solution is very simple that we should look into the equitable distribution of resources that everyone should get according to their needs, right? Proper resource planning and sustainable development. So what is sustainable development? It's a very good question. It's a very good topic. So sustainable development means when you do development, okay, without damaging the environment and also at the same times, you do not compromise with the needs of the generations that are about to come, okay? That is the future generations. So what you are doing is you are doing development in the present without damaging the environment and also taking care of the needs of the future generations that is called sustainable development. With the same objective, we also had an United Nations conference, okay, that is also popularly called as the International Earth Summit or also called as the Rio Convention that took place in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, 1992. And here all the countries, they signed on multiple declarations. They also signed on a declaration or a document called Agenda 21 where the whole objective was to fight multiple problems at the international level with the cooperation of the countries, okay? Uh, problems like poverty, problems like diseases, problems like environmental degradation. So these were the multiple problems that were discussed in this International Earth Summit. And countries, they signed multiple documents and they decided that they will achieve the sustainable development by 21st century, right? Okay, so let's talk about the resource planning. So the question is, why is resource planning very important? Now, this is the first and foremost question. Okay, let's talk about this is a three marks topic. So number one, why is resource planning important? See, the availability of resource is very much different in the different areas. If you talk about, very simple, if you talk about, if you talk about India itself, we see that in India, we have multiple mineral resources in the plateau region of the country. We have agriculture very much popular in the northern part of the country. Ladakh is rich in culture but lacking in other resources. Arunachal might be rich in the, uh, we can say water resources but it does not have infrastructure. So every part of the country we can see that has something and lacks in something. So as a result, a proper planning will help in the better implementation of resources and will benefit each and every part of the country. And each and every part of the states or the country will grow. Then overall, it is going to impact the progress of the country, right? So that is why resource planning is very, very important, right, Bacho? Now, so if you talk about resource planning in India, there are three components of it. This is a three marks question. What is the components of resource planning in India? So there are basically three components. Number one, whenever we try to plan a resource, whenever suppose, suppose there is a news that India has found reserves of petroleum. So what will the petroleum ministry do? Number, will they, number one, they will try to identify 
uh, the place where the petroleum is found. Okay, so they will uh, pro do proper survey of the area. They will prepare a proper map of the area. Okay, so they will find out ki what is the quality and quantity of the petroleum deposits. So number one step is identifying an inventory of the resources across the different regions of the country. So once you come to know that we have certain deposits of minerals or petroleum or anything, then you have need to have a proper planning structure. Okay. Now, so it's important to realize that what kind of technology will be needed, what type of engineers will be needed, what is the different kind of permissions from the ministries you will need it. So that is called as a planning structure. So the second step in resource planning is in India, evolving a proper planning structure with the proper technology, skills and institutional setup. And the last but not the least is matching the entire resource development plan with the national development. See, there is no use of taking out any resource if that cannot benefit the nation. So it's very important whenever you are planning a resource, it's important to make sure that your resource planning should always match the national development. Okay. Now, so uh, see, so, so far we understood, so far we realized, we discussed upon multiple topics. We saw that how the human activities have led to the degradation of resources. So it's very important to conserve them because if we are run out of resources, then definitely we cannot imagine our existence even because earth is a planet. We don't have planet B, right? It's the only planet we have. We don't have planet B so far where we can just go and settle there. Okay. Even Martians or aliens will not be very happy to welcome us because the kind of activities we do, they will not be at all uh, ready to welcome us, right? Because we are destroying our own uh, beautiful earth, isn't it? So, conservation of resources is very important. Now, let's come back to the thoughts of Gandhi ji. So, Gandhi said that there is enough for everybody's need, but not for anyone's greed. In simple terms, what he meant was, he blamed the modern technology for the, uh, you can say, exploitation of resources. Okay, he said that because of the modern technology, the resources are getting exploited. Instead of using technology, it's better to give more employment to the people. Instead of producing the goods in the larger numbers, it's better to hire people in large numbers so they will get employment also and the need will also be fulfilled. Right. So at international level, the club of Rome for the first time talked about the sustainable development. Right. Now, in fact, if you look at so Gandhi's thoughts have been presented by Schumacher. Schumacher is a beautiful writer. You know, it's a wonderful writer. So Schumacher had uh, wrote a book called Small is Beautiful in which he presented the Gandhian philosophy. Okay. Now, so, Gandhian philosophy was presented in the book, Small is Beautiful in 1974. Apart from that, the Brundtland Commission report in 1987 introduced sustainable development for the first time as an organized concept and it was also published in a book called Our Common Future. So, this point is very important with respect to one marker category. Okay, so this is very important Bache, with respect to the one marker category. Now, Let's talk about the land resources. So we all know that that land is an important resource. We use land for multiple purposes, isn't it? We use for land for multiple purposes. We use it to build our houses. We use, to, we use it to build schools, colleges, movie halls, cinema halls, malls, shopping malls. Also, we use it for the agriculture purposes, isn't it? So land is a very important resource. It supports lot and lots of things. Okay. Now, if we talk about land distribution in India, about 43% of the land in India is under the plain areas. Okay, so it's very important for, uh, you can say, agriculture activities. If you talk about 30% of the land area in India is under mountains. So mountains are a source of a lot of rivers. So water availability is very good in such a region. Okay, apart from that, it also provides a lot of opportunities for tourism. Now, about 27% of the area is under the plateau region. And we know that in India, plateau region is a storehouse of minerals. We have lots and lots of minerals in the plateaus. Okay, now. Moving on further, how do we utilize the land? Now, this is a very important concept. So, question comes at, you know, a lot of times this question is asked for five markers. That what are, how do we utilize land? Okay. So, we talk about the land utilization. So, land can be utilized for multiple purposes. Number one, we find land under forest. Okay. We have a lot of forest out here. Jungle is called, right? So, apart from that, land that is not used for cultivation. For example, the barren and the wasteland. Plus land that is put to non-agriculture uses, the land used to build hospitals, schools, okay, restaurants, clubs, shopping malls. So this is a land that in which we are not doing agriculture. So that is also uses of land. Okay, other uncultivated land like the permanent pastures where the animals go to graze, okay, they, they go to eat green, green grass. So that is also a usage of land. Then we see that there are multiple tree crops. At times what happens, multiple types of trees are grown certainly, you know. So those trees can have some fruits and flowers. So that is also one of the uses of land, right? Apart from that, we have culturable wasteland. Now, what is a culturable wasteland? 
basically it refers to that type of land which has not been cultivated for more than five years like means for the last five years or even more than that there has been no agricultural activity over this land so such a kind of land is called as culturable wasteland now apart from that we have the fallow lands now fallow itself the word fallow it means uncultivated means when you haven't done any agricultural activity so when you talk about fallow lands we have two categories number one current fallow and second is other than current fallow so when you talk about current fallow land current fallow in simple terms means that is land which has not been cultivated for one year or less than one year okay so that refers to the current fallow land okay so land that has not been cultivated for one year or less than one year that is called current fallow and other concurrent fallow stands for a land which has not been cultivated for the past one to five years that means for example let's say i had a land okay i had a land that means as a mean i had and i have not done agriculture on that land for seven months so my land will be categorized under current fallow okay so i have not done agriculture for the last seven months or eight months so my agricultural land will fall under the category of current fallow now suppose my friend also had a land okay so suppose he had not done the farming over his land for uh, say two years okay so his category of land will be counted in the other than current fallow land clear is it clear is that okay so this is the difference between the fallow and the current fallow now Let's talk about the net zone area. Now, net zone area is a very interesting concept here. What do you mean by net zone area? Basically, it refers to the physical extent. It refers to the physical extent of land over which the farming is done. Let's say this is a area. Okay, let's say this is an area. Fine. So, let's say this is an area, and out of this hundred percent area, if we have done farming in the eighty percent of it, then this area is counted under the net zone area. Okay. this area is counted under the net zone area so let's suppose this is a large area of land and out of that out of this 80% of the area the farming is being done so this 80% of the area will be counted in the net zone area okay now how do we calculate the gross crop area let's say this part of land the farming is done more than once a year okay for example we grow crops on this particular part of land for two times a year so when you calculate the gross crop area you will add this area Plus you will add this area. Okay. So when we calculate the gross crop area, we first add what? We first calculate the net zone area, and to this we add the area over which crops are grown more than once in a year. So that gives us the final net zone area. Is that clear? Is that clear? Is that clear, my dear bacha? Chali. So what is net zone area? The physical area, the physical extent over which the crops can be grown. For example, in Punjab and Haryana, out of the total area. Round about, round about on eighty percent of area the crops are grown. Okay, so out of the total area, the eighty percent of area the crops are grown. So for them the net zone area is eighty percent of their land. Okay, so when we add to net zone area an area over which the crops are grown more than one time a year, then it gives us the gross cropped area. Okay, fair enough. Now, fine. So there is a question, very interesting question that explain the land use pattern in India. Again, that's a five marker. You what is the land use pattern in India? So if we talk about the total geographical area of India, that is three point two eight million square kilometer, the data is available for roughly ninety three percent of the total geographical area only. And why is the case? Why so? See, it's very simple because we have not uh, included many areas that are captured by China and Pakistan in the Kashmir region that we called as Aksai chain or China occupied Kashmir or POK area or the Pakistan occupied Kashmir. also some forest areas of the northeastern parts of the country are not included because they are not accessible so roughly we have 93% of the data so if we talk about the pattern of net zone area in the country it varies greatly for example if they go to the states like punjab and haryana so majority of their land is now being utilized for agriculture so net zone area of such areas are very high okay however if you compare the same to some northeastern state like arunachal mizoram manipur so here the net zone area is very much less less than 10% so the variety of net zone area varies in the country apart from that forest area in the country is much less than the desired forest policy that is we talk about the national forest policy of 1952 the desired category the desired percentage of area is 33% okay the desired percentage area of uh, the forest should be in india of 33% because but we are very less compared to that okay now so we talk about apart from that there's much of his uh, our area is also under but we can say that uh, this thing 
under wastelands or rocky lands or barren lands. Some area is being utilized for uh, building of the schools, hospitals and other kind of infrastructure, right? Most of the agricultural lands that are not cultivated are either in the fallow category. So, if we combine all these lands, then the India's net zone area, average net zone area will be more than somewhere 54 percent gas plus, right? So, we at times there is a question ki why the net zone of area of India is less. The reason is because we are not including many of this barren lands or wastelands or fallow lands. If we include this, then the net zone area will be somewhere 54 percent, okay? Now, that's clear. So, let's come to land degradation and conservation, okay? So, land degradation and conservation measures. So, it's very simple, but say we all know that, that because of the improper planning, what we have done is, we have overused the land resources. As a result, land is getting degraded. So, because of the human activities, the land is getting degraded, okay? And what happens for India, about 130 million hectares of land is degraded. 28% out of this is the forest area and 56% of the, this is the area that is eroded by water. Especially if you talk about the states of Punjab, Haryana and Western Uttar Pradesh, the major problem of land degradation here is, what is the major problem? Here is a over irrigation. So, these states are known for basically the farming activity, but because of the over irrigation, the land is getting degraded here. Okay, for example, in Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh and Odisha, the major the major contributor to land degradation is mining. If you talk about Gujarat, Rajasthan, MP and Maharashtra, the major problem is overgrazing. Overgrazing means the uh, grazing means basically when animals, they, you know, they start eating grass and everything. Okay, so that is called grazing. So, when you keep on grazing the animals on the same piece of land, it's, uh, we are not giving the chance for the grass and the other things to grow, right? So, as a result, what is happening here, uh, that the, the land is getting degraded. So, if you talk about in these states, Gujarat, Rajasthan, MP and Maharashtra, overgrazing is the major causes. And if you talk about Punjab, Haryana, Western UP, over irrigation is the major cause here. Okay? So, this is a very, very important section where questions are always asked. This is a very important, that is causes of land degradation. I will be asking you an MCQ with, uh, after this. So, how can we solve the problem? Number one, we can do a forestation that is plant more and more trees. Apart from that, we can plant shelter belts. Shelter belts means we can plant a lot of plants. You can plant a lot of trees in a series, okay, in a series, in a straight line. That helps to break the force of the wind. Also, we can control overgrazing, right? We can stabilize the sand dunes by planting the thorny bushes. Thorny means which have thorns or kate. That helps to stabilize the sand dunes. So, these are some of the steps that we can solve to, we can take to solve the problem of land degradation, okay? Now, let's have a quick 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 question okay okay so let let's have a quick question so the question is dash is the major source of land degradation in odisha and jharkhand Okay, we have four options out here, bacho. Over irrigation. Okay, over irrigation, mining, over grazing, or both A and C. Both A and C. Done? Okay. So, let me release the polls for you. 30 seconds polls and here we go. So, dash is the major source of land degradation in Odisha and Jharkhand. Four options we have. Yes, but you can take down the short notes and you can write the answers. That's absolutely perfect. Okay, very nice. Very nice. Kya baat hai? Baut badiya. Okay, very nice, my dear. Very nice. So, we have been studying for like lagbuk five and a half hours. Oh, super. Great. So, we have been studying for five and a half hours. That's super, bye. So, I was just checking the time. 
how long you have been studying five and a half hours oh you can just do some yoga you can just stretch yourself okay so you are all set okay come on so dash is the major source of land degradation in odisha and jharkhand so what we have studied that mining is the major problem in odisha and jharkhand okay my dear so option number b is the correct answer okay oh bhai this is very bad this is very very bad here so i guess bachcho ne sahi kiya but again some problem with the leaderboard some problem with the polls no worries bachche we will again we will again have one more question okay so we'll have one more question afterwards if again the poll makes some kind of issues then again i'll restart the poll so don't worry okay so don't worry so there's some moy moy moment with the poll so no worry we'll we'll move further mr vishal bhagat hindi subject you can find on uh, pw hindi 9 and 10 youtube channel so there's a dedicated channel for all the hindi people so the hindi subject you can find on pw hindi 9 and 10 channel theek hai beta pw hindi 9 and 10 youtube channel hai wahan pe aap hindi wala content yahan pe dekh sakte hain theek hai sare pyare bachche hamare done I hope Vishal Bhagat ji, this is clear, my dear bache. This is clear, my dear. Why to fear? Chaliye. Now let's come to the last topic of this chapter, that is soil as a resource. So as I told you, I'll be doing the map work towards the last. So let's come to the last topic of this chapter, that is soil as a resource. As a stretch, kar lo, and you'll feel good. Okay. Now, so we all know that, but soil is a very important resource, isn't it? Because soil has lot of microorganisms. soil is that uh, source where we grow our food grains where you get the food from so soil is a very important and amazing resource isn't isn't it so when you talk about the formation of soil there are various natural forces like the change in temperature the rainfall okay winds and glaciers the active activity of the decomposer uh, decomposers or the microorganisms so there are multiple factors that lead to the formation of soil okay now So in India we have multiple soils and we have divided them into certain categories. So we'll start learning them by uh, them by one by one. So number one, this is my favorite. So have you heard about the superstar Allu Arjun? Like I like his movies a lot. There is this one one of his movies called as DJ Dhruv Jagannath. That's one of the favorites here. So Allu Arjun is a very famous superstar. So I always call this soil as Allu Arjun soil. And this soil's favorite subject is social science. Okay, so you can always remember this is a Allu Arjun soil, and it loves to study social science. That means it has sand, silt, and clay. Okay, so this soil contains sand, silt, and clay. So it is a very famous soil, Allu Arjun soil. As Allu Arjun is a very stylish actor in the same way, this soil is also very fertile. I mean that that is very good for cultivation. Now it is formed by three major river systems: the Ganga, Indus, and the Brahmaputra. The big Okay, now in Rajasthan and Gujarat also you can see these soils extending through a very small corridor. Okay, most of the northern plains is covered by this alluvial soil. Also, some parts of Rajasthan and Gujarat also can find this alluvial soil. Right. In fact, if you see that in the eastern coastal plains, wherever these Mahanadi, Godavari, Krishna and Kaveri rivers uh, are making deltas, there also you can find this alluvial soil. Now. what can you grow in this you can grow sugar cane you can grow rice you can grow wheat you can grow other cereal and pulse crops okay so we have two major criteria in this alluvial soil okay so one is bhangar and other one is khadar so bhangar refers to the old alluvial soil you will find that these types of soil are very rough in texture so they have these kankar modules kankar is what small small stone type structures you will find in the soil okay and this is very rough type of soil not very good for cultivation whereas on the second part if you talk about khadar to khadar is a new alluvial soil good for cultivation generally it will be found in those areas that are very much prone to the flooding okay now let's come to the black soil so i remember this soil by a very uh, famous bollywood song that is ye kali kali mitti ye gregur wali soil ugta hai isme cotton ye black black mitti so you can remember it in english also right so this black black soil okay <laughs> so we also call it regur we grow it in mccotton so aise karke you can rat right you can learn so black soil is a very a great soil theek hai now it's suitable for cotton it is also known as the regur soil it's extremely fine extremely fine very fine very smooth right so if we talk about it has a lot of clay material it has a good moisture holding capacity okay so it can hold moisture for a long period of time what it is rich in it is rich in calcium carbonates magnesium potash and lime 
also it is poor in the phosphoric contents so it does not contain phosphorus in good amounts other things it contains in good amounts like calcium carbonate magnesium potassium lime if you talk about black soil region the majority uh the deccan plateau the deccan plateau region is full of the black soil like like maharashtra saurashtra malwa madhya pradesh chhattisgarh right in fact if you see that it also can be found in the river valleys of godavari and krishna so it's a very good soil and it's very important that in the drier climates this soil develops cracks so and it's very important after the rainfall you should plow this soil otherwise it becomes very sticky right so these are few things to be uh, kept in mind okay now let's talk about red and yellow soils so basically this develops on the crystalline igneous rocks in areas of low rainfall so wherever there is low rainfall wherever there are igneous rocks generally the deccan plateau region okay so you can find it in the deccan plateau region in eastern and southern parts okay so where you can find these soils odisha chatisgarh middle ganga plain and also the piedmont zone so what is piedmont zone so whenever there is a end of a mountain so whenever the hills end wherever the hills end this particular the base of the hill suppose the hill ranges are ending here so this particular zone is called as the piedmont zone okay so whenever you will go to the piedmont zone of the western ghats we know that india on the western parts of india we have a series of mountain ranges okay or the hill ranges that are called as the western ghats so wherever this western ghats is ending there you can find the piedmont zone okay so here also we will having the red and yellow soil okay so when there is moisture in this soil it appears to be yellow so yellow is in the hydrated form okay now let's talk about the next one that is laterite soil so laterite basically means brick so laterite comes from a bit later which means brick so it develops in the areas which having high temperature okay wherever there is a very much high temperature and high rainfall in such areas you can find the laterite soils okay now the point is humus content that is the organic content of this soil is very low the big reason being these soils are formed because of a leaching process now what is a leaching understand very nicely in every soil on the rocks if you talk about there are many uh, important components there are many uh, components that are very easily mixable with the water okay that very easily get mixed with the water or they are very easy soluble in water so what happens whenever there is a heavy rainfall we see that these soils are found in the areas of heavy rainfall so what happens these soluble components of the rocks they get mixed with the rain water and they get washed away okay and then they get deposited somewhere else so this is basically called as a leaching process okay so these soils are formed by the leaching process done right so that's why they are important they are missing they are very much poor in the organic component right so where you can find these soils karnataka kerala tamil nadu madhya pradesh okay and the hilly areas of odisha and assam so it's very important you can just remember three three states that will be good to go for example kunal ke tau you can remember by this karnataka kerala tamil nadu so if you want to find laterite soil you'll have to go into the house of kunal ke tau kunal ke tau is that is kunal is me kunal ke tau is karnataka kerala tamil nadu so this way you can form your mnemonics it's easy right now so if you see that it is used to grow tea and coffee in the hilly areas of kerala karnataka and tamil nadu and if you talk about tamil nadu andhra pradesh and kerala it is also used to grow the cashew nuts that we call kaju in hindi okay so it is also used to grow the cashew nuts that we call kaju in hindi now let's talk about the next quality of soils soils that is the arid soils now what is arid soils see basically the term arid means somewhat which is dry okay the term arid means the dry conditions and we can find the dry conditions in those parts where there is very less rainfall like the desert areas of rajasthan few dry parts of up and haryana so these are sandy in texture salty in nature there's lot of salts in this in some areas the salt content is very high and by the evaporation process we also manufacture the common salt okay so basically when we see that these kinds of soils are generally you can say that found in the case of western rajasthan okay western rajasthan haryana and dry parts of up now let's talk about the forest soils so basically these soils you will be finding in the hilly and the mountainous region okay so if you talk about these soils so these soils are very much slippery very sticky that's called loamy and silty so if you go to the valleys of the mountains here the soils will be very much loamy very sticky very you know sticky in nature and when if you go to the upper side if you go to the higher elevation here the soils will become very much rough okay you must have seen that the soils in the mountainous areas are very slippery if you try to climb over a mountain or a hill your you know your leg starts slipping your foot starts slipping the reason is the soil is not that much pretty much hard or pretty much rough that it can provide you a grip so you will see that in the valley areas the soil is very much loamy very sticky very silty right in the snow covered areas we see that the soils are more over acidic in nature 
the humus content is very less in the soil and in the lower parts of the valleys we see that the soils are generally fertile right so these are the multiple variety of soils so these are smaller pointers so it's a very good handy tool to remember your soils okay the most important soils out of these are red and yellow soils black soil and alluvial soil so these are the soils from which maximum questions have been asked over the period of time okay fair enough fair enough okay so these are the soils from which maximum questions have been asked from over the period of time make a pointer alluvial black soil and aapka red and yellow soil okay now let's talk about soil erosion so basically what is soil erosion the removal of the top layer of the soil because the top layer of the soil is the most fertile layer of the soil and it can be removed because of natural factors or because of human factors if we talk about so multiple factors are responsible for this okay for example deforestation overgrazing okay or if we talk about construction and mining activities so these are the multiple factors that are responsible for erosion also the natural factors like heavy rainfall or a strong wind that can also lead to the soil erosion okay now so whenever we see that sometimes what happens the running water the water is coming down with a great flow it goes through the clay soils it makes certain gaps or channels that we call as gullies right so such type of erosion is called gully erosion and such type of lands become unfit for cultivation and they are called as bad lands if you have ever visited chambal in the central uh, india part okay if you have ever visited chambal chambal was very famous for decades early in the history but now where now you cannot find jacates there but you can find this bad land there so we will see that the river has you know basically uh, you know a degraded a lot quality of land so in chambal we call this bad lands as ravines okay so basically this type of erosion is called gully erosion apart from that you also must have seen that at times what happens the water comes suppose if there is a slope right if there is a slope so suppose the water is coming down with a great force so it carries along with itself the great volume of soil it feels that if entire sheet of soil is moving so such kind of erosion is called as the sheet erosion okay dosto fine now how can you counter this erosion how can you control this erosion number 1 the contour plowing generally what happens in the mountainous areas wherever there is a slope what do the farmers do they divide their land into certain parts and they try growing some or the other crop over these parts this helps to stable the land this helps to stable the soil and in the case of a heavy uh, rainfall in the case of a strong uh, wind or a storm the soil is not got eroded okay so this is called as contour plowing this is called as contour plowing okay then you can do terrace cultivation in mountainous regions farmers they cut their farms in the form of terrace or steps like this you must have seen in the hilly areas especially in the himalayan belt what do the farmers do they have divided their farms into this type of structure into terrace type structure steps type structure such a kind of cultivation is called terrace cultivation you can do strip cropping what is strip cropping suppose there are two main crops x and y what we do here is we plant a strip of grass or some other crop so that that can hold the soil together so in the case of erosion the soil will not go away okay shelter beds what are shelter beds when you try to plant the trees in a single row so what we'll do here is we'll try plant the trees in a straight row in a simple row okay so row means in a straight line we will plant the trees this will help to break the force of the wind and thereby prevent the soil erosion right now so this is a small case study this may be asked people's management okay so however this is not that important so if you see that because of the local people management there is a village called as sukho manjari in jabua so the tree density the amount of tree there have increased from 13% per hectare to uh, uh, 1272 per hectare so this shows that if people are involved in the conservation practices then we can achieve better results right so if you see that people being made the decision makers by madhya pradesh government 2.9 million hectares or 1% of the india's land area is now being greened is now being made green with the help of local communities with the help of local people and the watershed management so this is a kind of case study that you can go through it may be pop, but this question so far has not been asked from this particular this thing this topic right so if you want you can skip this topic also okay now let me ask a question so it was a long chapter it was a very long chapter but still bachcho we have lot of things to do okay so i have a question for you let me ask you a question question is it is a crop that grows well in regor soil
इट इज अ क्रॉप दैट ग्रोज वेल इन रेगुलर सॉइल्स ओके फोर ऑप्शन राइस वीट जूट कॉटन ओके सो बच्चो दे हैव फोर ऑप्शन हेयर एंड लेट स्टार्ट द पोल सो इट इज अ क्रॉप दैट ग्रोज वेल इन द रेगुलर सॉइल्स राइस वीट जूट एंड कॉटन ओके फैंटास्टिक माय डियर फैंटास्टिक गाइस सुपर 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 अमेजिंग गाइस अमेजिंग 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 सो यू आर द रियल सोर्स ऑफ माय मोटिवेशन है ना सो शारद सिंह सर जितने आशिक लोग हैं चार्ट में सब फेल होंगे हाँ बात तो सही है फॉर देम यू नो एवरीथिंग इज टेम्परेरी देर आशिक यू थिंग इज परमानेंट चलो तो करेक्ट आंसर इज कॉटन तो भैया कॉटन ले लो कॉटन कॉटन ले लो कॉटन ऑप्शन नंबर जी इज करेक्ट हंड्रेड परसेंट गाइज गिवन द करेक्ट आंसर आदि चौधरी सिक्सटीन हंड्रेड मीटर्स मैराथन दौड़ रहे थे तुम एस एम एक्स एक्सएल लोफी क्वेरल एडिट्स मिस्टर पवन ओके वेरी नाइस ओके so only 10 students answered correctly that's very bad guys bhai i expect even more students bachcho what are you doing let me see a cumulative leaderboard okay so let me see a cumulative leaderboards so okay where do we have the leaderboards here we have the view leaderboards yeah aap so here we have the leaderboards atharv has attempted 14 questions and has done 14 out of 14 correct okay priya has attempted 15 and done 13 correct shranchi is doing very nice She has attempted twelve questions and given eleven answers correct. That is superb, guys. So you can see your cumulative reader boards as well, and that is amazing. Okay, so that's really great. That's really great. Five hundred and two students have participated. Let me ask you one more question. Let me ask you one more question here. Okay. Now the question is very simple. Alluvial soils are rich in dash. four options let me give you this one is easy one okay so here we go 30 seconds poll and here we go so alluvial soils are rich in dash sand silt and clay potassium silt both a and b so let me find out we let me find out kanpur dps kalyanpur long memories of the school beta hindi ka class nahi hai hai na to this is a pure english channel so yahan pe class un bachcho ke liye hum kar rahe hain aaj jo ko hindi nahi aata jinko so they are comfortable in english so that is why we are doing the class in english hai na hindi wala jo marathon chalega abhi wo hum log pw foundation channel pe karenge to wo shortly aapke liye aa raha hai wo bhi so wahan pe hum hindi english mix wala marathon karenge abhi wala jo marathon hai bachche this is for pure english students okay okay nice बच्चे इफ यू टॉकिंग अबाउट सी द इंग्लिश मैराथन अगेन वी द मैराथन इज वेरी सिंपल मैराथन हैज एन ऑब्जेक्टिव टू टीच द एंटायर सिलेबस अलोंग विद द क्वेश्चन टू द स्टूडेंट्स इन अ स्पैन ऑफ लेट्स से बिकॉज इट्स एंटायर सिलेबस तो इट टेक्स अराउंड एट और नाइन आवर्स फॉर श्योर ओके सो द अपकमिंग हिंग्लिश मैराथन दैट वी हैव ऑन फाउंडेशन चैनल्स लास्ट ईयर ऑल्सो वी डेट क्वेश्चन ऑल्सो वी डेट कंप्लीट थ्योरी ऑल्सो सो इट्स अ मिक्स ऑफ बोथ द थिंग्स ओके so i hope this clears the doubt okay the correct answer is very simple i told you alu arjun loves social science that is sand silt and clay so option number d is the correct answer here we go so oh bhai this is moe moe again a moe moe moment because people have answered very correct and something bad has happened okay let me give you another okay fine so it was a moe moe moment for me also well 
sympathies to me. So we'll do another question and then I guess all thing will be solved. Okay, so let's move further. Let's move further. Okay, let's move further. So let's start with forest and wildlife resources. It's a very short and sweet chapter. So definitely it's not going to take the time. So the faster we finish with the geography, the faster we can move on to the next subjects. Okay, now let's start with the forest and wildlife. It's a very beautiful chapter. It's a nice chapter and a very quick one, right? Right. So we talk about, uh, when we talk about biodiversity, it basically refers to the variety of plants and animals available in the ecosystem, right? For India, if you talk about India is very rich in biodiversity, we must have come across a lot of plant species in the country. We must have also seen lot, lot and lot and lot, lots of types of animals out there. We have seen the lots of types of birds out there. So ultimately what we have seen is that India has a great biodiversity, right? So when you talk about flora, flora means we refer to the plants. And fauna means we refer to the animals, okay? So, flora and fauna. When you're talking about flora and fauna, flora refers to the plants and fauna refers to the animals. So, India has a huge biodiversity. Now, okay. So, if we talk about it's one of the richest countries in terms of biodiversity. 8% of the world's species are found in India. At least 10% of the India's recorded flora and fauna, that means plants and animals are under threat, okay? Like for example, many animals have been categorized as critical. For example, and they have all, some of them have also get, uh, got extinct. For example, the Asiatic cheetah, right? So we, we don't find Asiatic cheetah in India anymore. However, our respected Prime Minister Modi ji has got some cheetahs, but that is from the African, uh, you know, wilds. Okay, so that we don't have Asiatic cheetah right now because it's already extinct in the country. Okay, now let's move further. So, what are the causes of the transformation? See, very simple. Where when you talk about the human beings, so we have transformed nature into a resource, right? We exploited the nature for our multiple needs, for getting different things for woods, for medicines, for rubber, for fuel. So, for multiple things, we exploited the nature, and that ultimately led to the destruction of the forest. And we all know that forests are the home to different plants and animals. So, when we destroyed their home, definitely their species are going to decline, right? So, the various factors that have caused the depletion of flora and fauna, number one, the large scale developments, second is shifting cultivation, third, mining, okay, apart from that forest fires and the historical reason, even the, during the colonial time, remember, when the Britishers came into the country, they exploited our forest resources for their benefit and that is also a reason that has impacted the biodiversity of India, right, moving on further. When you talk about conservation, to conservation means when you try to protect the existing biodiversity, whether it be plants, whether it be animals, whether they are insects, whether they are birds, when we try to preserve them or the water support or the support systems of our life, the water resources, the air and everything around us, right? So that is called as conservation. Conservation means protecting, right? So what happened? Due to the demands of the conservationists, well, there were many people who were concerned about the environment, who were concerned about protecting the environment. So they started putting pressure on the Indian government. As a result, the Indian government launched the Indian Wildlife Protection Act in 1972. So the aim was to protect the remaining population of all those species of plants and animals that are very much threatened and are facing the danger of getting extinct. Right. So that could only be done by banning hunting, by giving legal protection to such species of animals and by restricting the trade in wildlife products. You must have, you must know, you must be knowing that there is a very famous Bollywood actor who is facing a lot of legal charges for killing a black buck or a kala hiran, right? We all know him, right? So we all know uh, who he is, right? So he has been charged multiple times. He has been, you know, for killing that black buck or kala hiran. So if you see that kala hiran or black buck is an endangered species, right? So, you cannot kill such kind of animals or plants. You cannot harm them. You will have legal consequences. And that was done to make sure that they get protection, right? Central parks and many state governments established the different central and state governments. They have established the different national parks and wildlife sanctuaries for the protection of these animals and plants. In fact, if you see that central government also announced multiple projects where it was focused to keep a special, you know, control and check on some specific species of animals and plants which were threatened. For example, Pashmir, uh, for example, uh, tiger, one-horned rhinoceros, Kashmir stag, three types of crocodiles, all the three ones, freshwater, saltwater and the ghadiyals, the Asiatic lion and some other animals that were facing a lot of uh, problems, right? So, government framed an entire list and it made sure that protection is given to such kind of animal and plant species so that they are not further killed or threatened. Right now, 
So we see that in 1986, even several hundred butterflies and insects were also added to the protected list. In fact, in 1991, for the first time, plants were also added to the protected list so that we can give protection to them also and pro uh, like uh, basically preserve them against any such harm, right? Now, for example, Project Tiger, it's a very important one. Project Tiger, okay, Project Tiger, it's sometimes asked in the examination, maybe in the form of a case study also. So, Project Tiger was implemented in 1973. If you see that the 1973, the tiger population, it reduced to 1827 from 55,000. Okay, the major threats to tiger population was the illegal hunting of the tiger, the shrinking habitats, because what is happening nowadays? We are basically getting into the forest. You must have seen that tiger either goes gaya, tiger udar goes gaya, right? So, tiger is not entering anywhere. We are entering into the jungle. So, if you will destroy the forest, if you will destroy the tiger's habitat, okay, where tigers used to live, where will the tigers go? Will they come to your house knocking at your door? Hello, uncle and auntie, is there a 2 BHK vacant out there? Will they come asking a house for rent? They won't, right? If the tiger's habitat are destroyed, also the animals on which tiger used to hunt and eat his food, they will also get die. They will also die because of lack of food. Okay, multiple reasons. So, as a result, tiger population is continuously decreasing. We can't expect a tiger family standing right in the front of a door asking for a butter chicken. Auntie, butter chicken, mana hai kya? I want uh, something for my family. Uh, okay, or we can't imagine tiger and his family coming to ask a house on rent. Uncle, 3 BHK khali hai kya? Uh, rent pe milega, udha jungle ura diya aap logo ne. So, these types of things cannot be imagined, right? It's very simple. Very simple. So, when you are destroying the habitats of the tiger, where will they go? So, the tiger population was continuously declining, isn't it? Continuously declining. So, one more problem. So, we see that the tiger skins had huge demand in the wildlife market. Apart from that, the bones of the tiger were used to prepare some ancient medicines. So, that is the reason that illegal hunters, they started poaching the tiger, they started killing the tigers. And since the world's maximum tigers are found in India and Nepal, so these two countries became the prime targets of such illegal hunters. Right, so finally Project Tiger was launched, okay, finally Project Tiger was launched in 1973 in order to protect the tiger. Done, clear with this, clear with this, okay. Now these are some important tiger reserves, now I am going to ask you a question with respect to this, some important tiger reserves, Corbett National Park in Uttarakhand, Sundarban National Park in West Bengal, Bandhavgarh in Madhya Pradesh, Sariska Wildlife Sanctuary in Rajasthan, Manas Tiger Reserve in Assam and Periyar in Kerala, okay. So, have a clear look at these lists because I am going to ask you a question from the same very list. Okay, so let's have a question here. Kanak wants to see tigers in Assam. in their natural habitats. She should visit Dash Tiger Reserve or National Park. Okay. So, she should visit Dash Tiger Reserve or National Park. Four options. Corbett, Simlipal, Manas Sariska. Four options. So, where should she visit? Okay, four options here. And here we go. Very nice. Very nice. 30 seconds poll. And let me see how many students attempt the correct question. Very nice, guys. Very nice. Superb, superb, superb. Okay. Done. Okay, done my dear. Fine. So, what should be the correct answer? What should be the correct answer? So, Kanak wants to see tigers in Assam in their natural habitats. She should visit Dash Tiger Reserve. Very simple. Corbett simplified. Simlipal, Manas, Sariska. We just studied that. 
So she should reserve, visit which tiger reserve? That is Manas. So option number C is absolutely correct. 87.5% people have answered me the correct. Surpreet Kaur, Priya, Madhu, Adi Pradeep, learn with Shelly, Apurva, Shabnam, Vansh, Kumar. Amazing, superb guys, superb. So the correct answer is option number C, that is Manas Tiger Reserve. Fantastic. Now, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about very important topics, the last topics, that is types and the distribution of forest and wildlife. Okay. And after that, we'll be moving to again, two to three, the last topics of the chapter in the chapter is wind up after that. Okay. Now, so, Bachavadi, let's come to this. So, we see that in India, much of the forest and wildlife resources is either owned by the government or managed by the forest department or other government authorities. Okay. So, we see that we have classified the forest into different categories. Number one. First category is the reserve forest. It covers half of the total forest land. Like let's say that out of the total forest land in the country, half of the land is covered under the reserve forest. So it is very valuable as far as conservation of wildlife is concerned. Then we're talking about the protected forest. As the name suggests, we are protecting these forests from other further degradation. Okay. So almost one third of the total forest area comes under the res uh, protected forest. So, we are trying to protect this from further degradation. Okay, this is managed by the forest department. That unclassed forest. Now, there are some kind of forests and wastelands that belong to both government as well as some private individuals or some communities. For example, there are forests in the tribal areas and tribals, they are very much dependent upon the forest, right? So, these are forests are managed by them. So, these are categorized under the unclassed forest, the forest that and wastelands that belong to both government and private individuals, right? Now, sometimes we call reserved and protected forest as permanent forest also, right? So, whenever the forest department will take some forest products, for example, wood or any other things, then these category of forests are also called as permanent forest estates, okay? So, sometimes if someone questions, so the question is, what is permanent forest estate? So, remember, sometimes reserved and protected forest are also called as permanent forest estates. This is in the case when they are used for producing timber or wood, okay, and other forest products, okay. So, in that case, we call them as permanent forest also, right. So, Madhya Pradesh has the largest area under permanent forest. If you talk about the total forest area of Madhya Pradesh, 75% of the area comes under the permanent forest. Now, that's a very nice question. It's a PYQ as well, that uh, which state has the largest area under permanent forest. So, the answer is Madhya Pradesh, okay. Now, so, if you talk about, fine. So, if we talk about the unclassed forest, the so majority of the unclassed forest you can find in the northeastern states that are very common. You will find unclassed forest there. Okay. So, uh, let's move on to the further point. So, community and conservation. Now, this is very interesting to understand. So, we know that uh, in different religions and different cultures that we have in India, uh, everyone has some or the other kind of trees that are very important or very sacred for them, isn't it? So, forests are also home to some of the traditional communities. Local communities have always tried to protect the habitats, to protect the, conserve the forest, okay, along with the help of the government officials, because end of the day, there are still many communities, many groups of people in India who are still dependent upon the forest for their needs, okay. So, for example, if you talk about, if you take some examples, in Sariska Tiger Reserve, the villagers have fought against the mining activities by giving the citation of Wildlife Protection Act. Because okay, according to the Wildlife Protection Act, Sariska Tiger Reserve is a protected area or you cannot carry out any kind of mining activities in such area. So, villagers have stood against such things, right? Apart from that, if you talk about Alwar, right? If you talk about Alwar, one more, one more example we can add here is of the Alwar. In Alwar, if you talk about, Alwar again is, is in Rajasthan. Okay, so Alwar, 1200 hectares of area, 1200 hectares of area have been declared Bhairo De Daku century. Okay, have been declared 1200 hectares of area by five villages of Alwar. Okay, the five villages of Alwar have declared 1200 hectares of area as Bhairav Dev Daku century and there are the regulations and rules are set up by the villager itself. So, without their permission, you cannot visit this entire 1200 hectares of area. You cannot do any kind of hunting. Also, you cannot do any kind of encroachment. That means you cannot enter this Bhairav Dev Daku century without the permission of the villagers, right? So, this is a very good example of community and conservation, right? Apart from that, if you see that, 
famous chupko movement that was started by sundarlal bahuguna in the this thing again back in the this chamoli district in uttarakhand now it lies in uttarakhand so it started in the chamoli district in uttarakhand launched by sundarlal bahuguna very famous environmentalist so here what happened the government has given contract to the private company to cut down the trees but if you see the geography of chamoli it's a very sensitive area right so people stood against that and uh, you know they started hugging the trees in order to prevent them from being cut down right so that's a great example apart from that farmers and citizens groups have launched certain andolans yeah, like beech bachao andolan in tihri uttarakhand and navdanya andolan so they have showed that a good amount of crops can be grown without using the chemical fertilizers or chemicals to boost the crop production so they basically uh, more over target on the organic methods of farming so they have clearly shown the uh, andolans like beech bachao or navdanya have clearly shown that you can grow good amount of crops even without using the chemical fertilizers right then joint forest management program started in odisha in 1988 is a wonderful but it's a wonderful example of community and conservation right so if we talk about joint forest management it's a very good question for three markers that it started in 1988 in odisha so what happened the odisha government it passed a resolution okay so in which it was decided that the degraded areas of the forest okay so there were certain areas in the forest that were very much degraded so the government decided to involve the local communities in the restoration of the forest okay so what happened the forest department divided the village into certain groups they were called the village institutions so every group was assigned a certain area of the forest and they were asked to restore back the forest in return the villagers will be getting a share in the forest products whichever the forest department will be taking out from the forest so they will get a share in the forest product also they will get a share in the wood that the forest department will harvest by successful protection okay that means in a sustainable way whatever products the forest department are going to take out of the forest that will be shared with the villagers so that is a very good example of community and conservation that is the joint forest management and it's a very important question which is asked which is asked several times in the bachcho paper done now i have two questions for you i'll do back to back questions okay now it's a case study based question so this is specially for you and this is a very important paragraph from your ncrt so we'll have two back to back polls once you read this okay so we'll read this together now make a point okay so nature worship is a very age old belief in indian societies we all worship natures right isn't it so because tribals believe that everything is being created by nature and it should be protected and respected so because of such beliefs there are many forest in india that have left be that have not been touched so that have not been intervened by the humans because the local people believe that in this forest there are gods and goddesses so they call them the forest of the gods and goddesses or the sacred groves right so these forest or parts of the large forest are untouched even by the local people and no one can enter these areas right now certain societies they also worship a particular tree from very ancient times for example the mundas and santhal of the chota nagpur plateau they worship a tree of mahua and kadamb okay if you talk about the tribals of odisha and bihar they worship the tree of tamarind jisko aap imli kehte hain right apart from that and mango during the weddings to many of us the people trees and the banyan trees are considered to be very very important there are many festivals in which these trees are worshiped or paid respect if not we say that we also give sacred qualities we also consider a lot of mountain peaks to be very holy and we respect them right if you talk about the uh, if you talk about the langurs or the monkeys you must have find them across the temples so people they don't hurt them in fact people feed them so it's a kind of collaborative community that are ritual steeds so somewhere or the other if you talk about our communities have our ancient culture has lot of elements which respect which respect the nature and talk about conservation and community right for example in the bishnoi villages of rajasthan you can easily find a black bug that is called kala hiran or chinkara neel gai and peacocks they are thought to be a part of their family part of the village and they can be easily found roaming here and there without any restriction right so these are few of the ancient beliefs that have helped in the preservation of the forest and the communities okay now i have two questions back to back so question number 1 is dash are also known as the forest of the gods and goddesses okay so dash are also known as the forest of the gods and go goddesses so we have 30 seconds time and your time starts now come on so dash are also known as the forest of gods and goddesses four options
डन बच्चों डन ओके सो करेक्ट आंसर वेरी सिंपल दैट इज सीक्रेट ग्रुप यानी ऑप्शन नंबर बी सो सीक्रेट ग्रुप ऑप्शन नंबर बी इज द करेक्ट आंसर एंड हेयर वी गो ओके एटी फोर परसेंट पीपल आर गेन विद करेक्ट आंसर हर्षित रिशभ प्रयान आदित्य शायानी देर ओनली एटी इलेवन स्टूडेंट आंसर करेक्ट लेट्स कम टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन वॉट एपन टू दिस बाई चल जाओ ब्रो ओके लेट्स कम टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन नो वरीज द मुंडास एंड संथाल्स ऑफ द छोटा नागपुर प्लाट्यू वर्शिप मऊआ मैंगो कदम और बोथ ए एंड सी ओके सो यू हैव टू ऑप्शन है एंड लेट स्टार्ट विद पोल ओके सो थर्टी सेकेंड गाइस कम ऑन डन ओके फाइन ग्रेट सो करेक्ट आंसर लॉट ऑफ लॉट्स लॉट्स एंड लॉट्स ऑफ पीपल हैव गिवन हाय ओके डॉगेस सर ओके सो करेक्ट आंसर इज बोथ ऑप्शन दैट इज ए एंड सी आर करेक्ट दैट इज ऑप्शन नंबर डी सो बोथ ए एंड सी आर करेक्ट ओके सो मऊआ एंड कदम बोथ द ट्रीज आर वर्शिप बाय द पीपल एंड ऑप्शन नंबर डी इज करेक्ट हेयर वी गो so 53% people have given the correct answers some people got confused just by mahua so remember we talked about mahua and kadam both the trees are worshiped by them so we have seven students have answered me correctly marana aditya kunal sohan okay pravina supreet we have shabnam we have shrikant okay lots and lots of people fine great guys so this finally winds up your chapter that is forest and the wild life resources okay so this finally winds up your chapter forest and the wildlife resources okay that's great guys that is great superb hi marana warrior who is this asking hello instagram use karte ho satya okay so bachche very simple Uh, I'll not load you with a lot of stuff. So, uh, suppose we have four subjects to go. Okay. So let's say I'll watch a time. Uh, so we have been studying for long hours. Okay. No doubt about that. So we have been studying for long hours. So I'll try to see how far we can complete geography, how fast we can complete geography. If I feel that the people are getting lot of lots of exhausted, in that case we will cover civics and economics in another session. If not, then we'll cover it today itself. So okay, okay. So first, let's try covering the geography. So it depends upon how fast we cover geography. If you are able to finish geography within the time frame, we'll go ahead with civics and economics. But I'm not going to stuff you with lot of things so that you can come back and at least watch the lecture again. Okay. So if if I feel that the students are you know loaded with lot of lot lots and lots of chapters at one point of go, so then we will do a part two of the marathon as well. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So let's start with the chapter water resources. Okay. So let's try to finish geography. Okay. Fine. But see, this is not the deleted part. This is a small, small paragraph in the form of small, small box in NCERT. It is a part of your chapter, but see, and it is asked from this particular case-based study. Right, my dear, my dear. Okay. So that is the reason. so you might have come across you might have feel side is related this is not deleted it's a part of your ncert so bachche i am already teaching you the rationalized syllabus only i am already teaching you the rationalized syllabus only so that you study hai na without wasting your time okay done now let's talk about the chapter water resources now it's a very nice chapter guys very easy chapter very easy chapter very nice chapter and we'll try to go with this chapter very quickly very fast okay now let's talk about see this is a very famous saying by samuel taylor coleridge that water water everywhere not a drop to drink okay water water everywhere not a drop to drink that's a very very famous saying by samuel taylor coleridge it's a very he was a very famous poet you know so uh, let me talk about water so basically this chapter also deals with 
uh, same kind of concept. We talk about water scarcity. We talk about the problems because of which water scarcity arises. Okay. Now, so if we talk about water, it's a renewable resource. It covers three by fourth of the earth's surface. But out of this three by fourth quantity, only a small portion of it can be used, you know, because most of the water in the world is in the form of salt water. That means it's present in the oceans and seas. And that water is definitely not fit for consumption. Consumption. Okay. Now, so let's have some facts and figures. 96.5% of the total water exists as oceans. So again, we cannot use this water for drinking. Only 2.5% of the water can be used as fresh water. We talk about India. So India received 4% of the total global precipitation. That means out of the total rainfall that happens in the entire world, 4% of it happens in India. And rank of India is 133 in terms of water availability. That means how much water is available per person in a year. In that aspect, we rank 133. It was predicted that by 2025, certain areas may go into water scarcity. Now, that's a very scary statement because if water scarcity takes place for real, then it is going to be very, very difficult, guys. Very, very difficult. Okay, now let's move further. Okay, so what is water scarcity and basically what is the need for water conservation? See, water scarcity means, suppose there is a demand of, let's say, suppose there is a demand of 100 liters of water in an area. But the water available is only 20 water, uh, liters, right? That means there is a scarcity of water or a shortage of water, right? So the shortage of water or the lack of sufficient water as compared to the demand is called as water scarcity. Now, multiple causes of water scarcity can be there. Number one, over exploitation of the water resources. Okay. Second is excessive use of the water resources, unequal access. That means the poor people are not having the access to the water resources, whereas the rich are enjoying all the benefits. Okay, you must have seen that in the very poor localities, even in the modern times, we see that the government water supply is there. Because of which uh, the poor households, they are not even able to get sufficient water according to their family needs. The person who is very rich can access the water resources anyway. He can buy the water or in fact in the posh areas or the rich areas, the water supply is very regular. So we see that there is a discrimination in this case also, right? So the rich are getting the access, whereas the poor people are again not getting the access. Now, large in the growing population because as the population increases, the demands for the water will also increase. Second, now, irrigated work, agriculture is the largest consumer of water. We see that for irrigation, a huge amount of water is required, right? So, that's, it's very important that we need to revolutionize agriculture. We need to adopt the techniques and technologies where water consumption is reduced. Now, if you see that more wells and tube wells have been operating nowadays because people need water for irrigation. So, as people, you know, they start putting up more and more tube wells. That, uh, that results in the decrease of groundwater because ultimately the tube wells or the hand pumps or the wells, they are drawing water from the underground because there is water present beneath the ground also that we call groundwater. But more of more tube wells are coming up that is, uh, that is over exploiting the groundwater resources. Done. Now, apart from that, intensive industrialization and urbanization is also pressing, is also creating a great pressure on the existing water resources, right? So, when you have a lot of industries, when you have a lot of cities coming up, so demand for water will also increase. As a result, what is going to happen? The water resources are under serious threat, right? Now, as you see today in India, the hydroelectric power contributes approximately 22% to the power needs. Rest of it is still coming from the thermal power. Right now, more urban areas and dense populations have further added to the problem of water scarcity. So these are the multiple reasons or causes of water scarcity. This question can be asked for three markers. It's a very important question. You can write down any three points from this. Okay, any three to four points from this, your answer is good to go. Now, so this is number one. This was the quantity of water. So here, the aspect of the water scarcity is quantitative. So, where we are not having sufficient quantity of water available. Sometimes what happens, the quantity of water may be available. Water is available to meet the demands of the people, but still the area suffers from water scarcity. Here the reason is the quality. So, when you talk about water scarcity, we talk about two aspects, quality and quantity. Number one, we can have shortage of water because the quantity of water is not available. Second, we can also have shortage of water because the quality of water is very bad. And it is not fit for usage, whether domestic or industrial. 
Okay, so that may also be the reason for water scarcity, right? Very simple. Um, nowadays, we see that water resources are getting polluted because of the industrial effluents, because of the dirty waste that are getting secreted from agriculture, from industry. So, that is polluting the uh, water resources, right? Now, government of India, the current Modi government has an ambitious scheme called as the Jal Jeevan Mission. So, under Jal Jeevan Mission, the government is trying to improve the quality of life of the people. How? The government has tried to reach the people in the rural areas to help them, uh, you know, uh, government is basically under this mission, under Jal Jeevan Mission, government is trying to reach tap water, government tap water to the rural areas so that people don't have to struggle for water, right? So, that people are, you know, delivered healthy water, fresh water, clean water that they can use for the multiple purposes, right? Because if the people will consume dirty water, there will be multiple diseases out of it. Okay, so government's entire focus is to provide clean and safe water to the rural areas, especially to the rural families and sufficient quantity of water, right? And this is the major objective under the Jal Jeevan Mission. I hope this is clear, my dear. Okay, so now, so goal of the Jal Jeevan mission is to get an assured supply of potable. Potable water means that you can drink, that you can use. Potable piped water at a service level of 55 liters per day, right? And that too on a regular term basis. So, this will help a lot of people too who are suffering from water scarcity to get the water needs meet. Okay, so that's a great mission by the government. Now, let's talk about the multi-purpose projects and the water resource management. Okay, so from ancient times, we have seen that complex hydraulic structures like dams and all have been already built. Artificial lakes were built in the olden times. For example, take that uh, examples of Kaling. In Kaling, Odisha, you will find a lot of dams being built. Nagarjun, Konda, Andhra Pradesh, Benur in Karnataka, Kolapur, Maharashtra. Right, if you see that in 1st century BC, there is a place called Sringa Pura near Prayagraj, okay, earlier known as Allahabad. So here the flood water of the Ganga was carefully harvested and utilized for various purposes. In 11th century, Bhopal Lake was formed. It is one of the largest artificial lake of its time. At the tank in Hoskhas constructed, uh, Hoskhas is the place in Delhi. So here the ruler of the Delhi Sultanat, El Tutmish, constructed a tank to supply the air, water to the nearby areas. In fact, today also we have an Hoskhas Lake. Apart from that, during the time of Chand Gupta Maurya, we see that a lot of dams, lakes and irrigation systems were developed. So, Indians are not new to the water harvesting system. So, we already have this technology. We have been following it since the ancient times. So, if we talk about traditionally, yani in the earlier times, the dams were basically built to control the river water, to control the flow of the river water that can further be used for agriculture for the irrigation purposes, right? Today, dams are built not just for irrigation, but for multiple projects, for multiple purposes, like electricity generation, water supply to industries and domestic areas, flood control for recreation activities, for breeding of the fishes, right? So, there are multiple objectives that these dams serve and hence they are called as the multi-purpose projects, okay? Now, for example, you remember the Bhakra Nangal Dam? Bhakra Nangal Dam is built on the Satlaj Bias River. Okay, somewhere at the junction of Haryana and sorry, this uh, Punjab and Himachal. So, this dam, basically this Bhakra Nangal project is used for hydropower generation as well as for irrigation purposes. We have one more example, Hirakut project in the Mahanadi. So, Hirakut is built in Odisha over the Mahanadi. So, this basically is for done for controlling the flood as well as for the water conservation. So, what we see from the given examples is that dams nowadays are not just being filled of irrigation, but to serve the multiple purposes, that is why they are called as the multi-purpose projects. Okay, done. Now, it's a beautiful, beautiful question that is, uh, it's a three marker to five marker question. Compare the advantages and disadvantages of the multi-purpose projects. Now, that's a wonderful question here. That compare the advantages and disadvantages of the multi-purpose projects. Number one, if we talk about the uh, advantages, we can generate electricity. It is used for irrigation, water supply for domestic and industrial uses, flood control, recreation. That means people, they go to visit dams. It also is becoming a hotspot for the people for tourism purposes. Inland navigation used to, you know, uh, you used to basically uh, for water transportation and for the short distances and fish breeding. So, these are multiple advantages that the dams have. Now, talk, uh, let's talk about the dam uh, disadvantages, right? So, number one, when you put, when you build a dam across a river, see, it's very simple to understand. See, uh, what is happening? The river is having a certain flow, right? So, if you build a barrier across the river, definitely the natural flow of the river will be impacted. No, river is not alone. The river water also has a lot of aquatic animals which are dependent upon the flow of the river, right? So, they migrate from one place to another along with the flow of the river 
and as a result when you dam a river when you build a barrier across the river it stops the natural flow of the river right and that also impacts the migration routes of the aquatic animals also when you stop the flow what happens a lot of sedimentation takes place the heavy particles the sand and silt they starts getting deposited right so these are some of the disadvantages that are you can count about with the respect to uh, with respect to the multi purpose projects it destroys the habitats for the river's aquatic life what happens especially the areas which are very prone to flooding if you build a dam in those areas then what happens when the river water is at an all time high the low lying areas they get submerged you know they get uh, down in the water so that is again a big problem okay at times unsuccessful in controlling the floods if there is a very excessive rainfall you must have seen that the dam gates are not able to hold that much water and when the dam gates are opened they add to the misery of the floods so already there is a lot of water in the oceans Okay, sorry, lot of water in the rivers, and once you open the dam gates, the water level again increases. So that leads to severe floods, right? So these projects have uh, some very large dams. In fact, have been built that have impacted the tectonic plate movements, even causing earthquakes. So that is also very much adverse consequence. Also, when the water gets uh, you know deposited somewhere, what happen? What happens? Let's say the flood water gets collected somewhere, then that water is a dirty water, right? And that may lead to many much many many water borne diseases. so again that's again a very harmful thing for a common life for the common plantation or vegetation if you talk about so these are the multiple disadvantages that these projects have okay moving on further moving on further so we see that many movements have arisen against these projects for example if you talk about like the narmada bachao andolan the tihri dam andolan okay the biggest problem behind these projects is number 1 they displace the local communities for example the narmada bachao andolan there is a very famous environmentalist medha patkar so she started a movement against the sardar sarovar project now there was a big environmental concern behind this okay the environmental concern was if you build the sardar sarovar dam then 40000 hectares of the forest area will be submerged in the water right that will drown in the water so apart from that the local communities are the worst worst victims of it because what happens when you build a dam you need a lot of land you know you need a lot of land so where will this land come from you take the land from the people who are living nearby the forest the tribal communities so they have to give up their land their source of livelihood so they are the most displaced ones so basically narmada bachao andolan focused on two things number one the environmental conservation second the rehabilitation of the displaced communities rehabilitate means to give them a new opportunity to settle them at a new place give them the sources to earn so this was the major thing now inter dispute what state disputes have also arisen because of these kinds of dams for example if you talk about the governments of andhra tamil nadu and the lower uh, uh, the uh, the states that come in the southern part of the country so they have been objecting to the maharashtra government because you know what happens there is a dam called as koina dam in maharashtra so what is happening maharashtra government is diverting the water of the dam towards themselves so as a result the flow of the river flowing down the states is getting decreased because of which the states that are very nearby to uh, this thing like andhra is there we have karnataka so basically what happens in these states the river flow is getting reduced which is again very much uh, you can say that very much harmful for their industries and agriculture so a lot of inter water disputes uh, are arising because of this right okay fine now let's come to a question first then we'll come to rain water harvesting okay so let's have a question here Okay, so let me let me ask you a question here. Okay, so the question is simple, but you, which among the following are the negative impacts of are the negative impacts of multi purpose projects they cause floods and earthquakes at times interstate water disputes
प्रोवाइड वॉटर फॉर इरिगेशन ऑप्शन नंबर डी बोथ ए एंड सी ओके सो देर आर फोर क्वेश्चन आउट हेयर बच्चों एंड वी हैव थर्टी सिक्स सेकेंड्स हेयर सॉरी थर्टी सेकेंड्स हेयर एंड योर टाइम स्टार्ट ना सो वेरी सिंपल क्वेश्चन वेरी सिंपल ऑप्शन वेरी नाइस गाइज वेरी वेरी नाइस वेरी सिंपल ऑप्शन Sure, sure, beta. If you are studying nicely, sure you will get good marks. Just have some faith on yourself. Now, don't get demotivated, yar. Let people talk anything. You fully focus on your studies, and if you focus with full dedication, no one can stop you from bringing marks. Believe me, that's a fact. Okay. But sir, I've given absolutely correct answer. Negative impacts. Hi from Agra. Oh, wow. Bache, you cannot use black pen in board examinations. The reason is it's clearly mentioned you have to use uh, blue pen. Okay. So follow the instructions on your admit card. It's very important. Otherwise, it uh, leads to serious consequences. So please follow the instructions on your admit cards. That's very, very important. Okay, done. So the question is, which among the following are the negative impacts of multi-purpose projects? Definitely, they cause floods and earthquake at times. That's a true negative impact. Interstate water disputes are also caused by them. That is also fine. Private provide water for irrigation. That's a positive thing. So we cannot dig this. So that's why. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you so much, but I guess thanks for pointing out. I have little bit. Uh, let me give you another. Okay. So I'll give you one more question. So it has to be both A and B. Okay. So the correct answer is anyways both A and B. I'll give you one more question. Don't worry as a compensation. Okay, fine. Fair enough. I'll give you one more question. So that was by mistake. I marked A and C. Okay. So correct answer should be both A and B. I'll give you one more question. Fine. To compensate this one, I guess that will do. can be caused due to lack of dash of water okay four options quantity and quality quality and price quantity and supply or option number d none of these okay four options bachcho yahan pe so we have four options with us 30 seconds again and here we go here we go very nice very very nice hi devika <laughs> but say because this is a complete english channel so that's why i'm taking marathon for uh, all the students jinko hindi mein difficult hota hai because har ek bachcha zaruri hota hai so that is why i'm also taking the class in english okay clear my dear very good evening i hope now it is justified so we all know that it is because of quantity and quality option number a is correct 86% people have given me the correct answers that's really good yaar Roshan Matthew Priya Jisha Riya Pathak we have number one comedy channel Shreyanshi Simran Kunal this person is very consistent yaar Deepanch also very nice but a very consistent Kunal son very nice very nice very happy to see let's have the cumulative leader boards okay so priya attempted 17 questions she is on number one rank athar on second rank shreyanshi on third rank oh that is superb that is superb guys wow and she has taken 17 seconds to answer 17 question on an average she is taking 1 second to answer the question wow that's phenomenal phenomenal even this also 8.38 seconds 
14 out of 14 attempted. That's really good. That's really good. Found. Superb. Yeah. Superb, guys. Superb. Okay. So now come to, let's come to the rainwater harvesting. Okay. Atharf count over hai na? Toh abhi mein dubara se dekh lunga so we can uh, go there. Okay. Fine. So let's move further. Okay. Let's move further. Okay. So let's talk about, they go. Let's talk about rainwater harvesting. So, what do you mean by this term? It's a very, very easy term to understand. Very easy term to understand. Okay. We all know that rainwater comes from the clouds. Okay. Whenever it rains. So, a lot of this water gets wasted. What if we try to save this water? Because it can have multiple usage, right? So, you can use a lot of water. A lot of water can be preserved, can be used, can be conserved. Isn't it? So, very simple. Rainwater harvesting. It defines, it refers to, it's a simple method. Okay, so what is rainwater harvesting? Basically, it's a it's a simple method in which what is done, rainfall is collected so that we can utilize, utilize it in the future terms, right? So what happens here is, bache, the rainwater collected can be utilized, it can be stored or directly used for multiple purposes, right? So this is called as the rainwater harvesting. Now, let's move further. Now, so there are multiple techniques for rainwater harvesting. Number one, if you go to the hilly and the mountainous region, what do the people do is, they build some diversion channels. They build channels like this. Okay, that is called as guls or kuls, especially in the western Himalayas. Now, what they do is, whatever rainwater gets collected, they divert this rainwater with the help of these channels to the agricultural fields. Okay, so that's a very smart, smart way to conserve water. Second, rooftop rainwater harvesting is commonly practiced in Rajasthan to store the drinking water. The water gets collected on the roof of the house. Then with the help of a pipe, it is again transported to a tank and there it is stored. Right. If you talk about in the flood plains of Bengal, which is very prone to flooding, what do the people do? They have developed inundation channels. So again, they are type of, uh, you can say that small tunnels or you can say that small canals. So what the people of Bengal do, they divert the flood water with the help of these channels towards the agricultural fields. Okay. Now, if you talk about in semi-arid and arid regions of Rajasthan, the agricultural fields are converted into rain-fed storage. What do you mean by this? In the dry areas of Rajasthan, okay, the semi-dry or the dry areas, what happens whenever it rains, people, uh, you know, people that don't uh, remove the rainwater, what they do is they allow the rainwater to accumulate in their agricultural fields. What does impact does it have? So basically when rainwater gets accumulated, gets collected in the agricultural field, it uh, basically helps in moistening the soil, okay, making the soil more moisturized. On now, then, then it becomes very easy for them to carry out the agriculture, okay. Now, so let's talk about, so very simple, such type of structures are called as khadins in Jaisalmer and it is called as johar in other parts of Rajasthan, okay. So such type of things are called as khadins in Jaisalmer and johars in other parts of Rajasthan, done. So remember, this question is also asked in one markers. So, what do you call such type of storage? This is called as Khadins in Jaisalmer and Johar in Rajasthan. Okay. Number five, very important one. The tankas are a part of well developed rooftop rainwater harvesting system. Now, what are tankas? Tankas are basically beta large tanks. Tankas are basically beta large tanks. So, what happens here is whenever there is rainfall, whenever there is rainfall, okay. So, what happens here is whenever there is rainfall, so, this again, this entire rainwater gets collected on the roof. Now, with the help of a pipe, it can be a PVC pipe, there is a large tank in which this entire rainwater can be stored. So, this large tank is called as tanka. So, usually what happens is, this is mainly practiced in Rajasthan, especially you can say Bikaner, Falodi, Barmer for saving the rainwater because these are the drier areas and when all the other sources are dried up, the water stored in the tanka is the most useful resource. In fact, you can see that many houses have built these tankas in their courtyard or in the underground basements and some of them even have built rooms adjacent to these tankas, right? So, they have built rooms adjacent to these tankas, right? So, this helps to keep the rooms cool even when in the, the summers outside are very harsh, you know. In the western Rajasthan, the temperatures can reach up to 50 degrees Celsius. In those point of time when all the resources are dried up, the water is stored in the tankas are very helpful. The people, they also build rooms adjacent to these tankas and the rooms also remain very much cool. So, they can beat the summer heat. Okay. So, the first shower of rain is generally not corrected. That is it very dirty. 
Okay, so rainwater in Rajasthan is also known as Palar Pani, right? So this is a very good question. It is often asked in the board examinations that what is rainwater locally called? So rainwater in Rajasthan is also known as Palar Pani. Done? Okay. Now this is a very superb fact that Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu is the first state who has made rooftop rainwater harvesting compulsory. That means if you don't install this rooftop rainwater harvesting, it can also attract some legal punishment. So that is an interesting fact to know. So there are legal provisions for the people to punish the people who do not do it. Okay. So this is a great way of say, resolve, uh, this thing. This is a great way of uh, recharging or restoring the groundwater. Now, this is an important case study. It's a very one. It's an important one. It's a, there's a village called Gendathur in Mysuru, Karnataka, right? It's a very remote village, backward village. But however, the villagers are very smart when it comes to rainwater harvesting. So what they've done is they have installed rainwater harvestings in almost all the households, almost all the houses that are there in the villages. Okay, so nearly 200 households have installed this rainwater harvesting system and because of this, because of the amount and quantity of rainwater they are saving, the village has earned a rare distinction of being rainwater rich. So that's a great achievement in the part of the village. Now, so if we talk about Gendathur, it receives an annual rainfall of 1000 millimeters. That's a good volume. And 80% of the collection of the rainwater is done very efficiently. So, approximately 10 fillings or 10 times every house collects the rainwater, uh, approximately 50,000 liters of water annually. So, with the help of this, the entire village is able to save a lot of water, water in the entire year. So, that gives us a great practice of rainwater harvesting. Now, okay. So, this is again a very interesting concept, a very interesting case study that is bamboo drip irrigation. So, have you seen the sticks of bamboo? Bamboo is basically very much hollow, you know. Hollow means it is empty from inside. So, it can behave as a pipe, you know, it can behave as a pipe. So, there is a 200 year old system of tapping the stream water with the help of bamboo stick. It is called as bamboo drip irrigation system, okay. So, what do the people in Meghalaya do? <clears throat> they make a complete network of bamboo pipes, okay. They make a complete network of bamboo pipes, okay. And what they do is, Suppose there is a nearby stream or a nearby river. So, they try to first fill the water into this bamboo stick and the water travels <coughs> through the different bamboo channels. Okay, so these bamboo channels or the bamboo sticks are placed at certain angles that helps the movement of the water. Finally, the place where they want to drop the water, there the flow of the water reduces and drop by drop, drop by drop, the water gets poured into the roots of the plant. So, what happens? This minimizes the water wastage as well as this is a very efficient way of water harvesting as well as utilizing the stream water, right? So, that is bamboo drip irrigation in Meghalaya. That's a very interesting practice. Okay, <clears throat> now, this also winds up your chapter that is water resources. Now, let's have a question out here. Let's have a question with the students. Okay, so the question is very simple. Okay. So, the question is very, very simple. <clears throat> Spectres in dash. Okay. Four options. Meghalaya, Odisha, Karnataka. Done? 30 seconds out here and here we go. So, bamboo drip irrigation is practiced in Dash, Arunachal, Meghalaya, Odisha and Karnataka. Four options, very nice. Very nice guys, superb. Superb. Very nice, Roshan. Beta, you can just mark the correct option here, A, B, C, or D. And here we can have, okay. Superb, guys, superb. Amazing. Beta, English Marathon is on PW Foundation channel. It's a pure English channel, but say. So, I'm probably talking about this for 20 times, that this is a pure English ka channel. Hai. और आज हम उन बच्चों के लिए मैराथन कर रहे हैं जिनको हिंदी नहीं आता और हु डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड इंग्लिश 
सो हिंग्लिश मैराथन वी विल बी डूइंग ऑन फाउंडेशन चैनल ठीक है ये चैनल ही बेटा प्योर इंग्लिश है पूरा इंग्लिश भाषा वाला चैनल है टू हेल्प ऑल दो स्टूडेंट्स हु डोंट अंडरस्टैंड हिंदी और इंग्लिश आई होप बच्चे अभी क्लियर है कि क्यों आई एम स्पीकिंग इन इंग्लिश और टेकिंग क्लास इन इंग्लिश राइट वेरी गुड इवनिंग आदित्य बेटा एग्जाम आ गए पढ़ने का मन नहीं करता तो फिर कुछ नहीं हो सकता कोई बात नहीं आराम से जाओ एग्जाम में ऐसे ही चल के चले जाओ बेटा जब खुद के अंदर सीरियसनेस नहीं फिर आर एंड सीरियस अबाउट योर ओन एग्जाम्स योर ओन करियर योर ओन फ्यूचर नो बडी कह लेप यू सिंपल एज दैट द मोमेंट यूल गेन सीरियसनेस द मोमेंट यू विल स्टार्ट फीलिंग अबाउट योर सेल्फ द मोमेंट यूल फील द सेंस ऑफ रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी एवरीथिंग विल चेंज फ्रॉम दैट आर इट्स नेवर टू लेट ओके इट डिपेंड्स अपॉन हाउ डेडिकेटेड यू आर अगर बेटा मन ही नहीं करता तो फिर कोई मन नहीं करवा पाएगा उसमें आपको आप खुद ही डेडिकेटेड नहीं हो उस केस में इफ यू आर यू आर एंड योर सेल्फ डेडिकेटेड इफ आर नॉट रेडी टू गो फॉर इट देन हाउ कैन यू थिंक ऑफ अचीविंग इट वेरी सिंपल चेंज योर एटीट्यूड चेंज योर अप्रोच स्टार्ट फीलिंग सीरियस अबाउट इट यू विल स्टार्ट सींग द चेंजेस इन योर सेल्फ है ना इट्स वेरी सिंपल ओके ऐसा डांट नहीं रहा हूं तुमको बता रहा हूं मैं टेलिंग यू बच्चे यू नीड टू चेंज द अप्रोच It's very obvious. Exams are on our head, so we need to study. Either, either you smile and study, or either you cry or study. But you will have to study, my dear. There is no alternative. ठीक है? There is no alternative. There is no shortcut. Correct answer is very simple. That is Meghalaya. Option number B is absolutely correct. What happened here, yar? Ye poll. I'll take one more poll. Okay. Again, you can answer the same answer. You can answer the same question. You can answer the same question. I'll take one more poll. The reason is this poll was not recorded, so you can answer the options A, B, C, or D. So I'll take one more poll. Now, in fact, I marked the answer also. Let me see how many of you are going to do it correct. How many of you are going to do it wrong? Okay. Now, don't mark it wrong, guys. Absolutely, hundred percent result I need. Okay, again, answer was very simple. Simple that is Meghalaya. Let's have the results. Okay, so now, oh, boy, five percent still marking it wrong, guys. I just marked the answer right in front of you. That's Meghalaya. Still five percent people, but so okay. So Ria, Kuti, Molly, Shrikant, Prayan, Bhargav, Shabna, Monu, Kunal, Adarsh, Jisha, Kashvi. Very nice, sir. Very nice, Aditya, Ojha. Very nice, beta. Very, very nice. Okay, fine. so with this we have almost 50% completed the syllabus of our geography yeah 50% we have completed the syllabus of geography and with this we will be uh, coming starting with another chapter that is agriculture so i will give you a break once we are done with the geography so basically i also want to just you know uh, stretch it out so once we are done with geography i will give you a break for sure guys for sure because i know that you will also be exhausted so once we are done with geography i'll give you a break now let's start with a very interesting chapter that is agriculture so my dear students we all know that india is a country that is dominated by this activity that is agriculture okay so farmers are really the amazing people in the country right so they grow food for us that because of that we are able to eat the kind of you know dishes that you love to eat na that chili paneer or paneer makhani paneer butter masala so behind that or the naan roti or the lachha paratha that you love to enjoy so behind that is the hard work of a farmer who helps to produce these kinds of food grains and then we are able to consume right so agriculture is a primary sector that includes natural products okay and that are being used without much change to their original form okay so let's talk about agriculture so india if you talk about india or bharat it's an agricultural important country 2 by 3rd of the population of india is engaged in the agriculture so agriculture is a primary sector right if we talk about the sectors of economy so agriculture is a primary sector where we basically uh, use the products that are available in the nature okay it can be food grains it can be dairy products that are obtained from the animals so basically we take the natural products in this particular sector okay moving on further so when we talk about the types of farming there are three basic types of farming number one we have primitive subsistence agriculture we have intensive subsistence farming and we have the commercial farming right so there are multiple types of farming that are prevalent in the country let's talk about the number one primitive subsistence farming a very good example of this agriculture is the slash and burn agriculture also called as shifting cultivation also called as bachcho shifting cultivation okay 
इट्स अ वेरी गुड एग्जाम्पल ऑफ प्रिमिटिव सब्जिस्टेंस एग्रीकल्चर नॉट ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड वॉट डज दिस मीन ओके सिंपल सब्जिस्टेंस मीन सर्वाइवल समथिंग दैट यू डू टू सर्वाइव प्रिमिटिव मीन समथिंग दैट इज वेरी वेरी ओल्ड एंड फार्मिंग इज मीन डूइंग द एग्रीकल्चर ग्रोइंग द क्रॉप्स सो इन दिस टाइप ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर द टेक्नोलॉजी यूज इज वेरी मच ओल्ड बेसिकली द फार्मर does the entire agriculture with the help of the family and we're using the small tools like digging sticks or hoe or dow these are very small tools these are not modernized tools right so most of the agriculture is done by the farmer to fulfill the family needs to fulfill the needs of the family and done with the help of the family members okay maximum this type of agriculture depends upon the monsoon and the natural fertility of the soil that means farmer is not going to supply any kind of fertilizer or any irrigation sources it 100% depends upon the monsoon and the natural soil fertility so ultimately the production of such kind of agriculture is very low right okay so when you talk about shifting cultivation or slash and burn agriculture what does a farmer do in such a type of agriculture uh, what does a farmer do number 1 a farmer clears a patch of land okay suppose the farmer looks for a piece of land which is good in fertility then he cuts down the trees he burns the trees then whatever ash is produced the farmer mixes that ash okay he mixes that ash with the soil and whenever it rains the soil gets moist and the, it's good to for farming so farmer basically does the farming over this point of land for like say a one year or one and a half year because after that the fertility of the soil keeps on decreasing so as a result farmer moves on to a new place okay so that is why this is also called a shifting cultivation it has multiple names in the different parts of the world and also in our country for example we call shifting cultivation as koman or bring or pama dabi in odisha we call it as bevar or dhaiya in madhya pradesh we call it as kurwa in jharkhand we call it as khil in the western himalayas we call it as valtre in the southeastern rajasthan so there are multiple names by which this type of agriculture can be called we call it as jhuming in the northeastern part of india okay now let's come to the next part that is intensive subsistence farming now what is this intensive subsistence farming see what happened in our uh, we all know that in our indian society there was a culture of dividing the land okay let's suppose there was a great tau tau means there was a man okay he had four bhav bhav that means he had four sons so let's suppose this tau or this uncle had 10 acres of land so what he will do at the time of his you know when whenever he is alive so he will always love to transfer some part of the land to his sons also that has been a culture in india there is a tau there is uncle he had 10 acres of land he had four sons so he decided to divide his land so every each son will get how many hectares of land 2.5 hectares now these sons will have more sons okay so they will also divide the land amongst themselves so basically this culture of inheritance inheritance means getting something from your parents or their parents this culture of inheritance has led to very small size of lands okay because the land got divided over the period of time so the farmers are having very small size of land at the moment and they want to take out the maximum productivity out of that land so they want to take out the maximum productivity out of that land as a result they use the modern farming inputs as well as a lot of labor to generate the maximum productivity and such type of agriculture is called as the intensive subsistence farming okay so this type of agriculture is very common in the places where the size of land is very less and the population is generally high okay so this type of agriculture is called as intensive subsistence farming in this the farmer has two major objectives number 1 to fulfill the needs of the family second to produce a little extra to earn some income by selling in the market okay now let's come to the next one okay so next is the commercial farming plantation is a very good example of this type of agriculture so plantation okay so commercial farming when you talk about commercial farming basically it's an agriculture that is done to sell the crops in the market it is done by using all the modern farming methods like the use of hiv seeds the chemical fertilizers the insecticides and the pesticides all the modern machineries so that we get a higher input we get a higher productivity from this piece of land again this agriculture is very much expensive because it needs a lot of money it needs a lot of labor to perform this type of agriculture plantation is a very good example of this okay when we talk about plantation it's a type of commercial farming where we grow a single crop over a very large area very very large area a single crop is grown over a very large area for example the tea and the coffee plantations so in the tea and coffee plantations only in tea and coffee will be grown over a very large area so such type of plantation is an example of commercial farming okay fine dosto chalo so these were the types of the commercial farmings now let me have a question from you a quick question okay
इट्स कॉल्ड डैश इन झारखंड ओके फोर ऑप्शन पामादाबी कोमान पूर्वा बेवार डन फोर ऑप्शन हेर वी गो लेट स्टार्ट द पोल Aditya, very, bacha, very simple. I'll be teaching with the geography. Okay, so we have few chapters left. So already, if it exceeds eight hours or eight hour thirty minutes, I'll cover the economics and civics in the next part. Okay, okay. So this is what I said because I also know that if it's a twelve hour video, it will be very difficult for you to watch. So we'll cover the geography at least, and uh, then we'll try to cover civics and economics in the next session. Okay, so that you also have sufficient time to absorb the data, absorb the content. Okay, my dear. so this also i i perfectly understand my dear bachche okay so correct answer is correct answer i just told you that it's kurwa in jharkhand so we call that as kurwa and here we go option number c 100% people have given me the correct answers wow five students answered correctly shahbaz poetic universe shabnam sachin pratap kunal chauhan wow that's nice yaar kunal is doing really good we are hats off from my side bachche kunal chauhan very well efforts very good efforts okay very very good efforts nice okay so see here i have given you a complete list of the country along with the name of the along with the name of the slash and burn agriculture like in mexico we call it as milpa in venezuela as conuco in brazil as roca central africa as masol so we can go through this list let's move further okay now let's talk about the cropping patterns in india or the cropping seasons in india so india has basically three cropping seasons number one the romantic rabi second is the kharif and third is the zaid why i call it a romantic rabi season the reason is this season basically comes during the winter months and winter are the months where you have little bit of rainfall little bit of sunshine and a little bit of cold weather that is a perfect romantic weather right so that is why i call these crops as romantic rabi so rabi crops are grown from uh, basically they are sown from october to december and they are harvested between april to june important crops that is wheat barley peas gram and mustard you can remember any three okay kharif if we talk about they are grown with the beginning of the monsoon in the different parts of the country and you harvest these crops by september and october important crops that we can grow during kharif season is paddy maize jowar bajra moong urad cotton right so these are the major crops that we grow during kharif rabi are basically the winter season crops you will sow these crops around october to december harvest it by april to june kharif crops are sown with the beginning of the monsoon season harvested by september and october and in between rabi and kharif there is a very short summer season that we call as the zaid season so whenever you see in the markets there are cucumbers there are watermelons there are melons you just make a note that this is the time when the kharif the zaid season is going on okay so these are the three major type of seasons that we witness in our country now let's move further okay so we have multiple type of crops that we grow in our countries okay we have food crops we have non food crops so let's talk about food crops that are grains that we call anaj in hindi Okay, so we'll start with the two ones. Number one, wheat and rice. They are very important. So if we talk about rice as a staple food crop, that means we all include rice in our diet. Especially if we talk about few states of India, the rice is very common component of our daily diet. India is the second largest producer of rice in the world after China. I don't know what do the Chinese people eat rice with? Maybe some bad soup, and a dipped in rice, or maybe some chamgadar kurma dipped in rice. I don't know. They might be eating some. Uh, chai, the Chinese food is very real weird. Chinese food is actually not chili potato. They won't be eating chili potato. They have their own chili octopus. Okay, so it is chili potato. We Indians are eating. They eat chili octopus. Tandoori octopus tikka. We have paneer tikka. They have octopus tikka. Reality, but see, it's real. I've seen the markets. Okay, so it's very very simple. So rice is a staple food crop. India is the second largest producer in the world after China. Since we know that rice is a kharif crop. Okay, rice is a kharif crop. That means it requires good rainfall. okay it requires good rainfall second it requires a high temperature above 25 degrees celsius okay high humidity and rainfall above 100 cm okay if we talk about the producers producers we can talk about bihar we can talk about odisha we can talk about the northeastern states of india 
Okay, we can talk about the northeastern states of India. So these are the major producers, the big producers of uh, the rice. Okay, if we talk about wheat, but a wheat is very important one. It's a second most important cereal crop. Okay, it's a main food crop in north and northwestern part of the country. Again, wheat is a rabi crop. Since it's a rabi crop, it's a romantic crop. That means it requires a cool growing season with 50 to 75 centimeter of rainfall distributed throughout the season. That means it should not happen that all the rainfall should happen on one or two days. It should be distributed evenly throughout the season. Apart from that, it needs a bright sunshine during the time of ripening. So when the crop is ready to be harvested, it needs a good and bright sunshine. So major wheat growing regions are the Ganga Satlaj Plains, the northern plains of the India and the Deltaic regions, the Deccan Plateau's Delta, sorry, the Deccan Plateau's Black Soil region, okay. So little bit of Black Soil region of the Deccan Plateau and the Ganga Satlaj northern plain regions. So this is the major areas where we can grow, where we can grow wheat, okay, done. Now let's talk about millets, see millets are again a very important crops. So millets basically refer to the Mota Anaj, Mota Anaj, Dekho, Mota Anaj, okay. So millets are basically the Mota Anaj, they are very nutritious, they have lot of nutrients in them, they are very rich in multiple nutrients. Okay, let's talk about Jwar. So Jwar is one millet that is very important. It is the third most important food crop with respect to area and production. If you talk by area wise and production wise, it is the third most important food crop, right? It's a rain fed crop, so definitely it will grow in the areas where there's a rainfall or there is moisture. Okay, mainly states which produce jowar are Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh. That means, uh, Miri, uh, that is M-A-K or you can remember like this. So, Mary, Mummy, Kanjus, I remember like this. Okay, so I remember is always uh, always like this. That Mary, Mummy, Kanjus. Okay, however, she is not Kanjus. So, Mary, Mummy, Kanjus is Maharashtra. Mummy say Madhya Pradesh and for K you can write Karnataka. So Mary, Mummy, Kanjus that is Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka. So these are some of the major producers of the jar. Okay. Now let's talk about Bajra. So Bajra grows well in sandy soils. Okay. It also grows good in the shallow black soil region. Okay. So Bajra basically again is a millet. It's a mota anaj. Major states you can find Bajra is Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, some parts of Haryana. Okay, some parts of Gujarat and Maharashtra. Okay, so you can remember like this. GMU, you can remember like this. RUP, Roop. You remember like this, Roop. That is RUP, that is Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh and uh, this thing. You can remember like this. You can remember like this, Ram. Ram is Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh and your Maharashtra. Okay, so you can remember like this, RUM. That is Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra. Three states are more than enough. Okay. Now, apart from that, ragi. So, what is ragi? Basically, it's a crop of dry regions. If you go in the hilly areas, ragi dishes are very, very common, right? Okay. So, it grows in a variety of soils. For example, red soil, black soil, sandy soil, loamy soil. Right? So, it grows in a variety of soils. It's a crop of dry regions. That means it can grow in the areas that does not have much rainfall. It's perfect for this. Okay. So, major producing states are Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Himachal, Uttarakhand, Sikkim, Arunachal. So I told you if you go to the hilly and the mountainous regions, you will always find ragi being used in the pahari cuisines. Ragi being used in the pahari food or the mountainous food. So you can remember Himachal, Sikkim, Uttarakhand, Arunachal as the major states that produce your ragi. Okay, simple. That is Meri Mammi Kanjus, Ram and this is uh, again the Himalayan states you can remember. It's very easy. Okay, now. Let's come to your favorite bhutta that you love to eat by applying some nimbu or lemon and a lot of masalas, you know. So basically, let's talk about bhutta or the maize bhutta, bhutta. So what is bhutta or the maize? Very simple. It is also a kharif crop since it's a kharif crop. So definitely it will be requiring temperature between 21 to 27 degrees Celsius. And maize grows well in the old alluvial soil. That's a specialty about maize that it grows well in the old alluvial soil. Now, this can be utilized as by the humans also as well as by the animals also. Okay. So, it is used both as a food as well as the fodder crop. So, it can be utilized both by the humans as well as by the animals. Major states, major states, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, UP, Bihar, KMUB, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, UP, Bihar, okay, Kunal, Mai, okay. So, in Hindi, you have multiple ways to refer to this. In English also can refer to this. Okay, Kunal, my ultra best friend. Yeah, you can write this. 
कुनाल माय अल्ट्रा बेस्ट फ्रेंड ओके बेस्ट फ्रेंड द एफ फ्रेंड इज साइलेंट सो यू कैन रिमेंबर बाय दिस कुनाल माय अल्ट्रा बेस्ट फ्रेंड दैट इज कुनाल कर्नाटका एम मध्य प्रदेश ओके और यू इज उत्तर प्रदेश एंड बी इज बिहार फोर स्टेट्स आर इनफ कुनाल माय अल्ट्रा बेस्ट फ्रेंड ओके और माय अल्टीमेट बेस्ट फ्रेंड यू कैन ऑलवेज रिमेंबर इट लाइक दिस ओके कुनाल माय अल्टीमेट बेस्ट फ्रेंड दैट इज कर्नाटक मध्य प्रदेश उत्तर प्रदेश एंड बिहार फोर स्टेट्स आर मोर देन इनफ ओके नाउ लेट्स टॉक अबाउट पल्सेस और द दालें वी ऑल लव टू ईट दाल इजेंट इट वी ऑल लव टू ईट दाल इन आर फूड सो पल्सेस आर अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्रॉप इन इंडिया इफ यू टॉक अबाउट इंडिया इज द लार्जेस्ट प्रोड्यूसर एंड कंज्यूमर ऑफ पल्सेस सो इंडिया इज द लार्जेस्ट प्रोड्यूसर एज वेल एज कंज्यूमर ऑफ पल्सेस वी फॉलो द टैग लाइन उगाएंगे भी हम एंड खाएंगे भी हम सो वी आर द गाइज हू प्रोड्यूस द मोस्ट एंड वी आर द गाइज हू कंज्यूम द मोस्ट ओके so major source of protein in a vegetarian diet like people like me are depend upon the pulses for you know the major protein because i cannot kill a chicken and eat because chicken will be giving lot of abusive language to me in that case isn't it obviously you kill a person and you start eating with all the zaika and the taste how bad that uh, person will be feeling okay so that's a reason so i was also one point of time in my school time and used to eat a non vegetarian but i left after my school after my class 10th i left after my board exams i stopped eating non veg okay so because i started feeling pity for the chicken right just imagine isn't it you are i'm just eating the chicken and his soul is watching me giving me all the abuse of language it's so bad here yeah? isn't it so it's very very simple so major source of protein in a vegetarian diet the best part they need very less moisture okay so even in the dry conditions you can grow the pulses one more best part about the pulses is that uh, they are leguminous in nature that means they can fix the atmospheric nitrogen and that will help to improve the fertility of the soil except the arher dal arher is a very nalayak dal though it is very tasty you find it in dhabas as dal tadka it's tasty dal it's a tasty pulse but still but say arher is one dal that does not help in the fixation of nitrogen otherwise pulses are leguminous in nature major states it's very simple mur 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 that is madhya pradesh uttar pradesh rajasthan okay and maharashtra and karnataka so you can remember three to four states so they are the major producer of pulses okay now let's talk about food crops or uh, food crops that is other than grains okay that's a very important one we will talk about food crops other than grains okay fair enough fine so let's talk about number 1 that is sugar cane sugar cane is ganna that we all love to enjoy its juice ganne ka juice and summer seasons are a different romantic story all together isn't it now if we talk about the ganna or the sugar cane it's a tropical as well as a subtropical crop okay that means it can grow in both the regions so if we see that india we have two basic regions this is basically this is called as the tropical region and the above part is called as the subtropical region so basically basically sugar cane can be grown in both the areas it grows in a hot and humid climate okay temperature required is 21 to 27 degrees celsius and the rainfall required is 75 to 100 cm if you talk about the major states that produce sugar cane that is up maharashtra karnataka tamil nadu andhra pradesh any four states you can remember right let's talk about oil seeds so oil seeds acha one more point that it needs a lot of manual labor because if we talk about sugar cane sugar cane is one crop that needs careful human supervision because you cannot use machines to cut sugar canes because of the sucrose content that is very fragile so if if the sugar cane is cut in a very wrong manner the sucrose content will be wasted and the whole uh, you can say the entire power of the sugar cane lies in the sucrose content that is the sweetness of the sugar cane okay let's talk about oil seeds oil seeds refer to the those seeds basically that are used to take out oil right 12% of the total area is covered by the oil seeds and out of that the most important one is the groundnut we use these oil seeds for cooking oil okay for also it is used in the production of soaps cosmetics medicines so we have multiple multiple usage of the oil seeds okay i'll show you some okay so basically the most important oil seed is the groundnut okay groundnut again is a kharif crop so basically go in the kharif season then we have mustard or sarso it's a rabi crop then we have sesame or the til that is again very important one we make laddus of til we also take out the oil of til then we have the castor seeds which is again used for medicinal purposes then we have the linseed again it is used for multiple weight management medicines and the different purposes 
okay cotton seed then we have coconut seed used to produce coconut oil then we have soybean seeds used to produce the soybean oil then again we have the sunflower seeds we also produce oil using the sunflower seeds and then we have the rape seed that is used in multiple medicines and cosmetics and also for the oil production right now let's talk about the tea cultivation okay my dear bachcho so what is tea tea is something that we all need a lot isn't it at this point of time where well i am a coffee lover die hard coffee lover but i will not be oh, you know uh, i will be very much okay with a good strong cup of tea also because that will help me to give lot lots of energy isn't it so tea is the example of plantation crop if you talk about tea was introduced by the britishers in india so we were not aware about this tea crop so tea is something that we drink on a daily basis and we always say that india runs on chai okay so that is very true because right in the morning you must be seeing that in your household also mama must be preparing the tea for your papa and the other family members in the all the tapris the local tea shops that we found people must be sitting sipping a cup of tea okay so tea is an important uh, you can say that plantation crop it requires warm and moist climate it should be frost free okay with frequent uh, rainfall throughout the year major states if we talk about are assam hills of darjeeling and jalpaiguri west bengal even in the karnataka also tea plantations are there now let's come to my favorite that is coffee so indian coffee is known for its good quality throughout the world okay so if you talk about it was introduced introduced by baba budan okay so basically the coffee beans the coffee variety arabica variety of coffee that is the best quality coffee that was introduced by a uh, baba budan from yemen so he used to work there he brought the coffee beans from there and he planted in the hills of nilgiri okay so even today also if you see that the coffee plantations are very much limited to the nilgiri hills and especially in the areas of kerala karnataka and tamil nadu right okay apart from this india is also a home to a lot of horticulture crops okay what are horticulture crops these are the crops basically it refers to the fruits and their vegetables that we grow on a great basis if you talk about india produces 13% of the world's vegetables so out of the entire vegetables that are produced and consumed in the world 13% of it comes from india okay let's have a question on this let's have a question here okay so you all might be waiting for the polls let's have a question a quick question dash baba ramchand baba budan baba ramdev Yeah, none of these. Okay, so we have four options, but you we have four options here, and thirty seconds time period. Your time starts now. Very nice. Very nice. Study life, sir. Class, कब end होगा बच्चे? Very simple, my dear. Uh, we have two more chapters to go from geography. After that. Uh, I end the class. Okay, so we'll keep it maximum to eight hours only. We'll do a part two of this marathon as well. Otherwise, okay, very nice. But a Hindi ka marathon nahi hai. Okay, so very very simple. It's a marathon in pure English for all the students jinko Hindi nahi aata bache. तो हिंदी वाला जो मैराथन चलता है भाई वो पीडब्ल्यू फाउंडेशन पे चलता है जिसमें हम भी हिंदी में बोलते हैं बच्चे भी हिंदी में सुनते हैं हिंदी और इंग्लिश मिक्स करके सो ये चैनल ही उन बच्चों के लिए जिनको हिंदी समझ में नहीं आती ठीक है बेटा ठीक है प्यारे बच्चे तो अगर आपने अभी ज्वाइन किया इट्स वेरी वेरी सिंपल सो यू कैन मतलब मतलब यहाँ आपको बता सकता हूँ ठीक है तो अगर आप कंफर्टेबल नहीं है इंग्लिश में बेटा तो आप अभी मैराथन्स आएंगे फाउंडेशन चैनल्स के ऊपर तो वहां पर आप जाकर के बच्चे हिंदी और इंग्लिश मिक्स वाला पढ़ सकते हैं ठीक है सॉर्टेड है क्लियर है चलिए तो भाई हर एक बच्चा जरूरी है हर एक बच्चा इंपॉर्टेंट है एंड लेट्स मूव फर्दर 
ओके सो करेक्ट आंसर इज ऑप्शन नंबर बी दैट इज बाबा भूतान सो लेट्स कम विद दिस ओके भाई यहां तो मोहमो हो गया यार तुम लोग के साथ दिस वेरी बैड इट्स वेरी वेरी बैड दिस पोल इज गेटिंग स्टक लेट मी हैव वन मोर क्वेश्चन लेट मी हैव वन मोर क्वेश्चन फॉर यू ओके सो क्वेश्चन इज वेरी सिंपल डैश ऑफ द वर्ल्ड वेजिटेबल्स ओके डन फोर्टीन परसेंट सिक्सटीन परसेंट थर्टीन परसेंट और फिफ्टीन परसेंट डन लेट स्टार्ट द पोल ओके हाय बुडानियन हाउ आर यू वेरी नाइस वेरी नाइस यार वेरी वेरी नाइस ओके सुपर भैया सुपर अमेजिंग ओके वेरी नाइस अथर वेरी नाइस हाय अर्पित फरुखाबादी वेरी नाइस ओके सुपर ओके सो बच्चे हिंदी का कब होगा भाई हिंदी वाला जो है बच्चे दैट विल बी ऑन पीडब्ल्यू फाउंडेशन चैनल तो आप वहां पे ज्वाइन कर सकते हैं वो आपका शॉर्टली स्टार्ट हो जाएगा एक दो दिन के अंदर ठीक है सॉर्टेड चलिए ओके देखो एक बड़ा मस्त नाम बताता हूं देखो देखो बहुत सिंपल है लेट मी टेल यू अ वेरी ब्यूटिफुल स्टोरी दे वॉज अ गाय है ना Who kept on wasting the time in spamming in the comment section? Hai na? Like, let me tell you one thing. When you fall in the category of spammers, no one actually notices you because you are the guy who is wasting your time to the maximum possible extent. And these people, when they sit to give the exams, they are still, you know, looking here and there because most of the time they sp spend in spamming the comment section. So, but say, let me tell you, spammers are one people, one category of students. They are not students actually. Let me tell you very, very carefully. So spammers are one category of people because students they are so much involved into studying that they don't have time to spam or waste on the chats. So spammers are those category of people those who have nothing to do in life. Okay, and if in case, if in case, but say they, I mean, spammers are one guys who always seek attention. They are like you know, sir, attention, give to sir, attention, give to, boy. Okay, so, but say all those students who are seriously studying, uh, it's a humble request. to just focus on the lectures okay to focus on what you are doing because spammers have no life to live very simple as that hai na so it's like unka jeevan mein hi spam karne mein chala jayega to karne do yaar koi dikkat nahi hai theek hai so let's move further very very simple so let the spammers live their life and let's focus on what we are studying okay it's very simple as that because end of the day what matters the most is students are the ones who should get benefit okay and that is the reason okay so pw ke upar na bhai ek cheez pata hai khas kya hai we are one person we who focus on each and every student chahe wo bachcha kahin se bhi aa raha ho that is the best part aisa nahi hota ki sirf hindi wale bachche ko padha rahe hain aisa nahi hota ki bechara jo bachcha sirf english padha usi ko padha rahe hain so why this platform as pw english is also there is for all the students who don't understand hindi bahut sare aise bachche hain jinko hindi samajh nahi aata so they are more comfortable in english and for us each and every student is important whether it is a spammer it's a non spammer it's a person who loves to waste his time or the person who is very serious about studies right so for us har ek bachcha zaruri hai aur har ek bachche ko padhana zaruri hai theek hai and you guys are the real source of motivation bhai theek hai so all my lovely students who are not comfortable in hindi they are comfortable in english and are dedicating their time to the session pehli baar to dil se salute yaar and lots of love to you guys and let's focus back on the chapter let's focus back on what we are doing okay so multiple distractions life mein aayenge to sahi samajhdar vyakti wahi hota hai jo distractions ko side karta hai aur life mein aage badhta hai because the people who distract and the distractions they have no worth at all 
So very simple as that. So always focus on your goals, guys. Lot of distractions will keep coming in life. So never focus on the distractions. Focus on what you are doing. Okay. So all my lovely students, let's get back. So very simple. So correct answer is option number C. That is thirteen percent. And here we go. Bye. This is something happening with the leaderboards. कुछ तो हो रहा है यार leaderboards के साथ. No worries. We'll again try to take a poll after some time. Well, all the students have given me the correct answers. A big thumbs up for them. चलो. So let's talk about some crops that are non-food. Okay. So so far we have discussed about the crops that are food. Okay, food crops that are grain crops. Now let's talk about the crops that are non-food. That means we do not consume them. We do not eat them, right? So these crops are also equally important. Okay, these crops are also equally important, right? But so very very simple. So number one, let's start with the uh, first crop that is rubber. So basically, this is a very fine chart, very very fine chart, yar, hai na? And this will help you a lot to recall all the topics in very simple terms. Now, okay, so let's talk about rubber as an equatorial crop. So number one, so we have a lot of uses of rubber, isn't it? We use rubber to make tires. We use rubber to make lot of things. Okay, for cushioning purposes. So rubber is an equatorial crop. Now, what do you mean by this? It's a very simple to understand. Rubber can be grown in the regions which are very near to the equator. So whenever if you talk about if you talk about the Indian regions that are very near to the equator, it can be easily observed. We are talking about the states of Kerala. We are talking about the states of Tamil Nadu. We are talking about the islands of Andaman and Nicobar. So these are the regions that are very nearby to the equator. So these regions have two positive things. Number one, they are receiving a lot amount of sunlight. Okay, so the sunlight received will be very much in amount. Second thing, since there are a lot of water bodies or oceans around, so they will also receive a good amount of rainfall. And these are the perfect conditions for the growth of for the growth of bacho rubber. Okay, so rubber requires a moist and humid climate. Rainfall should be two hundred centimeters and above, and temperature should be more than twenty five degree Celsius. Right now. it's an important industrial raw material that it is used in multiple industries second mainly where will grow this karnataka kerala tamil nadu the places down in the south southern part of the country nearby to the equator andaman and nicobar and garo hills of himalaya it's very easy to find out the states kerala karnataka tamil nadu andaman nicobar and garo hills of himalaya the perfect places where rubber can be grown now let's talk about the fiber crops So when we talk about the fiber crops, these crops are utilized for multiple things. For example, making fabrics or cloth. For example, cotton, silk. Okay, or making jute bags, gunny bags. So when we are talking about the fiber crops, okay. So what do we have? Cotton, jute, hemp, natural silk. So these are the four major fiber crops. Out of this, the three crops are grown in soil. That is, cotton, jute, and hemp are grown in the soil. And when we talk about silk, this particular crop is basically grown. uh with the help of the silk worms okay now let's understand this so cotton jute and hemp are grown in the soil whereas the natural silk is obtained from the cocoons of the silk worms so silk worm is basically a insect it is left to feed on the mulberry leaves so mulberry is a plant so when the silk worms are released on the mulberry leaves they start eating that after some time they you know they form a cocoon or a cover over themselves and these cocoons are then taken then boiled and the fibers are taken out of it and then silk is manufactured right so the rearing of silk worm for production of silk is called as sericulture okay now let's move further okay let's talk about cotton as a kharif crop okay now when we talk about cotton as a kharif crop it requires high temperature it requires light rainfall and very important 210 frost free days now you must have seen that especially during the winters what happens there is a white colored powdery substance that gets deposited on the plants so that is basically the frost okay now what happens here is it requires a higher temperature it requires a light rainfall and 210 frost free days and a bright sunshine for the growth okay so these are important factors they may also give you a question they may give you the climatic condition and they may ask you to identify the crop so cotton is one crop that has been asked frequently over the period of time okay now so cotton grows in black soil we all have studied that in the first chapter also that black soil is very perfect soil for the growth of cotton so especially deccan plateau is the ideal region where you can find the cotton plants right for example the region of maharashtra gujarat mp karnataka right tamil nadu telangana so basically this region is the perfect region for the growth of cotton plant now let's come to the jute see jute is also known as the golden fiber 
So if we talk about the growth of jute, so jute grows well on the well-drained fertile soils, especially in the areas that are very prone to flooding. So what do we call as areas that are very prone to flooding? That is flood plains. Okay. So if we talk about Bengal, so Bengal region is very prone to flooding. That means every year we will see that lot of floods come in that region. And that is the ideal condition for the growth of jute. So high temperature is a very good requirement for the growth of jute. Okay. Apart from that, what do we use jute for? We use jute for making bags, we use jute for making ropes and mats, okay, and other types of carpets and other articles. So, jute has a great demand in the market, okay. So, if we talk about the major jute producing states, West Bengal tops the list, then we have Bihar, then we have Assam, Odisha and Meghalaya, okay, fair enough. So, what are the major states? West Bengal, Bihar, Assam, Odisha and Meghalaya, okay. Now, let's move further, okay. So, this is the last and the most important topic bachcho, of your entire chapter that is technological and your institutional reform. See, we all know one important fact that agriculture is one activity on which our country depends heavily. Even today, if we talk about in terms of employment, agriculture has a great contribution. So, when we talk about the, the time of independence, when India got independent, Indian agriculture was in a very poor state. There were many reasons for that. Okay, the number one, the first reason was because the Britishers have exploited the Indian agriculture as a result. As a result, what happened? Indian agriculture was in turmoils. Zamindari system, that was a very bad system because of which a lot of lands were under the hands or accumulated under the hands of one single person. Okay, so the task of the newly elected government was to improve the Indian agriculture because that was very important to fulfill the demands of food grains for the Indian people. Right, okay, now let's move further. So, more than 60% of the India's population, it depends upon the agriculture. So, after independence, our government made some important institutional reforms like collectivization, consolidation of holdings and cooperation. Okay, very simple. Let me simplify this for you. So, what did the government do? The government, first of all, it collected all the scattered lands in the area. Then, it took away the land from different zamindars, abolished the zamindari system and it consolidated that means join together the different lands so that farming can now be done over these lands so farmer were asked to perform farming on these lands okay as a result productivity will increase right so these were some few of the reforms then if when uh, then government realized that again these reforms are not working well so what did the government do government introduced some revolutions called as the agricultural revolutions in 1960s and 70s the first one was the green revolution so here the entire focus was to make india self sufficient in the food grains so that we don't have to import food grains from some other place right so very simple in 1960s and 70s green revolution and white revolution took place see white revolution is also known as operation flood okay so this particular revolution was aimed at boosting the dairy production okay so this particular revolution was aimed at boosting the dairy production whereas the green revolution focused on the self sufficiency in food grains there was one more revolution also called as the blue revolution okay so blue revolution basically focused on blue revolution basically focused on improving the production of the fisheries okay the fish production so there were three agricultural revolutions number one green second is blue, uh, white also called as operation flood and the third one is blue okay now apart from that the government also launched multiple schemes in 1980s and 90s for example crop insurance against any kind of you know uh, climatic disaster against any kind of uh, you know destruction of the crops so farmers were given insurance with respect to this Establishment of the Grameen Banks and Cooperative Societies so that farmers can get easy loans at low rate of interest. That is very crucial. Okay. Apart from that, Kisan Credit Card and Personal Accidental Insurance Scheme. These were launched in Kisan Credit Card. Farmers were given a certain amount of credit using which these people can, you know, purchase or buy the agricultural products okay in uh, on credit and then they can repay back whenever they have the money. So these were some of the in schemes that were introduced for the betterment of the farmers. Then special weather bulletins were organized, agricultural programs were organized to educate the farmers with respect to the agricultural needs. Okay. Apart from that, minimum support price was introduced for the farmers. That means minimum support price is that price at which the government is ready to buy the crops from the farmers. So this at least it's a type of incentive we give to the farmers for producing the different crops. Right. Then remuneration price. Okay, apart from that, so these activities were basically done so that the farmers can be prevented from the scam of the middlemen. Because earlier what happened, there were multiple middlemen that we call Dalal in Hindi. Okay, that used to uh, buy the crops at a very less price from the farmers and sell it at a higher price than the international or the national markets. 
So as a result, in order to stop such kind of exploitation of the farmers, the government decided to announce certain prices so that government directly will buy the crops from the farmers. Okay. Now, so again, the chapter ends on the note of Bhudan Gramda. Now, this is very important. Why? Because Bhudan Gramdan can be asked in the form of a case study. See, what is Bhudan Gramdan? Understand it very nicely. Okay. Now, so what happened? Mahatma Gandhi, he declared Vinoba Bhave as his spiritual heir. Spiritual heir means whatever activities Gandhi used to do, Vinoba Bhave was asked to promote that. Now, what happened here? Vinoba Bhave was once in Andhra Pradesh in a village called Pochampalli. So, what happened? He was basically uh, promoting the idea of Gram Swaraj, the concept of Gandhi. So, he was carrying out a Padyatra. Uh, uh, like Padyatra means when you walk and go to some places. So, he was in a village called Pochampalli in Andhra Pradesh. When all of a sudden what happened, uh, a farmer came up to Vinoba Bhave and requested him to ask the government to distribute the land among the landless farmers, uh, the landless uh, people, those who did not have their own land. So now Vinoba Bhave was very much astonished. He said that all of a sudden, how can I arrange for the same? So at this very moment, there was a person called Sri Ram Chandra Reddy. He stood up and he distributed 80 acres of land among the landless farmers. And this act was called as, called as Bhudan, right? Inspired by this, there were many people who donated entire villages to such landless people. They gave a lot of land to these landless people. Okay. So this movement came to be called as Bhudan Gramdan, also known as the bloodless revolution. Since because there was no fightings, no bloodshed. So hence it is also called as the bloodless revolution. So Bhudan Gramdan is very important with respect to Bacho, your case study based questions. Okay. Now, so let's have a question here. This also ends your chapter agriculture. Which among the following was also known as the bloodless revolution? Done. Four options. Bhudan Jeevandan, option B, Jal Jeevan Mission, option C, Gram Swaraj Mission, and option D, Bacho, Bhudan Gramdan. So let's start with the polls. 30 seconds ka poll hai bacha wadi and let's get started. Chalo. Bawadhi simple. Good evening Anushka. Bita Hindi mein marathon nahi hai. Hai na my dear bachche. So this is a channel that is pure English channel. Pure English. Hindi wala marathon foundation channel pe chalega balak. ठीक है तो इट्स अ प्योर इंग्लिश चैनल दैट इज व्हाई मैं प्योर इंग्लिश में आपको पढ़ा रहा हूं तो जो हिंदी इंग्लिश वाला चैनल मतलब जो आपका मैराथन होता है ना दैट इज देयर ऑन फाउंडेशन चैनल तो अभी शॉर्टली आने वाला है सो हियर वी आर डूइंग अ मैराथन फॉर द स्टूडेंट्स जिनको हिंदी समझ में नहीं आती ठीक है समोसा आ, अभी भिजवाता हूं रुक जाओ ओके हाय उड़ान 3.0 but a board itself is an amazing experience. You should not worry about that. You will love giving the boards. Because first of all, you will get a chance to go to some other school to give the board examinations. That paper, that field, that is unmatchable, guys. Believe me. It's people, they unnecessarily scare you from the board examinations. But it's a very beautiful, it's a very, very beautiful experience, guys. Believe me, it's a wonderful, beautiful experience. You will love giving the board examinations. Do not be afraid. Do not be scared. Just keep on practicing. Just keep on practicing the questions. And that's all. So, correct answer is Bhudan Gramdan Mission. So, you don't have to be scared, my dear. Option number D is here. Okay. My dear, some problem is there with the polls. I'll have to restart it. Just give me a moment. I'll have to restart this polls. 
okay so there is some issue with the poles i'll have to restart the poles Okay, so I'll just restart the polls. Give me a moment. Okay, so just I'll restart the polls. Give me a moment, guys. And then we will be good to go. Okay. Fair enough. Okay, done. So let me get back. Let me get back to you. I guess we are good to go. Okay, so I guess we are good to go. So beta, I'll again re release the poll and now let's let me know if the poll is working fine. Okay, so I'll release the poll once again. I'll release the poll for one last students once again and just let me know if you are getting the correct answers or not. Okay, so just you have to mention A, B, C or D on your chat and the answers will be recorded. That's all. Okay. Aniket, beta, let, 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 let me finish with the session first. Okay, let me finish with the session first. Hi, Alaka, hello, beta. Uh, hi, Atish. No, no, it's not over yet. It's not over till it's over. Okay. Beta, speak in Hindi. Shari Shriyansh Tiwari, this is not the Hindi channel, my dear. This is PW English channel. Hindi wala marathon chalta hai foundation pe. Hai na? <laughs> Bhai, mereko abhi na ID card lagana padega idhar gale mein. Ki beta, Hindi wala marathon chalta hai foundation channel pe. Abhi start hoga. This is a pure English channel for all the students jinko Hindi samaj mein nahi aata bhalak. Har ek ko Hindi bhaasha nahi samaj mein aata. To un bachso ke liye marathon hai. Those who understand English. Hai na, mere piyare bachse? Thik hai? I hope it, I am very clear about this. Okay. To abhi mereko lagta hai answer a jana chahi. That is option number D, Bhudan Gramdan. So option number D is absolutely correct and here we go. Oh bhai, ye, some issues are there guys. Some issues are there. I don't know what's the issue. Some issues are there with the polls. Okay. No worries. We'll see if this gets sorted out. Okay. Now, let's start with the another chapter. The second last chapter for geography guys. We have been studying for continuously 7 hours, 32 minutes approximately. So let's, let's, let's start with the Second last chapter of uh, the geography that is minerals and energy resources. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> but say it's a lot of okay. So a lot of people say, sir, what are minerals? Mineral is nothing but you can say a kind of element that is extracted from the rocks. They may look something like this. Just it's just an example how the minerals look, right? But minerals are really very, very important for our survival because we use the minerals in multiple sources. We use it in multiple things. Okay, so let's move further. Okay, so number one, what is a mineral? That's a very good question, sir. What is a mineral? So mineral is a homogeneous and naturally occurring substance that has a definite internal structure, right? So it can be found in various forms. It can be hardest like the diamond or it can be very soft like the talc. Okay. So when we talk about minerals, minerals are generally found in ores. Okay. So they are generally found in ores. So basically ores are the rocks in which you can find minerals along with the other elements that are uh, available in the same rock. Okay. So when you talk about minerals, we find it in multiple places. For example, you can find minerals in igneous and metamorphic rocks. So in such kind of rocks, minerals are generally found in the cracks okay generally found in the cracks smaller openings right so if you are found there uh, so basically they are found in the cracks or the smaller openings okay if you talk about the sedimentary rocks the minerals can be found trapped in the layers because these rocks if you see are in the formation of layers so minerals can be found trapped in the layers now if you talk about some minerals are formed by decomposition of the rocks when the main rocks it breaks down the soluble components of the rocks, it gets washed away with the water. Then whatever is left out, in that also we can find minerals. Example, bauxite is a very good example for this. Then, at some times, we can also find minerals in the alluvial soils, right? So, some, for example, if there is a valley, and if you find out the floor of the valley that is covered with the alluvial soil, in that also at times we can find the minerals. Also at the base of the hills also we can find the minerals. Oceans are a storehouse of minerals. However, there is one problem with the ocean that most of the minerals present in the oceans are so much diffused in water that it is very difficult to take out. But still sodium chloride, NaCl or bromine are some examples. 
of the minerals that are taken out from ocean waters manganese is also a very good example of the minerals taken out from ocean water right now moving on further how do we classify the minerals but it's very easy to classify so how do we classify the minerals number one we classify the minerals into three form that is metallic minerals non-metallic minerals and the energy minerals okay so when you talk about metallic minerals we divide them into ferrous non-ferrous and precious okay ferrous that means that contain iron for example iron or manganese nickel cobalt non-ferrous that means that does not contain iron example copper lead bauxite and precious minerals example gold and silver something that is loved by your mothers yeah very simple and papa you know it's a very hefty price on the papa's pocket let's talk about non-metallic minerals that does not contain metals in any form like mica, potash, salt, sulfur, granite, limestone, energy minerals that are used to produce energy like the coal, petroleum and the natural gas. Okay, now let's move further. Now, so when you talk about the ferrous minerals, okay, so when you talk about ferrous minerals, ferrous minerals are those that contain iron in one or the other form. Okay, so they make up three by fourth of the total value of the minerals produced in the country, especially the metallic minerals. Okay, so if we talk about India has rich deposits of iron ore resources. So, if we talk about the quality of the iron ore, magnetite is the finest quality of iron ore as it has 70% of iron content. Now, as the name says magnetite, now this type of iron ore is very magnetic, okay. So, it's a kind of iron ore that is very much black in color. It's a handsome iron ore, right. And since handsome guys have a magnetic property to attract people, right. So, same way this magnetite also has a property to attract. That is why it is called as magnetite, 70% of iron content. Right, it has excellent magnetic qualities. Hematite ore is the most important industrial ore. It contains 50 to 60 percent of uh, iron. There is one more quality of iron ore that is called as limonite. However, limonite is again a poor quality of iron ore. Okay, so limonite is a poor quality of iron ore. So, so best quality of iron ore is magnetite. Industrial iron ore is uh, hematite. That again is a fine quality of iron ore. And the worst quality is the lemonite. Okay. Now, if you talk about the major iron ore belts in India, wherever the iron ore is found, when we have the Odisha Jharkhand belt, okay, so if you talk about Odisha Jharkhand, then especially in the Mayurbhanj districts of Odisha, you can find good deposits of iron ore. If you talk about Durg Bastar Chandrapur belt, okay, I also call it as Dabang Bhojpuri channel belt. So, this is basically found in Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra region. So, if you go to Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra, you will find this particular belt, okay, Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra. So, if you find Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra, you will find this particular belt. Okay, that is Durg, Bastar and Chandrapur. Then Ballari, Chitradurg, Chikmangaluru, Tumkuru belt. I call it as BC quality. So, this belt is very famous and it is generally found in Karnataka. Done. Okay. So, BC quality belt that is Ballari, Chitradurg, Chikmangaluru, Tumkuru belt. This belt is generally found in Karnataka. And then we have the Maharashtra Goa belt. Right. So, if you talk about so Maharashtra and Goa, that is also a very important belt. As most of the iron ore produced here is used to export to the other countries okay but so now so what we studied that ferrous minerals have a great importance in the indian economy as they account for a lot of metallic mineral production apart from that we uh, say that india has a good resource of iron ore we studied about the qualities of iron ore with magnetite being the best quality with 70 percent iron content then we have uh, this thing hematite with uh, 50 to 60 percent of iron content and the worst quality is the limonite. Then we talked about the major iron ore belts, Odisha Jharkhand belt, I call it as DJ Orange Zerila belt. Okay, then Dabang Bhojpuri channel belt, yani Durg Bastar Chandrapur belt lies in Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra. Then the BC quality belt, yani Ballari, Chitradurg, Chikmangaluru, Tumkur belt lies in Karnataka and the Mogambo belt that is Maharashtra and Goa. So these are the major iron ore belts in India where you can find the iron ore deposits. Now let's talk about manganese. See. Manganese is again another important metallic mineral. So, it is mainly used in the manufacturing of steel and the ferromanganese alloy. Okay, 10 kg of manganese is required to manufacture 1 ton of steel. So, it has a great requirement in the steel industry. Also, it is used in manufacturing the bleaching powders, insecticides and paints. Right. So, if it comes to the usage of manganese, this question if asked will be asked in the three markers. Okay, now let's move further. Let's talk about the non-ferrous minerals. Okay, let's talk about the non-ferrous minerals. Very simple. So, non-ferrous minerals include copper, bauxite, lead, zinc and gold. So, these are the minerals that do not contain iron in any form, right? However, they play a great amount of role in the metallurgical industries, electrical industries. For example, let's talk about copper. Copper is a great malleable ductile element that is and a very good conductor of heat and electricity. So, we know that copper is used to make the copper sheets and the copper wires. It's used in electrical cables, especially in the electronics industries, right? 
So if we talk about the copper production, then the Balaghat mines in Madhya Pradesh and the Khetri mines of Rajasthan, they are famous for producing the copper. Apart from this, the Singham district of Jharkhand is also an important producer of copper. Okay. So what are the major regions? Madhya Pradesh ka Balaghat mines, Khetri mines in the Rajasthan and the Singham district of Jharkhand are the leading producers of the copper. Okay, done. Let's come to the bauxite. Now, bauxite is a very interesting, very, very interesting, uh, you can say that... Uh, very interesting element. Now, why? See, bauxite basically is uh, basically is extracted from the rocks that are rich in aluminum silicate. So, when these rocks decompose, we can find bauxite. So, we obtain aluminum from bauxite. So, basically, uh, bauxite is the ore of the aluminum. That means the rock from which the aluminum is obtained. And we talk about aluminum is utilized in multiple ways. It is a very good conductor of electricity, right? It has a great malleability. It can be drawn into wires. You can make aluminum wires. You can make aircraft parts from aluminum. You can use the aluminum to make utensils, right? So if we talk about the distribution of aluminum, mainly you will be able to find aluminum in the Amar Kantak Plateau region and the Michael Hills as well as the region of the Bilaspur Katni. So, these are three major big regions of the aluminium production. That is Amar Kantak Plateau, the Michael Hills and the Bilaspur Katni region. Okay. So, so, let's move on further. Now, let's talk about non-metallic minerals. Now, this is a very super important one. Lot of questions have been asked in previous years. Okay. So, I'll give this question as three number or three marks. So, it's a very, very important topic. It's a very, very important topic. But show. So, this question has been asked several times. This question has been asked several times. That is mica, the usage of mica, the importance of mica in electronic industries. Now, mica is the mineral that is made of series of plates, series of thin sheets, you can say. Okay, so you can say that it can be very much clear. It can be black in color. It is green in color, red in color, yellow in color, brown in color. It can appear in multiple forms, right? Then mica is a very important mineral in the electronic industries. And why is it so? Because of some properties. See, if we talk about mica has excellent dielectric strength. It has a very low power loss factor and it has perfect insulating properties. That means it can resist even a very high voltage. So, especially in electronic industries, it can be used as a very good insulator to prevent against the high voltage. If you talk about the mica deposits, then mica deposits are generally found on the northern edge of the Chota Nagpur plateau, right? So, it is found on the northern edge of the Chota Nagpur plateau. So, this is all about mica, guys. Now, let's talk about the rock minerals, right? So, there are some rocks that are important minerals, for example, limestone. So, limestone is basically found in the rocks that are rich in calcium carbonates, or calcium and magnesium carbonates. Now, limestone is a very crucial material when it comes to the cement industry or when it comes to iron ore industry because limestone is added as a flux agent in order to remove the impurities from the iron ore. So, limestone has a great industrial usage. Now, let's move further, guys. Okay. Now, the question is, sir, why to conserve the minerals? It's very simple here. Mineral deposits, we know that they are very less in amount. If you talk about only 1% of the total earth crust, if you talk about the geological process of mineral formation is very slow, okay, the consumption is very fast, the mineral for, for formation process is very slow. So, at the rate at which we are consuming the minerals at the moment, very soon it may happen that the minerals, we may run out of it. Okay, so minerals resources or uh, you can say that deposits may get exhausted. So, definitely we have to conserve the minerals in order for the future generation usage. Okay, now let's move further. So, how to conserve minerals? Very simple. A joint effort has to be made in order to uh, com conserve the minerals that we can go with the sustainable development approach, right? We can use better technologies so that we can, you know, even use the low quality of ores available. Recycling of metals can be one good uh, way of, you know, uh, this thing, recycling of metals using the reduce, reuse, recycle process in order to conserve and save the minerals, right, Bacho? Okay, now let's move further. Okay, so before this, I have a uh, question for you. Okay, so let's have a question here. Let's try to solve this question at least. Let I'll try giving you the polls. If the polls work, it well and good. If the polls don't work, then also you can attempt the question in the chats. Okay, very simple.
ड्यू टू इज डाय इलेक्ट्रिक स्ट्रेंथ हाई पावर लोस फैक्टर इलेक्ट्रिक स्ट्रेंथ मीडियम पावर लॉस फैक्टर ड्यू टू लो पावर लॉस फैक्टर और बोथ एन बी ओके सो वी हैव फोर ऑप्शन आउट एयर गाइस ठीक है चार ऑप्शन है बच्चों तो मैं पोल्स एक बार ट्राई करता हूं रिलीज करने के अगर पोल्स आ जाते हैं तो वेल एंड गुड ओके सो लेट मी ट्राई रिलीजिंग द पोल्स एंड थर्टी सेकेंड्स का पोल है गिव यू द थर्टी सेकेंड्स पोल है एंड लेट मी सी द पोल बॉक्स ओके बच्चे देर इज ऑलरेडी आ क्लास आई टोक ऑन पिक्चर बेस्ड एंड मैप बेस्ड क्वेश्चन इन द वॉरियर बैच एंड दैट्स अंग्लिश बैच ऑन पीडब्ल्यू फाउंडेशन चैनल सो यू कैन वॉच दैट क्लास ऑल्सो वी हैव ऑलरेडी कवर्ड बच्चे वहां पे द पिक्चर बेस्ड क्वेश्चन देर ओके हाई प्रत्यूष समोसा कहा है इट्स ऑलरेडी इन द मेकिंग आई आस्ट डॉगेस्ट माई डियर टू यू नो डिलीवर द समोसा टू यू ओके हाउ लॉन्ग इज द क्लास बेटा आफ्टर दैट हिंदी में अभी नहीं होगा वो वाला हिंदी में है पिक्चर बेस इज इन हिंदी इन वॉरियर वाला बैच ओके सो दैट इज ऑन पीडब्ल्यू फाउंडेशन चैनल ओके सो दिस इज पीडब्ल्यू इंग्लिश चैनल एंड दैट इज वाई द क्लास इज इन प्योर इंग्लिश ठीक है फॉर ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स जिनको हिंदी समझ नहीं आती उनके लिए बेटा यहाँ क्लास है आई होप दिस क्लियर सो डाउट सो हेयर यू सी इफ द क्वेश्चन हार्ड बीन इट इज इट हैज अ लो पावर लॉस फैक्टर सो दिस ऑप्शन नंबर ए इज डिलीटेड so so option number B is also deleted so we can only go with option number C so correct answer is option number C but there is some issue with the polls that are not working at all and uh, let me call someone the correct answer is option number C सम इश्यू विद द पोल्स मैं अभी देखने गया था सो दो इज नो वन अवेलेबल सो इफ समन कम्स आई जस्ट यू नो आज द पर्सन टू जस्ट करेक्ट विद द पोल्स ओके डन सो करेक्ट आंसर वॉज ड्यू टू लो पावर लॉस फैक्टर सी नो डाउट इट हैज अ डाई इलेक्ट्रिक स्ट्रेंथ बट द प्रॉब्लम इज बट से दैट इट शुड ऑल्सो हैव एन ऑप्शन ऑफ लो पावर लॉस फैक्टर विच वॉज नॉट द केस इन ऑप्शन नंबर ए एंड ऑप्शन नंबर बी सो हेन्स ऑप्शन नंबर सी इज द मोस्ट अप्रोप्रिएट आंसर डन ओके Now let's talk about the energy resources, which is again. So we have almost done the seventy percent part of the chapter. So we are left with energy resources. I'll teach you after this one more chapter of geography. So finally we'll wind up with the geography as a part, and we will complete economics and civics in the next part. Okay, because again if I'll continue with the economics and civics, it will be a very long video, which again the students will not be able to come back and see. So that is not going to help you guys. So that uh, so we'll cover the part two that is. Economics and civics in the uh, again next lecture, right? So I'll finish with the one more lecture after this. That is, sorry, one more topic after this in manufacturing industries, and then we are good to go, right? Now, so let's talk about energy resources. It's very simple, yar. We need energy for everything, right? We need energy to cook. We need energy to provide light and heat. Okay, we need energy to basically you can say that run the vehicles or drive the machinery in the industries. Okay. so it can be generated from lot of fuels for example coal petroleum we burn them we generate energy okay or it can be also generated from nuclear waste like for example you know uh, processing the radioactive elements like uranium now energy resources can be classified into two categories number one conventional and second one is the non conventional so conventional resources are the one that we have been using so far so generally they are non renewable in nature for example fire wood cattle dung cakes coal petroleum natural gas so these are the resources that we have been using in a lower a long period of time so most of them they are non renewable in nature now let's talk about non conventional resources so these are basically those resources that we generally do not use at a great point right so these are mostly renewable in nature example solar power wind power tidal power geothermal power so they are good environment friendly as well as renewable in nature as well okay 
done so let's move further let's talk about coal so coal is most abundant available fossil fuel that we find in good amounts so it is used for power generation we also use it to supply for industry or for the domestic uses now it is formed due to the compression of plant material so plants and animals when they died over a period of time they got decomposed and under great intense heat and pressure they converted into coal so that is basically where coal comes from so in india in india we have two types of coal right basically two uh, regions of coal where you can find coal one is the gondwana deposit and second is the tertiary deposit coming over to the categories of coal we have number one peat so peat is has low carbon content and very high moisture so if we talk about the heating capacity of peat is very less so peat is the most worst quality of coal you can say lignite it's a low grade brown coal it is soft because it has a lot of moisture so just remember one simple fact the type of coal that will be the best coal is the coal having the least moisture if the coal is moisturized then it will not burn properly and this is the case with the peat and lignite if you talk about bituminous bituminous coal is the industrial coal it is a fine variety of coal okay and it is formed because of the increased temperatures so if you talk about the bituminous coal is the most popular variety of coal with respect to the industries and then we come over to the best quality of coal that is the anthracite so anthracite the highest quality of uh, the hard coal however india lacks in the anthracite deposits so the majority of coal that we utilize for the industries is the bituminous coal okay now let's move further so we talk about in india coal deposits are found in two ways number one the gondwana deposits and second is the tertiary deposits if we could talk about the gondwana deposits these are 200 million years old okay so we talk about the gondwana deposits these are 200 million years old okay generally found in the damodar valley especially the west bengal jharkhand area in the jharia rani ganj and bokaro bokaro again comes in the jharkhand rani ganj in, in west bengal and the godavari mahanadi son and vardha valleys okay if you talk about the tertiary coals, so tertiary coals are generally 55 million years old. Okay, they are not very old. They are just 55 million years old. And generally, if you talk about the tertiary deposits of coal are found in northeastern states like Meghalaya, Assam, Arunachal, Nagaland. So these are the major states where you can find the tertiary coals, right? Okay, let's move on further, guys. Okay, let's talk about petroleum. So we know that petroleum is again a very important fossil fuel. It can use, it can be utilized in multiple ways. In liquid form, it is called as petroleum. Okay, in solid form, it can be tar, called as tar, bitch, pitu, uh, sorry, pit, pitch, bitumen. Okay, in the terms of, you can say that gaseous form, it can be called as a natural gas, right? Now, it provides fuel for heating and lighting. Okay, it also provides lubricants for machinery to make them run smoothly, right? And it also acts as a raw material for multiple industries. So petroleum refinery is a central industry which produces many products out of the crude oil, right? For example, the synthetic fertilizers, the textiles, multiple chemicals, right? If you talk about about 63% of the India's petroleum comes from Mumbai high, 18% comes from Gujarat and 16% comes from Assam, right? Now, if you talk about the natural gas, it is a very important source of energy for both industries as well as for the domestic purposes. In house also, we use the natural gas for, you know, cooking the food. For example, in that case, it is called as PNG. We also use the natural gas for running autos and cars. It is called as CNG, right? Now, it's a environment friendly fuel because of the low carbon emissions. Okay, natural gas has been discovered in the Krishna Godavari Basin also in Mumbai High and the nearby fields. Also in the Gulf of Cambay and the Andaman Nicobar region. So these are the major regions where we can find the natural gas. Let's move on further. Okay, let's talk about electricity. Now, electricity is something that we all need, isn't it? Electricity is utilized in multiple things. Like today, I'm taking a class. It's all because of the equipments are working. The gadgets here are working because of electricity. So we have two ways to generate electricity. Number one, it is generated by uh, hydro hydroelectricity or thermal power. See, if you're talking about hydroelectricity, so what happens? The running water, the water stored in the dams is made to fall on a turbine. Turbine is something, it's a, it's a machine. It has a lot of blades, right? So it's like, a, it's called as turbine. So when water falls at a great velocity on this turbine, on this machine, the blades start rotating at a great speed. And this produces energy, which is further converted into electricity, right? So by burning other, achha, the second, uh, this is called as hydropower. When you use water to generate electricity. The second way is by generating from fossil fuels. So when you burn fossil fuels like coal, petroleum, natural gas, again, the steam generated is used to turn the turbines. 
विच अगेन प्रोड्यूस एन एनर्जी एंड दिस एनर्जी देन गेट्स कन्वर्टेड टू द इलेक्ट्रिसिटी एंड दिस इज कॉल्ड एज थर्मल इलेक्ट्रिसिटी थर्मल मीन्स सम इलेक्ट्रिसिटी जनरेटेड यूजिंग हीट सो देर आर टू वेस्ट नंबर वन हाइड्रो इलेक्ट्रिसिटी एंड द सेकंड वन इज थर्मल पावर नाउ सो दिस इज क्लियर आई गेस ओके so we talk about the multi purpose projects like bhakra nangal damodar valley corporation project hide okay so these are multiple projects which are using, being used to generate the hydro power okay so this is very much clear let's move on further okay so now non conventional sources of energy now this is a very very important topic very very important part and also the second last topic of your this chapter that is non conventional sources of energy so in non conventional sources basically we talk about those resources that are more over renewable in nature they are environment friendly in nature and also less polluting right let's talk about nuclear or the atomic energy so basically how is the atomic energy obtained we all have studied in science that there is uh, you know every element has a unit called as atoms and those atoms have a nucleus right so that's just like a brain in our body so if you talk about if we alter the structure of these atoms then the huge amount of energy is produced and this energy is then used to generate the electrical power so what we do is we take the radioactive elements like uranium and thorium that are available in jharkhand and aravalli ranges of rajasthan or also in the monazit sands of kerala so if you talk about we take these radioactive elements like uranium like thorium and we make a change in the structure of their atoms while doing so a huge amount of energy is produced and that energy is utilized to produce the electricity so this is called as the nuclear power next if we talk about solar energy now this is a very important topic guys india if you talk about is a tropical country that means that we receive a lot amount of solar power isn't it so india has great possibilities of utilizing this solar power to the best possible extent right so we are using it at a great uh, you can say pace nowadays in fact there is a wonderful technology called as photovoltaic cell so photovoltaic cells are those cells that convert the solar power into electrical power and now if you see that solar power is becoming a very popular resource especially in the rural areas because now using the solar power the it can be used for multiple energy needs earlier in the rural areas the women used to depend on firewood or used to depend on the cow dung that is the cow's excreta and make it cakes to produce energy but now it is with the help of the solar power women are completely you know depending upon the solar technology nowadays and this is also environment friendly as well as uh, if you talk about the pollution is very much reduced because of this okay now let's want to the further point okay acha there is one more point when the cow dung was being utilized for producing energy then uh, the farmer was also losing out on a lot of natural manure so now when the solar energy is being utilized so that cow dung can be utilized to prepare natural manure that will again benefit the farmers right now let's move about the wind power so india has a great potential of developing the wind power if you talk about the wind farms so largest wind farms you can find in tamil nadu from nagar coil to madurai right apart from this andhra pradesh gujarat kerala maharashtra are also important wind farms okay nagar coil nagar coil and jaisalmer are known for great usage of wind energy so what we do is basically we install large fans that are called as wind mills so in the areas where the wind is high basically these fans get rotated and they produce an energy then that energy is utilized to convert into electricity right now let's talk about biogas now this is again a very important resource so how is biogas produced basically by the waste so what happens whatever waste is there the shrubs okay the farm waste the farming waste the animal excreta the animals excreta the toilet of the animal right or the human excreta that you release from your body right in the washroom in the morning or any suitable time of the day whenever you feel like a lot of pressurized you know you just go in the washroom release all your excreta however that excreta is for no good usage right so what we do in the biogas plants we basically collect all the waste material the human excreta okay the animal excreta all the farm waste and together we put it in a uh, big box or a big kind of plant right and that we allow it to decompose when it decompose it it releases a gas right it releases a gas and then what happens that gas is utilized to for the energy benefits okay so this is basically called as the biogas now let's talk about the tidal energy here so tidal energy basically we all have heard that the moon's gravitation pull uh basically because of the moon's gravitation what happens the water in the oceans and the water body rises okay and it leads to lot of waves high waves and low waves which are also called as tides okay when the pull is little bit high the waves rise at a certain height causing causing the high tides and the pull is little bit weaker in that case we see that low uh, low uh, 
elevation waves are formed, right? So, wo, so these tides, these high and the low tides have enormous energy in them, right? So, we can harness this energy and convert into electricity. So, in India, if you see the Gulf of Khambat and Gulf of Kutch in Gujarat are being successfully utilized to convert the tidal waves into the energy. So, basically what we do is, when, whenever the we build some, uh, you can, a small dam type of structure, right? So, whenever there are high waves, the water enters this entire outlet or the tank or the dam, okay? And there is a turbine fitted there. So, when the water enters, it rotates the turbine which again generates the energy and this energy is further converted into electrical power. Right, so this is how we uh, harness the tidal energy into electricity, right? So, this is again some very important projects being run at the moment. Now, let's come to the geothermal power. Now, what is geothermal power? In very simple terms, the heat trapped inside the earth's surface is utilized to generate the power. Now, what happens here is, the heat and electricity produced by using the heat from the interior of the earth is called geothermal energy. So, we all know that as we go deep inside the earth, the earth gets hot. Isn't it? As you go the deep inside the earth, the earth gets hotter, the temperature increases. So, what happens? Sometimes this high temperature is found at a very low depth, okay? Or we say that the geothermal gradient is high at some places. So, what happens in that case? The rocks above it, the rocks above the ground, they absorb the heat. And if there is a water body passing by, if there is a river passing by, it gets heated up, the water gets boiling. If you go visit Kasol, Kasol is a place and beautiful place in Himachal Pradesh. So there is a Gurdwara called Manikaran Sahab and there is also a temple called Manikarnika temple, right? It's very, very simple, my dear Bache. So if you go this temple to this Gurdwara, you will see the water boiling there. So water is not boiling because someone has put it on boil. It's because of the thermal gradient, the heat beneath the rocks is pretty much high at that place. And that is an example of geothermal power or geothermal energy. So this can be utilized to, the steam generated can be utilized to turn turbines and convert it into electricity. So we have two projects running on at the moment. One is the Parvati Valley project in Manikar and Nimanchal. And second is the Puga Valley project in Ladakh. So these are the two multiple projects being run in the uh, in the modern scenario to harness the geothermal power. Now, non-conventional sources part is very important, beta. They can ask you individual questions for two markers or also they can ask you a question for five markers, right? So, these notes are going to be very much helpful for you. Okay, now, let's move further. So, conservation of the resources. It's always said that ke energy saved is energy produced. So, we all know that energy is a very basic requirement for economic development. So, it's important that we need to develop a sustainable plan for the energy development, right? Now, there are two ways for adopting this sustainable development of energy. Number one, promoting the energy conservation. And second is using more and more renewable resources of energy. Because we all know that the coal and petroleum are going to exhaust at the current rate at which we are using. So, we need to find the alternative resource of energy. That's very important, right? Okay, some steps that we can take is, we can use public transportation instead of private vehicles, that this will help to reduce the pollution, also this will help to reduce the congestion of the traffic on the roads, then switching of the electricity when not in usage, using power saving devices and using more and more non-conventional sources of energy. So, these are the multiple things that we can do on our part in order to reduce the energy transmissions and the consumption, okay, because energy saved is energy produced, right? Now, let me ask you a question here. Let me ask you a question here. With respect to geothermal power, are installed at Salal Dam, JNK, Parvati Valley, Himachal Pradesh. Iri Uttarakhand ya Hirakut pe, uh, or Hirakut Odisha. Done? Okay. So, we have four, four options out here. I will start giving you the polls. I will still try giving you the polls. 30 seconds polls, my dear. 
so experimental projects with respect to geothermal power are installed at and uh, your time starts now okay let me try giving you 45 seconds poll okay so we have four options out here okay very nice hi abhinav but i have been recording since uh, i guess i had some lectures to record also and i have been speaking for the past 8 hours so that's why my voice might be little bit shrieking you know but uh, don't worry it's all good okay so we'll have one more one more chapter after this and then we'll wind up with the geography and uh, again i'll take second part of this marathon where we'll cover economics civics as well as the map work so that you guys also don't get strained and have sufficient time to recall and revise it okay so very easy answer that is parvati valley let me see that if the poll doesn't do moi moi with me okay Oh, fine. The poll started working in 45 seconds. 100% gave me the correct answer. Thank you, Kunal Bhai. Vidhi, it's Raghav, Sunny, Evans, Agam. See, one student asked me, sir, please explain me the tidal energy. Sure, but I'll explain you the tidal energy. So, basically, understand it like this. What are tides? Tides are generally the high waves you see in the oceans. Okay, high waves. Lehre that you call, right? High waves. So, what happens here is, uh, these tides have enormous energy, isn't it? So, what we try to do is, we have built a dam sort of a structure. So, what happens? We open the gates of this dam and then the tide water, when, whenever there is a high tide, the water enters it. The water enters the dam. So, water is stored here. Now, we using a pipe, what we do is, we you try to flow the water over a turbine. So, turbine is basically a motor. It has a lot of blades. So, when water flows at a great speed over it, the ro blade rotates. The, when the blade rotates, it produces an energy. Or this energy is then utilized to generate electrical city or electrical power, right? During the time of low tides, when the waves height is less, the water goes back into the sea. Again, some water is collected. Again, the same process is repeated. And then what happens? The electricity gets generated. So, we are trapping the water's energy with the help of a turbine, a generator. We are converting it into electrical power. So, this is basically the tidal energy. Okay, my dear bachu. Okay, my dear bachu. Sorted, eh? Okay. Okay. So, Bache will, uh, Dogesh will come in part two. He is, uh, one more question. Tanu studies saying, sir, Dogesh, when will Dogesh come? So, Dogesh will come in part two of this marathon. Okay. So, let me just uh, ask you one more question. Okay. Uh, okay. So, one more question for the students. Dash converts solar power to electrical power. Photovoltaic panel. Photovoltaic cells. Solar cooker. Or solar heater. Okay, 45 seconds poll released. Very nice. But I'll be coming with NTPC that has an uh, that is there in manufacturing industries topic. So I've already kept that as a case study. So don't worry, we'll be covering the NTPC part. Okay, so I will I will definitely cover that. That's a very very important topic. Yeah, we'll be covering that, but so we'll be covering that. Hi Vikram Nishad, how are you? Hi, good evening, Krishna. How, how are you, Bacho? How are you? Rudraksh from Udan. How can you participate? Better, very simple. You just have to write the correct option here in your charts A, B, C, or D, and you are all good to go. Okay. So, you have to just write the correct options here A, B, C, or D, and you will be all good to go. Okay. So, your chances will be recorded here. Okay, my dear. 
So correct answer is very simple. That is photovoltaic cells. We just studied them, right? So option B, 27% people have given a correct answer. So most of the people got confused by photovoltaic panel. Remember, we studied about photovoltaic cells that these cells convert the solar power to the electrical power. And here we go, guys. So option number B is absolutely correct answer. Three students correctly answered. National mentor, we have Aisha. We have destroyer with us. Destroyer. Wow, that's a lovely name, honestly. I loved your answers, guys. I loved your answers. Okay, superb. Now, let's come to the <coughs> last chapter of today's marathon of the part one of the marathon that is manufacturing industries okay last chapter of part one of the manufacturing industries done sort it so I thought of giving you guys a break, but again, I felt that, uh, you know, let's cover it in the next 10 minutes. So finally, you can have your dinner. Okay. And finally, but you can uh, just uh, get free from the classes. Okay. So that is the reason I thought that why not give you a, uh, like why uh, to avoid the break and just give you a final break after this chapter gets over. Okay. So let's get started guys. Come on. Okay. So if you are tired do some yoga at your place like this i always do that in the live sessions you know in the foundation channel when i do i always do it in the live sessions so come on some yoga at your place this will yoga se hoga that means give you some energy refresh you a lot okay so it's the last chapter of part one marathon that is manufacturing industries so quickly we'll cover the chapter gta guy okay but I've already told Agenda 21 uh, long, long back that it was kind of declaration or the document that was basically signed by the world leaders in the International Earth Summit. And it focused on multiple principles. Like they talked about combating the different issues like the poverty. They talked about uh, basically uh, environmental conservation. They talked about elim eliminating the diseases, but with a mutual global corporation. Okay. And Agenda 21 was basically aimed at achieving the sustainable development goals by 21st century. Fine. So it's a kind of document, kind of declaration, you can say. Done, my dear Bacho. Okay. Let's come to the manufacturing industries topic. And here we go. Number one. Okay. So manufacturing industry. See, in very simple and short terms. Manufacturing means production of goods in the large quantities. When you convert a raw material into more valuable product that can be used by the people, it is called as manufacturing. Okay, so it falls in the secondary sector and the economic strength of a country a lot depends on the manufacturing sector of that company, country. Okay, now this question is asked for three marks that what is the importance of manufacturing sector see number one it helps in modernizing the agriculture which is the backbone of our country's economy also it reduces the dependence of the people on agriculture for jobs it provides them a lot of employment it provides them job in the secondary sectors or the tertiary sectors thereby reducing the dependence of people on the primary sector right it helps in eradication of employment unemployment and poverty if there are more and more industries definitely people will get the jobs and if people will get the jobs definitely they will have money so why are people under, under poverty because they are underemployed or because they are unemployed, they don't have money. That's why they're poor, right? So when you open up industries, you give jobs to the people. It helps them to earn money and come out of poverty and unemployment. Then if you export the manufactured goods to the other countries, it helps to earn the much needed foreign income or foreign exchange. Then the countries who are able to transform their raw materials into a number of finished articles on the finished goods, such countries are generally said to be very much prosperous. Okay, now let's move further. So again, there's a good question that agriculture and industry are dependent on each other or they go hand in hand. Why do we say this? It's very simple, but so industries, they give a major boost to the agriculture. How? By improving their productivity. We see that a lot of agriculture tools are produced in the industries. A lot of sub, uh, things are produced in the industries that help to boost the productivity of the agriculture like fertilizers, modern tools and machineries, insecticide, pesticides. Okay, so industry depends on uh, agriculture for raw materials also, right? 
so we can say that both are interdependent like agriculture is dependent on the industry for multiple things like pvc pipes pesticides insecticides modern variety of tools in the same way many industries are dependent on agriculture also for their raw products right so that is why we can say that both are interdependent now how do we classify industry that's a very interesting concept here so number one we classify the industry on the basis of raw material Based upon that, we classify them into agro-based and mineral-based. That means the industries that use agricultural products as the raw materials are called as the agro-based industries. And the industries that use minerals as the raw material are called as the mineral-based industries. Example of agro-based, tea, coffee industry, rubber industry, mineral-based, steel industry, cement industry. According to the main role, we have two types, basic or key and the consumer. See, basic industries are those whose final products are used as raw materials by some other company, by some other industry, right? For example, let's say I have a car manufacturing company, then I will be requiring iron and steel. So iron and steel may be the final product of the iron and steel industry, but for me, it is a raw material. So such industries are called basic industries, right? Consumer industries are those who produce the goods for direct consumption of the consumers. Example, sugar, example, toothpaste, right? Now, if you talk about on the basis of investment, we categorize them into two types that is small and large scale. Whenever the investment is up to 1 crores, it is called a small scale industry. Whenever the investment to set up an industry is more than 1 crore, it is called as the large scale industry. Remember that, okay? In case of small scale, it is up to 1 CR, 1 crore and in the case of large scale, it is more than 1 crore. Okay, now let's talk about on the basis of ownership, okay? We have four types of industry. This is very important, very, very important, okay? Public sector, that means industries that are owned by the government. Okay, private sector, industries that are owned by the private individuals. Example, Tesco, Tata Iron Steel, Bajaj, Reliance, right? Okay, joint sector, these are the industries that are jointly run by the government as well as the group of individuals. For example, Oil India Limited, OIL, it's a joint sector industry that is owned both by the government as well as by the private individual. Cooperative sector, basically this cooperative sector is basically that type of industry that is formed by a group of workers or a group of suppliers. Let's say they were, uh, let's say they were five milkmen in a particular locality. So they decided to form an industry. They, uh, uh, they pulled up their resources, they invested a the money and then they started their production. And whatever will be the profits and losses will be equally distributed. So that is an example of cooperative sector, right? Okay, so these are the sector, these are the industries on the basis of their ownership. Okay, now let's move further. Okay, so we have textile in your syllabus. If you talk about cotton textile and textile. So basically, if you talk about budget, textile is a very important sector in the country because it contributes a great uh, to our economy. Also, it is the second highest employment generating sector in India. Textile sector, uh, it provides employment to 35 million people in India. It is the only sector which is complete in the value chain. That means from the basic raw material to the highest value added product is produced in one single sector. Okay. So that is the speciality of textile sector. Now, if we talk about cotton textiles in ancient India, the cotton textiles, that means the cotton fabric, the cotton kapra that was produced with the help of hand spinning and hand loom. After 18th century, we see that power looms started coming. That means operated by steam power or any other mechanical means. Okay, if you talk about during the colonial period, our traditional industries, they suffered a lot. The reason being, the colonial people, the Britishers, they used to supply the Indian markets with the British mill-made goods that were very much cheap in cost. Okay, and our Indian producers could not compete with them. So that was a major reason, right? The first successful textile mill was opened in Mumbai in 1854. Now, we see that the spinning of the thread or the yarn is still is very much centralized in Maharashtra, Gujarat and Tamil Nadu. However, if you talk about weaving the fabric or weaving the cloth, it is produced all over the country. Now, what is the reason behind this? The reason is simple because uh, when we talk about weaving the fabric or weaving the cloth all over the country, it gives the freedom to incorporate all the traditional designs that exist in the different parts of the country, right? For example, if you go to Banaras, the Banarsi sari has an altogether different design. You to go to Gujarat, the Gujarat saris have altogether different design. You go to Rajasthan, the clothes printed there, the clothes prepared there will have altogether different styles and uh, distinct designs. So that is why we uh, we make the prepared the cloth all over the country so that the different designs can be utilized and incorporated. Okay, done. Now let's move further, bacho. Okay, so achha, this one industry was left out that is based on the bulk. So based on the bulk of the industries, uh, we basically talk about this thing that is the heavy and the light industries. 
ओके द हेवी इंडस्ट्रीज आर द वन विच यूज हेवी रॉ मटेरियल लाइट इंडस्ट्रीज आर द वन विच यूज लाइट रॉ मटेरियल ओके डन सो आई वॉज टॉकिंग अबाउट एग्रो बेस्ड इंडस्ट्रीज सो एग्रो बेस्ड इंडस्ट्रीज आर द वन दैट डिपेंड ऑन एग्रीकल्चर प्रोडक्ट लाइक कॉटन जूट सिल्क वुल एंड टेक्सटाइल्स फो आई डिस्कस्ड अबाउट द टेक्सटाइल इंडस्ट्री दैट हाउ मच इट कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टू द इकॉनमी देन वी टॉक्ट अबाउट द कॉटन टेक्सटाइल्स सो दिस वाला स्लाइड इट वेंट अ लिटल बिट अप सो आई जस्ट ब्रिंग इट डाउन ओके सो बेसिकली दिस इज द हैंडलूम ओके माई डियर बच्चो सो बेसिकली दिस इज द हैंडलूम So you can see that a person is weaving the cloth or the fabric by hand, and this is an example of a power loom. Okay, which is driven by power. It can be electrical power or the steam power in olden times. So these are the two types of machines which is used to weave the fabric or the cloth. Okay, now let's move further. Let's talk about the jute textiles. So if we talk about the jute textiles in India. India is the largest producer of the raw jute. Okay, so we produce the largest quantity of raw jute, and in terms of the jute export, we come second after Bangladesh. Okay, now let's talk about the first jute mill was set up near Kolkata in 1855 at Trishra. So most of the mills, mills if you talk about, are located in the West Bengal, mainly across the Hooghly River. Okay, now what is the cause? Now this is a good question. It is asked for three marks. That why the maximum jute mills are located in the West Bengal? Number one. Number one is the presence of the jute producing areas. If you see that Bengal is known for the jute production, so easily the raw material is available. Then the water transport is very much inexpensive. then there is a good network of railways and roadways and waterways to connect the raw material to the jute processing industries okay then lot of water is available for processing the raw jute cheap labor is available from the nearby states especially from the west bengal and the states of bihar orissa and up and kolkata as a large center as a large urban center uh, you know provides sufficient facilities for banking insurance loan facilities or even the port facilities so these are the multiple reasons why most of the jute mills are located in the west bengal right so this question is very important guys it's asked for several times now let's talk about the sugar industry right so we talk about the sugar production the india is the second largest producer of sugar in the world and the largest producer of gur and khand sari right so gur is something that we utilize in our homes khand sari is somewhat brown color powdered uh, you know a little bit sweet in texture but better and healthy than sugar so india ranks second in the production of sugar and the first in the production of gur and khand sari okay if you talk about 2010 and 11 over 662 sugar mills were there in uttar pradesh and bihar so uttar pradesh and bihar have uh, like have approximately 60% of the country sugar mills now that is a notable point that bihar and up have 60% of the country sugar mills okay apart from that maharashtra karnataka tamil nadu andhra these are also the important producers of sugar in india sugar cane in india or sugar in india now let's talk about the mineral based industries so basically these are the industries that use minerals as the raw materials like iron and steel if you talk about iron and steel industry it's a basic industry why because it provides raw materials to all the other industries now steel is used to manufacture a variety of goods for example engineering goods construction material medical equipments defense material for the construction of bridges in fact for the construction of utensils right the burden that we use in the home so lot there's lot of steel utensils we utilize at home isn't it now production and consumption of steel that how much steel is a country producing and consuming is also an indicator of a country's development okay now chhota nagpur plateau in the country has the maximum amount of steel concentration okay so remember that chhota nagpur plateau has the maximum amount of iron and steel industries the biggest reason is number 1 iron ore producing regions are very near again we should talk about the transportation facilities is also available plus the market is also available and that is the biggest reason why chota nagpur plateau has the maximum number of iron and steel industries okay now let's say go talk about the second important uh, mineral based industry that is aluminum smelting smelting means when you melt a metal to produce something okay so aluminum smelting is an again important industry in india so what happens how do we make aluminum so it's very basic bachcho we use bauxite to make aluminum so first what is happened bauxite is uh, taken out okay so bauxite is a mineral we all know that so first we obtain the raw bauxite then we crush the bauxite and after crushing the bauxite aluminum silicate or alumina is separated then that alumina is further refined further melted to convert into aluminum right so it is a very light and resistant to corrosion material it's a good conductor of heat it's very malleable you can make wires out of aluminum and it becomes very strong when it is mixed with other minerals okay now we use aluminum to manufacture aircraft utensils wires even in manufacturing of the railway train coaches so there are multiple uses of aluminiums 
Where can we found aluminium? Orissa, West Bengal, Kerala. You can remember three states, even some parts of UP. So they are the major producers, right? So you can remember it by the term that is OWK. Okay, OWK is very simple. Orissa, West Bengal and Kerala. Now, okay, let's talk about the chemical industries. But the chemical industry is something that is very fast growing industry in the country. It has both large scale and small scale units. It produces both the kind of chemicals like the organic chemicals and the inorganic chemicals. Organic chemicals, generally those chemicals which are derived from the petroleums or petrochemicals, right? So if we talk about organic chemicals include petrochemicals that are used for manufacturing artificial fibers, artificial rubber, plastics, lot of pharmaceuticals and medicines. Okay, and inorganic chemicals include sulfuric acid. We use that to manufacture fertilizers, synthetic fibers, plastics, you know, adhesives, the fevicol that you utilize. Nitric acid, alkalis, soda ash is used to manufacture glass, soaps and detergents. So we see that in chemical industries, we have both the type of beta chemicals being produced. That is organic and inorganic. And it's the fastest growing industry in India. The best part about the chemical industry is it is its own consumer. That means most of the chemicals that are produced in the chemical industries are again used to produce even more complex chemicals. Okay, so its consumption is also very good. Now, let's talk about the fertilizer industry. So, if you talk about the types of fertilizers produced in India, then we mainly focus on three categories. Number one, nitrogenous fertilizers, also called as urea, phosphatic or ammonium phosphate fertilizers, also called as DAP, and complex fertilizers that have a combination of nitrogen, phosphate, and potash. So, you can also call them as NPK, yani nitrogen, phosphate, and potash fertilizers, nitrogenous fertilizers, Phosphatic and ammonium fertilizers. Uh, okay, so these are the three major categories of fertilizer we produce in the country. So since we don't have enough amount of potash in the country, so this is imported from the other countries. Okay, now after the green revolution, this industry has expanded to multiple parts of the country. Okay, especially in the green revolution, if you see that a lot of fertilizers were utilized in order to productivize, in order to increase the productivity of the agriculture. So this industry has received a great boom after the green revolution. So Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, Kerala, these are the major fertilizer producing states. Okay, GTU. So this is GTU. GTU is Gujarat, Tamil Nadu and Uttar Pradesh. And apart from that, Punjab and Kerala are the major fertilizer producers. Okay. Other producers can be Andhra, Odisha, and Rajasthan, Bihar, Maharashtra. Well, you don't have to learn this. Only learn the leading producers. That is GTO, that is Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, UP, and Kerala, Punjab. Okay. Now let's move on further. Cement industry. It's again a very important industry, guys. We require cement for everything. You know, remember that add Ambuja cement one. Bhaiya, ye divar chutti kyun nahi hai? Arey chutte ki kaise Ambuja cement se jo bani hai? So remember that cement add. Okay. So, when we talk about cement activity, when we talk about cement guys, so cement is utilized for multiple things. We use cement for construction of buildings, schools, colleges, bridges, multiple infrastructure things, right? Even dam building. So, this industry requires heavy raw materials like limestone, silica, aluminium, gypsum. Okay. So, industry is generally located in Gujarat. You will find a lot of industrial plants of cement industry. First cement plant was started in Chennai in 1904. Okay. So we see that decontrol of price and the distribution of the cement uh, industries after 1989 has always, you know, has a lot helped to grow this industry. If you talk, with, uh, if you talk about Bachon, there were certain reforms also made in the policies by the government, which again has facilitated the growth and the uh, expansion of the cement industry, right? So this is doing very good in terms of production as well as in terms of export. That means a lot of products that are produced in the cement industry are also being exported to the other countries. Okay, now. Let's talk about the automobile industry. So we have already come to a lot of uh, towards the end of the chapter uh, almost. So let's come to the automobile industry. So basically we talk about automobile industry. So this is that industry that manufactures vehicles. Okay, that means your trucks, your buses, your auto rickshaws, your tempos, your e-rickshaw, your cycle, your bike, your scooty. So this is the industry that manufactures such kind of transportation vehicles. Now foreign direct investment, that is the investment by the foreign companies into India has given a great boost to this industry. If you talk about where is this industry located, so majority industries in Delhi, Gurgaon, Mumbai, Pune, Chennai, Kolkata, Lucknow. So these are the major areas where you can find the, uh, where you can find this automobile industry. Okay, bacho? Now. Let's come to the last industry that is information technology and electronics. See, electronic industry covers a wide range of products. It manufactures multiple things. It manufactures televisions, telephones, pagers, computers, radar systems. So, multiple products are being produced by the electronic industry. 
Bengaluru is known as the electronic capital of India as well as the Silicon Valley of India. So Bengaluru lies in Karnataka, also known as the electronic capital of India. Okay, so other important centers for electronic goods are Mumbai, Delhi, again Mumbai, Delhi, again Hyderabad, Pune. Okay, then we have Chennai, Kolkata. So these are again some important centers for electronic industries. Okay, so if we talk about the IT industry, the IT industry is also booming a lot. It employs a large number of people. If you talk about the major IT centers of the country, information technology, that is the software companies. So if you talk about the major software companies of the country, then we can uh, talk about they are generally situated in New Delhi. They are in Noida. They are in Gurgaon. They are in Pune. Okay, they are in Gurgaon. Oh, sorry. They are in, uh, again, they are in Bengaluru. So these are the major areas where we can find the IT industry. Okay, so you can write down. IT industry is generally found in Noida. It's in Gurgaon or Gurugram. Okay, it's in Delhi, it's in Pune, it's in Hyderabad. Okay, so these are some of the major, uh, again Bangalore, how can we forget that? The Silicon Valley of India. Okay, so Bangalore. So these are the major places where you can find the IT industry. Okay, done. So let me ask you a question. So, so far we have done lots and lots of industries. Here. We started with the... Uh, agro-based industries in which we discussed the cotton textiles and the jute textiles. Then we moved on further to the iron, uh, like we moved on to the mineral-based industries. We talked about iron ore industries. We talked about iron and steel. We talked about aluminum smelting. Okay, then further we moved on to the other kinds of industries, like for example, cement industry, the fertilizer industry. Okay, we also talked about uh, the, the automobile industry. We talked about the IT and electronics industry. Okay, now let me have a question for you guys. Okay, it's a good question. It's a nice question and here we go. Okay, so the question is very simple. Let me see how many of you do it right. The first cement plant was set up in Chennai in 4 options. Okay, so we have four options. I'll give you 45 seconds time here. And let me see how many of you answer this correctly. So here we go. Okay, very simple. Bita, 5 ghante mein humko padhte hoi kitna ho gai? Saadhe 8 ghante my dear. Okay. So, bache again, uh, koi bhoat pyaara sa bacha hai, hai na, who asked sir Hindi mein boliye. Bita, very simple. Uh, so, the point is, the entire marathon, ye jo marathon kar rahe hai, basically for the students, jinko Hindi samaj mein nahi aati, hai na, that is the reason mein aapko Hindi mein nahi pada raha hoon. It's a channel called as Pure English, PW English, where we teach the students who are not able to understand Hindi. Jo Hindi nahi samaj paate, jo Angrezi samajte hai, English samajte hai, ye unke liye beta marathon hai. Hindi wale humare pyaare bachcho ke liye marathon aegi, humare foundation channel ke upar bhi bhoat jaldi. So, ab vahaan pe English mein pad sakte hai, thik hai? Done. Okay. Done, Machu? Okay. Bache, someone asked me, sir, largest producer of manganese. If you go to the current stats, beta, it's Odisha. It's a Odisha if we talk about in terms of production. At the moment, Odisha tops the list in the manganese production. Okay. So, always refer to the stats that are given in the NCRT, but as of now, Odisha has the highest production. So, it's 1904. Okay. Oh, bhai. Again, it's a more more moment for me because again, there is some issue with the polls. Some issue with the polls, guys. Some issue with the polls. Okay. So, basically, we talked about a lot of industries here. Okay. We talked about, I'll give you a quick recap here. 
सो वट डिड वी टॉक अबाउट बच्चों वी टॉक्ट अबाउट द टेक्सटाइल इंडस्ट्रीज दैट मीन द इंडस्ट्री दैट प्रोड्यूस फैब्रिक और कपड़ा so we talked about that is a very crucial industry we talked about cotton textiles that we produce a good amount of cotton textiles the spinning is done in again some parts of the country but we weave the cloth or prepare the cloth in the different parts of the country we talked about the jute textile that majority of the jute industries are located in the west bengal region the reason is because of the availability of resources the raw material the transportation the market facilities that is the biggest reason why we have the maximum industries there we talked about the sugar industry 60% of the sugar industry is there in up and bihar okay and uh, it's a crucial industry for the country we talked about uh, we talked about iron and steel that it's a very basic industry it provides raw materials to the other industries okay then we uh, talked about aluminum industry that we prepare aluminum from bauxite okay and then that aluminum is utilized for making multiple things for making utensils for making you can say aircraft parts multiple things right we talked about automobile industry where we prepare the vehicles for transportation like the bus the trucks the cars okay and it's a fast growing industry we talked about cement industry a cement is prepared using the limestone silica gypsum okay it's a very crucial industry for the country we talked about the chemical industries which are very fastest growing industry that produces both organic and inorganic chemicals okay we talked about uh, fertilizer industry that is very crucial for the uh, with the perspective of uh, we can say agriculture so we deal into majorly three categories of fertilizers okay then we talked about after green revolution it uh, it received a great boost because uh, fertilizers were used in the modernizing the agriculture okay so see so far this is what you have discussed okay bachche so so far we have discussed this the types of industries on also we uh, studied about the classification of industries in the beginning of the chapter so those who have joined just now you can just scroll back a little bit in the video and go across to that chapter okay now let's come to the last 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 topic of this chapter that is industrial pollution in this we also will be covering the ntpc part so so far we have seen that how much the industries contribute to the economy now this is the again a harsh reality behind the industries or the cost we have to pay so industries are also responsible for contributing towards the multiple types of pollution namely the air pollution the water pollution the land pollution and the noise pollution so industries apart from contributing the economy they also contribute to the pollution then that, that's a heart breaking thing isn't it now number 1 if we talk about the air pollution how is it caused basically air pollution is caused when uh, a great number of toxic gases or poisonous gases are present in the atmosphere like the sulfur dioxide like the carbon monoxide so where this where does this uh, uh, harmful gases come from so basically we have seen that the industries like the chemical and paper industries or where the bricks are made the bricks brick kilns eat ka bhatta you call in hindi okay or if you talk about the refineries or if you talk about the iron and aluminum smelting plants so the chimneys of these industries they release toxic or poisonous smoke right and this smoke basically contains lot of gases that are harmful for the environment okay so it affects not only the human health but also the animals in the plants in even the buildings remember the case of mathura oil refinery so that uh, adversely impacted the taj mahal causing the acid rains so when these harmful toxic gases they get mixed up in the atmosphere and suppose if it rains it also can lead to acid rains right so it's a very uh, harmful thing that we can always talk about now if you talk about water pollution how it is caused it is caused by all the organic and inorganic industrial waste that come out from the factories and is dumped into the rivers okay and pollutes them okay apart from this lot of solid waste is also dumped into the water bodies in india for example the waste that is uh, that comes out from the thermal power plants like the fly ash or the phosphor gypsum and also from the iron and steel plants there is a lot of solid waste that gets Yeah, you know that gets that is produced. So all this waste, when without uh, you know treatment, is dumped into the water bodies. It leads to the pollution of the fresh water. Okay. Now, one what happens in the thermal pollution? See what happens when the uh, when the hot water from the thermal the nuclear power plants, when without cooling, this hot water is dumped into the water bodies. It actually raises the temperature of the water bodies all of a sudden. Now just imagine the condition of the fish that is swimming inside the water. All of a sudden, a warm water comes and splashes on the mouth of the fish. How would the fish will react? Fish is going, enjoying her life, you know, just going, having a cool day out. All of a sudden, the toxic, poisonous, hot water gets gets dumped from the factories into the water bodies, and right splashes on the face of the fish. How will the fish react? Will be like I, you know, that will be the reaction of the fish. So 
in a very simple terms thermal pollution occurs when hot water from the factories and thermal power plants is released into the water bodies without cooling right now if we talk about the noise pollution okay one more one more type of pollution that is soil and water pollution is also connected okay soil and water pollution they both are connected how they are connected let me explain you this fact okay they are very much related how they are related so we know that when you dump the garbage on the land when you dump a lot of waste on the land okay that this waste pollutes the land so suppose if there is a rainfall then what is going to happen the rain water will mix with this waste and will go inside the soil and pollute the underground water so that is also a case of you know water pollution now if you talk about the noise pollution we have a lot of industrial activities going on at one point or the other so these industrial and construction activities produce a lot of noise that are not pleasant for our ears the vehicles produce a lot of noise we see that at times people are playing dj at a full sound that also a kind of noise isn't it so this noise can have serious repercussions it can have serious consequences it can lead us to hearing impairment you know you can become deaf for life it can also increase the heart rate and the blood pressure okay so multiple it can also cause anger and irritation so there are multiple ill effects or side effects of noise that we can have okay now if you talk about so the question is how to control so this is very important question guys this question is most of the times it is asked in the three markers okay now question is how to control this the control of the environmental degradation so it's very important how to control again it's a three mark question okay number one some suggestions can be made to control the pollution of fresh water number one what you can do is number one minimize the usage of water how by reusing the water and recycling the water second important point you can harvest the rain water to meet your requirements that's an excellent way to preserve water third we can treat the hot water before releasing into the water bodies so these are three important terms now apart from that what can we do to control the air pollution we can reduce the particulate matter in the air how can we do that we can fit the chimneys the chimneys of the factories can be fitted with certain devices what devices like electrostatic precipitators like fabric filters so these devices help to extract the harmful particulate matter from the toxic smoke that is going to be released from the chimneys and this ultimately finally when the smoke will be released it will be comparatively come toxic and less harmful for the environment so this can be done smoke can be reduced by using oil or gas instead of coal in the factories this is one way of doing it measures to control noise pollution very simple bachcho machineries can be upgraded generators can be fitted with the silencers so that they produce less noise we can use the noise absorbing material we can also use the personal earphones in order to prevent the noise from going into our ears so this is one of the ways okay apart from this we can also treat the fresh water we can also treat the polluted water by multiple processes number 1 by primary treatment we can uh, take out the solid waste by multiple process then we can add microorganisms in the second stage that will help to further clear the water in the third stage we can use all the physical mechanical and chemical processes to clear the water and then reuse and recycle it so these are the multiple ways in which we can control the air water and noise pollutions okay now okay 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 so let me tell you one more important point that is ntpc that is national thermal power corporation so that's a very interesting case study guys in your uh, it's a case study in your book that is ntpc now let me uh, let me tell you that what is ntpc doing all about so ntpc is basically the national thermal power corporation responsible for generating the thermal electricity in india so it has actually earned a certification for environment management system okay now what it, it is doing see basically when you produce thermal power there will be lot of waste generation isn't it number one you'll have to burn the fossil fuels when you burn the fossil fuels lot of ash will be produced lot of smoke will be produced so what ntpc has done ntpc number one has upgraded it its, its equipments when they have upgraded their equipments they have upgraded on the latest technology so it is more efficient and less polluting so that is one power point then they have started managing their solid waste for example example the ash that is produced they have tried to manage that ash maximize the utilization of the waste produced and they are trying to reduce the uh, amount of waste that they are producing on a daily basis right then they have planted green belts around their uh, power plants green belts means they have planted lot of trees around their power plants that will help to purify the air as well as maintain the ecological balance plus they have created an entire database a complete monitoring system in each of the power plants 
okay so that they keep a close eye or close check on however the whether the implementations are being done or not whether every protocol is being followed or not and that is how they are sustainably producing the energy so that is a great example by ntpc that is national thermal power corporation okay now let me ask you a very fine question here so let me ask you a question here Okay, the question is very simple, but you just pay attention. So the question is, Dash is known as the electronic capital. We have four options out here. Mumbai, Pune, Bengaluru or Delhi. So let's hope for the best. Let's see if the polls come. Okay, this time I'll give 30 seconds poll. And here we go here. Okay, so this time I'll give you 30 seconds poll. If the poll comes, it's well and good. So Dash is known as the electronic capital. We have four options. Very nice. Okay, very nice, Mahan. Very nice. Namaskar, Vinay. Namaskar. Hasha or Kunal, I'll not be taking part two right now, definitely. So I'll be taking it in a gap of one or two days, or maybe if tomorrow it's possible, we'll take it tomorrow. Okay, so depending upon the time availability, because you have other subjects also lined up. Okay. So find the correct answer was Bengaluru. Let's hope for the best if the poll records the answer. So option number C is the correct answer and let's have OK. The poll has again done a more more moment for me. So my dear, but a lot of students have answered me correct answers. The poll has done a more more moment. But still if you can see the leaderboards, still if you can see the leaderboards. So Priya answered a lot of questions correct. After that many questions were not recorded. And Mol Kunal Sohan answered a lot of questions correct. Jadu Ka Oge answered very questions correct. Okay, Yadav Anamika answered very question, many questions correct. Kunal Chauhan, very nice, but answered very qu many questions correct. Okay, so lot and lots of people have done some amazing work out here. And you have been there with me for the past 8 hours and 45 minutes and that is really amazing. So let's reduce 15 minutes from there. But for the past 8 hours, 30 minutes, you guys have been with me and that is really amazing. Okay, so definitely I'll not be covering civics and economics in this class because again, that's a lengthy part. So, we will be covering civics and economics in the second part of this marathon. Okay, bacho? So, we'll be covering it in the second part of this marathon because again, that's a whole lot of thing. Okay, so let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, bacho. Okay, fine. So, guys, we'll be coming with a part two of the marathon since again, it will take a lot of time to cover civics and uh, to cover civics and economics. So in part two, we will do three things. Number one, we will do civics. We will do economics. And we will do the map work. Okay. So in the part two of the marathon, we will be doing civics. We will be doing economics and we will be doing map work of the chapter because again you guys will be very much exhausted we have been studying for 8 hours 40 45 minutes and two subjects we covered overall we had a lot of chapters to do so six uh, we covered round about roughly roughly 10 chapters but say all in all and in this arts and definitely it takes time when we you know we are studying we are ex uh, explaining something okay so we'll meet in the part two of the marathon so i am really very happy guys i am really really very happy to you know be with you back on this platform it's almost after i guess lot of months i have taken a class on pw english and thank you for all the love and support guys that you showed throughout the session so hats off to all my lovely people all my lovely bachar party 
So very soon you will get an update of the part 2 of the marathon as well. So do not forget to join the part 2 because we will be doing lots and lots of things. So I will bring some more exciting things for you in the part 2 of the marathon. We will be covering economics as well as civics. Okay. 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 Bachche, this is sufficient. Definitely, this is sufficient. I have explained lots and lots of things throughout the chapter. Complete chapters I have explained out to you. If you, in fact, write down the notes from here, these are NCRT oriented notes. So, you will score, bachche. And these are in-house PW notes prepared by the PW team. Okay, so basically, you can definitely get, get good marks from these notes. Simple to understand language is written. So, you can refer to them. Okay, notes you will be getting in the description link. I will give you the description link, bachche. So that's the video description. You will find this batch. You can click on that and then you can download the stuff from there. Okay. So the timing of the next part of the marathon will be again told to you. So roughly we will again start somewhere around 12 or 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, that is the general time. Like today we started a little late at 1.40. So again we will be starting the next marathon around 12 or 1 p.m. Kaspers. So let's meet in the next part. And please have a good meal. Good, happy, hearty meal. Okay. Please have a very good meal here. And... Uh, uh, have a very very good dinner okay so that you guys might be very much exhausted okay have some warm water energize yourself and believe in yourself guys that is the best part believe in yourself that is the best part if you will believe in yourself believe me guys you will be unstoppable okay so let's meet in the next part of the session bye guys love you take care बच्चे नेक्स्ट पार्ट हाय नैतिक बच्चे गारंटीड पास विल आल्सो स्टार्ट सो अभी आई हैव जस्ट एंडेड विद द मैराथन सो लेट मी गेट एन इनसाइट इनटू दैट ओके बाय माय डियर लव यू गाइस बाय बाय टेक केयर सर स्टार्ट देना एक मिनट में स्टार्ट देना मेरे को ये हाँ मैं खुद ही ले लेता हूँ स्नैप हाँ करना है करना है करना है एक मिनट दीजिएगा मेरे को